moments ago, something uh, believed to be a plane crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. This is not the story of 9-11. This is the story within 9-11. Let's go take a look back. Mary Murphy looked at the bombing in 1993 and other acts of terrorism since. Here's her report. February 26, 1993. It's the day foreign terror blasted New York into a new reality. I never want to go through that again. I'll never go in that building. It was horrible, the feeling, not getting out, not being able to get out. You felt smothered. Within a week, the FBI had the undercarriage of the Ryder rental van that carried the bomb and its first suspect in New Jersey, a Palestinian named Mohammed Salome, and then another Palestinian, chemical engineer Nadel Ayad, whose voice was captured on a message left for the Daily News. This is the Liberation Army. We conducted the explosion at the World Trade Center. The FBI discovered this ripped photo of Ayad in a garbage can outside his New Jersey home, the accused terrorist posing with a grenade beneath a Palestinian flag. The feds also found him posing with Egyptian radical El Sayed Nosser at Attica State Prison in New York before the Trade Center bombing, but after Nosser had been convicted of gun charges in the fatal shooting of Rabbi Meir Kahani. Within months, the group would be linked to a much larger conspiracy. A blind Egyptian sheikh named Omar Abdel Rahman finally surrenders from a Brooklyn mosque after the FBI discovers a bomb factory at a Jamaica Queens warehouse. Surveillance tapes showing a half dozen men delivering steel drums to the site. As we entered the bomb factory, the five subjects were actually mixing the witch's brew. The sheikh was later convicted of plotting attacks on the U.N. and bridges and tunnels linking New York and New Jersey. This evidence tape shows ringleader Sadiq Ali doing a run-through in the Lincoln and Holland tunnels, even scoping out areas where security personnel are stationed. Within a year of the sheikh's life sentence, two letter bombs arrived at the United Nations, not long after others had turned up at a federal prison housing the sheikh. All were postmarked from Alexandria, Egypt. And on February 23, 1997, the city was once again shaken by a fatal shooting rampage, this one on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. In this case, 69-year-old Palestinian Ali Abu Kamal from Gaza City killed a Danish tourist and then himself, leaving behind a letter that railed against Americans and Zionists, stating a goal to murder as many as possible. We learned we were vulnerable then, we were vulnerable again when they hit Oklahoma City. And again, America and humanity is vulnerable to terrorism as we lost the World Trade Center today and an untold number of lives as well. What has our great democratic government done here? What has our media done here? You know, the one story about 911, there's a lot of stuff you can hear about 911. But all you need to know about 911 and the fact that what we've been told is a lie is the personal testimony of William Rodriguez. Absolutely. I've heard all the stories. I've been on all the websites. I've read the books. I've seen the videos. I'm here to tell you his personal testimony, his singular experience proves that it's a lie. Our office was on the B1 level. As I was talking to a supervisor at A46, and all of a sudden we hear, boom! An explosion so hard that pushed us upwards. And it came from the basement between the B2 level and the B3 level. And when I went to verbalize, we hear, the impact of the plane on the top. Two different events. That was the plane on the top. There was an explosion prior the plane hitting the building. A person comes running into the office saying, explosion, explosion, explosion. His hands extended, and all the skin pulled from under his armpits on both arms, hanging on the top of the fingertips. Imagine you take off a glove and you let it hang it. And I didn't know what it was. It was his skin. And when I said, what happened? He was in a shock. And what appeared to be a red shirt, then we realized as he got closer is that he was drenched in blood. This guy was burned 33% of his body, 33%. And as he got closer and everybody realized that, 
horror. Everybody screaming, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And as he got closer, we realized all this part of his face was hanging. And I say, don't move. Because I was going to go inside the office to pick up the phone to call the emergency medical unit that was located on the South Tower. The North Tower and the South Tower connected through the basement. There was like a big loop, but they connected through the basement. And they were very efficient to get there. So I went to tell them that I have an injured person in the office. When I went to pick up the phone, yeah, another explosion. Very loud, very powerful. This, the floor started moving below us, and everybody started running to the door frames because they thought it was an earthquake. And they, you know, they're all piling up by the door frames, all of them. And when I see that, my supervisor, Anthony Saltalamaica, started screaming, it's a bomb, it's a bomb. But why is he saying that? Because he survived the bomb of 1993. A van was placed on our side of the building, same basement, way below, and it blew up. And it killed six people, 1,000 people were injured. And of course, he is acting on his memory. And ultimately, with William himself both surviving the first and last attack on the Twin Towers, brave he has been for going public with his story. He's extremely lucky given the number of people who were at the World Trade Center in 2001 and died, but had already survived the 1993 bombing, like Fire Marshal Ronald Buka, who also responded to 1993 and 2001, but on 9-11, he reached the impact zone of the 78th floor of the South Tower with Battalion Chief Oreo Palmer and died during the building collapse while devising a plan to put out the fire. But when it comes to what happened eight and a half years earlier with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, it's now been a long-held belief by conspiracy theorists and the 9-11 truth movement that the first attack was carried out by the FBI, or in part by the CIA, or some rogue element in the U.S. government, rather than foreign members of the Blind Sheik, Omar Rahman's inner circle, Ramzi Youssef, or Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, as who authorities first essentially blamed it on, which eventually broadened to the loose umbrella term that's now known as Al-Qaeda. But let's be honest. Most that come from this school of thought in which the government did the 1993 bombing basically heard it from the likes of this guy. But I made a film about this. I've been covering this since right after it happened. That's why I got on air. It took me two years to get on air. I got on air in 95. The FBI actually carried out the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. They actually hired a retired 43-year-old former Egyptian army officer, Ahmad Salam, and paid him $1 million and gave him real explosives, a detonator, and told him to build a bomb and to give it to the foolish people that he was controlling to allow them to attack the World Trade Center complex. Complex. Mr. Salam was not as ruthless and sociopathic as the FBI and their globalist controllers. There was only one problem. The drivers of the truck didn't park it up against the main support column as they had been ordered to do by Mr. Salam and the FBI and the FBI and the FBI. Couldn't believe the FBI would basically tell him to build the bomb, give him real detonators, and then tell him let it go a forward, that was a game changer for me because you're one of the only people on the inside to ever get out alive who exposes a false flag, false flag, false flag. So was the 1993 World Trade Center bombing actually carried out by the FBI? Any government false flag, as Jones states like he does eight and a half years later with 9-11? Most of you who come across this film already have some grasp to the alternative 9-11 conspiracy theories out there, especially added with the infamous story of the dancing Israelis and much evidence has come out since underlining theirs and other Israeli operatives possibly involved in the September 11th attacks. Our purpose was to document the event. But was there also Israeli involvement in the 1993 bombing too? And if there was Israeli involvement in 1993, would one's overall belief on who was alternatively responsible for the 9-11 attacks have been a drastically different conclusion in an accusation, knowing that Israeli intelligence was already involved the first time on the Twin Towers? Especially since it's been practically known before mainline success that Alex Jones was once considered the leader of the 9-11 truth movement. Or was Israelis only involved in 9-11, and the 1993 bombing was a legitimate radical Islamic attack? As what's also retroactively covered within the 9-11 Commission report, as 1993 is also primarily known to be the first Islamic attack in the U.S. But why also on 9-11 did WPIX News Channel 11 and other local New York press also seem persistent in pushing a Palestinian narrative added with Egyptian complicity in the 1993 bombing. 
How and when did radical Islam begin? Reality couldn't be further from the truth. When fundamentalist figures and influence radical Islamic terrorism are not only directly connected to the 1993 bombing, but are inherently connected to what was later known as Al-Qaeda. But like 9-11, 1993 does not rule out any possible Israeli or Western involvements. Aside from mainstream history documentaries, as well as the 1997 HBO movie, Path to Paradise, and 2006 controversial ABC series, Path to 9-11, that are somewhat helpful in familiarity with the before and after 93 bombing story, unfortunately for alternative history, there really isn't a full-length documentary film specific on the 1993 bombing, released independently or distributed commercially, that provides a different narrative given with some of the holes of the story that we're already implying in contrast to what's commonly known as far as problems occurring ahead in 9-11. Besides the recent addition with History Channel's Road to 9-11, all that exists mainly covers Ramsey Youssef, and alternatively a few obscure clips featured on early Alex Jones documentaries and through so-called research from the late Bill Cooper and Ted Gunderson, all combining the same FBI-CIA shadow government narrative. Look, the CIA has done in this country, what they've done to us is unbelievable. Look at the terrorist acts that have occurred. The CIA behind most, if not all of them. We had the Marine Barracks, we had our embassy in Kenya. We had Pan Am 103. We had the USS Cole. Uh, we had Oklahoma City. We had the World Trade Center in 1993. That helped the terrorists blow up the World Trade Center the first time. They built the bomb. They, they got the driver's license. However, this film is a compendium using official and independent narratives as well as news archives mostly combined and edited in a manner allowing each sample film and documentary source to tell part of the story, but at the same time, still challenging the official story of the 1993 bombing and also those popular alternative conspiracy theories, whether it's through officials, researchers, witnesses, or perpetrators involved in the stories leading up and following 1993. And to also keep it captivating, this film will also be accompanied by sampling dramatized actors from feature movies. This is... World Trade Center bombing of 1993, hidden path to 9-11. In the beginning segment, we start with the rise of radical Islam coming out of Egypt through the extensive work produced by acclaimed independent BBC documentarian, Adam Curtis. However, because of recent changes with YouTube policies regarding copyright protections and censorship, I'm restricted to using his work. So in order to keep the story leading up to 1993 somewhat chronicle and captivating, original scenes used from Curtis's 2004 film, The Powers of Nightmares, are plagiarized and adapted. The story begins in the summer of 1949, when a middle-aged school inspector from Egypt arrived in the small town of Greeley, Colorado. His name was Syed Kutub. Kutub had been sent to the U.S. to study its educational system, and he enrolled in a local state college. His photographs appear in the college yearbook, but Kutub was destined to become much more than a school inspector. Out of his experiences of America that summer, Kutub was going to develop a powerful set of ideas that would directly inspire those who flew the planes on the attacks of September the 11th. As he had traveled across the country, Kutub had become increasingly disenfranchised with America. The very things on the surface that made the country look prosperous and happy, Kutub saw as signs of inner corruption and decay. In 1950, Said Qutb traveled back to Egypt from America. On his return, Qutb became politically active in Egypt. He joined a group called the Muslim Brotherhood, who wanted Islam to play a major role in governing Egyptian society. And in 1952, the Brotherhood supported the revolution led by General Nasser that overthrew the last remnants of British rule. But Nasser very quickly made it clear that the new Egypt was going to be a secular society that emulated Western morals. He quickly forged an alliance with America, and the CIA came to Egypt to organize security agencies for the new regime. Faced with this, the Muslim Brotherhood began to organize against Nasser, and in 1954, Kutub and other leading members of the Brotherhood were arrested by the security services. In a series of books he wrote secretly in prison, which were then smuggled out, Kutub called a revolutionary vanguard to rise up and overthrow the leaders. Faced with this, Nasser decided to crush Kutub and his ideas. And in 1966, Kutub was put on trial for treason. The verdict was a foregone conclusion, and on August 29, 1966, Kutub was executed. But his ideas lived on. The day after his execution, a young schoolboy set up a secret group. He hoped that it would one day become the vanguard that Kutub had hoped for. His name was Ayman Zawahi, 
and Zawahi later became the mentor of Osama bin Laden. By the late 1970s, Egypt had been transformed. On the surface, it had become a modern westernized state with a prosperous middle class who were benefiting from the flood of western capital that was being invested in the country. One member of this prosperous Egyptian elite was Amin Zawahi. He was now a young doctor, just starting his career. The group that he had started as a schoolboy, which he had modeled on the ideas of Syed Qutb, had grown. Sayyid Qutb's ideas were now spreading rapidly in Egypt, above all, among students. The government of President Sadat was controlled by a small group of millionaires who were backed by Western banks. The banks had been let in by what Sadat called his open door policy. To the Western media, Sadat denied any corruption. All Egyptians knew that this was a blatant lie. Who has benefited now from the open door policy? Taxi drivers, the laborers, all those has benefited from the open door policy. It is not like they say that uh, uh, there, has, uh, there are millionaires here and so. No, not at all. This is pure, uh, 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 pure uh, um, uh, um, black propaganda from the side of the Soviet Union and his agents here in the country. Zawari was convinced that the time was now approaching to fulfill Qutb's vision. The vanguard should rise up and overthrow this corrupt regime. And the man who would give the Islamists the opportunity would be Henry Kissinger. As part of his attempt to create a stable and balanced world, Kissinger had persuaded President Sadat to begin peace negotiations with Israel. To Kissinger, the ruthless pragmatist, religious divisions and hatreds were irrelevant. And in 1977, Sadat had flown to Jerusalem to start the peace process. To the West, it was a heroic act, but to the Islamists, it was complete betrayal. And then, in 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini, although Shiite, showed Zawari by example that his dream of creating an Islamist state was possible. Khomeini had inspired an uprising against the Shah of Iran. The Shah was another leader who had allowed Western banks to corrupt his country. Khomeini had put forth the idea of an Islamist state that was remarkably similar to Qutb's ideas. You sound very dissatisfied with, with what's happening in Iran now. Not more than dissatisfied. This is disgraceful, really. I was myself, I was a secretary general of the Muslim Congress at one time. This, uh, uh, putting the name Islamic Revolution is a crime. Uh, a crime against Islam in the first hand. And President Sadat, do you expect that the Shah will accept the invitation? It seems like a good solution right now. Quote me, my aeroplane is ready to bring him here, any moment. At the end of 1980, Amy Zawahi, with a number of other followers of Qutb, who had formed cells, came together. They created an organization they called Islamic Jihad. Its leader was a man called Abdel Salam Faraj, and Faraj argued that they should kill Sadat in a spectacular way that would shock the masses. Sadat is killed in the attack, and justice comes swiftly. Those who carried out the assassination were a group of army officers who were part of Islamic Jihad. They were immediately arrested, and the regime launched a massive manhunt for those behind the plot. Sadat's murderer is arrested on site. He is a lieutenant in the Egyptian army. Yet the incident results in over 300 Islamists being put in jail. Behind bars are the future leaders of Islamist organizations, still active around the world today. The massive presence of the International Press Corps will give them an exceptional platform to speak from, starting with their self-proclaimed spokesman, Ayman al-Zawahiri. This is our word by Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri. Now we want to speak to the whole world. Who are we? Who are we? Why did they bring us here? And what we want to say? About the first question, we are Muslims. We are Muslims who believed in their religion, in its broad meaning, as both an ideology and practice. We believed in our religion, both as an ideology and practice, and hence we tried our best to establish 
with the Islamic State and the Islamic society. La ilaha illallah! La ilaha illallah! With the peace agreement, it was a fundamental realignment in that we are now going to accept Israel right to exist. We're now going to have a normal relationship with Israel. There was a segment of, of die-hard Islamists who just couldn't accept that. For a Muslim like the blind sheikh, Sadat's signature on that peace treaty is a declaration of war on his own people. It is believed that the sheikh issued the fatwa that became Sadat's death sentence. Following the trial, many of the prisoners are released. With an American-issued travel visa, the blind sheikh makes his way to Brooklyn. Zawahiri heads for Peshawar. In a Cold War move to contain Soviet influence, the CIA under President Ronald Reagan funnels $3 billion to Muslim fighters repelling the Soviet invasion. America's deep and continuing admiration for the Afghan people. Mariah Lucas quit her job so she could devote full time to aiding the Afghan cause. To demonstrate our support that the United States is sharply increasing its assistance. The commemoration of March 21st as Afghanistan Day throughout the United States. In December 1979, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, an Islamic country. And an imam at Osama's university named Sheikh Abdullah Azam calls on all Muslims to come to Afghanistan's defense. He will come to be known as the father of modern jihad. Azam is a Palestinian whose hometown was occupied by Israel after the Arabs' crushing defeat in the Six-Day War. More than anyone, it is Azam who has inspired Muslims, including bin Laden, to head to Afghanistan. My father saw in this movement uh, a hope of uh, bringing the Muslim world to the power again. Hutaifa is the son of Abdallah Azam. He recalls how he watched his father take the young Osama bin Laden under his wing. I have lived with Osama bin Laden for more than 12 years, very close to him. At that time, Osama met my father as a teacher in the university. Abdallah Anas was studying to become an imam in his home country of Algeria when he heeded the call to jihad. We used to watch his film. You know that, that, that actor, uh, Sylvain? Uh... And it was completely advertisement for the jihad of Afghanistan. What you see here are the Mujahideen soldiers, holy warriors. I was one, one of the formers, uh, the founders of the Services Bureau with Sheikh Abdullah Azam. And uh, in the same uh, late 84, uh, Osama bin Laden joined us as a founder also in the Services Bureau. He was uh, from a rich family uh, and he was able to spend all the expenditure of the office. When you talk about Zawahiri, it's another case. Zawahiri, when he came to Afghanistan, he came with his own idea from a, from a struggle and rivalry between Jama'at al-Jihad, his jihadi group in Egypt, and Muslim Brotherhood. So they hate each, each other. So when he was released from jail and he came to Peshawar, he wasn't part of Services Bureau. He wasn't part with Sheikh Abdullah Azam and Bin Laden and us. His priority, how to, how to protect people here not to follow the Muslim Brotherhood. And that as a consequence, not to follow Abdullah Azam because automatically he will lead them to Muslim Brotherhood. This, this is just what he was in his mind, it's not true. But I think he was completely paranoid by what, what happened to Egypt between him, rivalry between Muslim Brotherhood and the jihadi group. And he brought that struggle to Peshawar, which is, doesn't exist. Strange things happening when this Zawahiri came to Peshawar. From the first day, they were enemies of Sheikh Abdullah Azam. Zawahiri's views on jihad are far more radical than those of Sheikh Abdullah Azam. You don't believe what kind of level of hate 
If you have a different opinion to him, you are out of Islam. You are infidel. This man is bad, this man is not good, this man is less Muslim, busy with, uh, with classifying people. If you vote, if you go to election, if you believe in democracy, if you believe in political, political forming, political parties, your blood is free, should be killed. Sheikh Abdullah Azam had been a professor at Osama bin Laden's university. Now he is in Peshawar on the Afghanistan border where he runs a charity for Afghan refugees while also organizing Muslim recruits eager to join the battle against the Soviets. Their recruitment efforts include a monthly magazine, Al Jihad. If we send the, the Al Jihad magazine spread it to the universities of United States or the Islamic centers, because you know it was a resource of helping money for Afghanistan, but the main one was in the, the, the Brooklyn. From the Akifak Refugee Center in Brooklyn, Abdullah Azam and others would go around the country raising money and preaching holy war. Oh brothers, after Afghanistan, nothing in the world is impossible for us anymore. There are no superpowers or mini powers. What matters is the willpower that springs from our religious belief. The world today is arbitrarily ruled by Jews and Christians. The Americans, the British and others. And behind them, the fingers of international Jewry with their wealth and their women and their media. The Al-Kifak Refugee Center set up an elaborate support and recruiting network coast to coast with branches in more than 38 American cities. These centers became clearing houses and recruiting offices to support jihad around the world. And they were working legally. Their job only is to, uh, to gather the funds or the, and to get the supports from the people living in the state. This new face appeared suddenly and Sheikh Abdullah Azam introducing him to me, saying, this is uh, your brother in Islam, uh, Osama bin Laden. What I remember, this guy is very shy, uh, didn't talk too much. So the impression I got, good guy from Saudi, and that's goodbye. After that, I asked Sheikh Abdullah Azam, and he said, he used to visit me every five, six months, trying to understand what is going on and bringing me some money for the Muhajireen. And also Osama bin Laden, he was his student, he was his follower. He was just ready to serve Sheikh Abdullah Azam. Where Osama's marksmanship falls short, his pocketbook makes up. He brings his family's construction equipment to dig defensive tunnels in the Afghan mountains quickly earning him a reputation back home as a brave jihadist. In the weeks that follow the Soviet pullout, Afghan war chiefs, united until then against the invader, get into conflict. Afghanistan rapidly sinks into civil war and utter chaos. Undermined by its Afghan fiasco, the Soviet Union begins its own disintegration. In just a few weeks, the world enters the post-Cold War era. In 80, by the in 89, 90, the number reached maybe three, 4,000 Arabs and Muslims. So it goes up. Until that time, till 88, Osama bin Laden and Sheikh Abdullah Azam and all of us, as a former uh, founders of Services Bureau, we worked together. But something, uh, Osama uh, split it himself to us in late 88, and he joined a group uh, called uh, uh, Jama'atul Jihad, Jihadi group, Egyptians. And they were there, uh, the, some names uh, like Zawahiri, like uh, somebody called Sayyid Imam, uh, Abu al-Fadl, and uh, a, a group. They were not part of the Jihad in Afghanistan. They were just part in Peshawar for their own agenda. No one knows because they were very minority. No one knows what they are doing there. And they start working and then they joined 
uh, to Osama bin Laden. They became a group, and later on, they called what we know today uh, Al Qaeda. November 1989, Bin Laden's partner, Abdullah Azam, is driving to a mosque in Peshawar, Pakistan, with two of his sons. A car bomb explodes, killing them instantly. The murder, never solved, has the hallmarks of a mob rubout. With Azam out of the way, Bin Laden quickly reorganizes the jihad network around himself. In 1989, Azam was assassinated in Pakistan by unknown assailants. His death made him a martyr to radical Muslims around the world. To try and understand why these blunders and failures occurred, we need to go to Brooklyn, only three miles away from the World Trade Center towers in Manhattan. This is where one finds the little al Farouk Mosque. At the time, it was home to the al Kifar Refugee Center, which is no other than the American outpost for the Afghan Services Bureau in Peshawar, led by Abdallah Azam. Among the mosque's regulars are a number of individuals who train together, handling weapons and perfecting combat skills. Officially, they have every intention of joining the Jihad in Afghanistan. Their activities do not seem to worry local authorities, especially as their teacher is himself a junior officer in the U.S. Army. New York, November 5, 1990. This 34-year-old Egyptian named El Said Nasser dons the yarmulke of an observant Jew and pockets a 357 Magnum revolver. Nasser enters a ballroom at this Midtown Manhattan hotel. Rabbi Meir Kahani, head of the tiny but violent Jewish Defense League, is finishing a speech to his followers. As Kahani steps down from the podium, Nasser pulls out the gun, fires twice, and a fatal shot enters the rabbi's throat. Nasser flees the hotel, but an armed postal officer shoots him, and police arrest him. On November 5th, 1990, I was having dinner with basically uh, the response team for the Manhattan Homicide Squad in an Italian restaurant. And just as the food hit the table, the beepers went off. The people called in and they said, we have a rabbi shot in a Midtown hotel. We're hearing it's Meyer Kahani. And the guy was running down the street and the guy shot at the post office man um, and it hit him in the arm and then the post office man shot him. The ambulance takes Meyer Kahani, who is gravely wounded, to Bellevue Hospital. El Said Nosser, also to Bellevue Hospital. There was a camera crew in the hospital doing some kind of documentary on life in the emergency room that just happened to be there when these two shooting victims came in. They caught it all. So in this surreal moment, they end up side by side separated by a few feet, while doctors work feverishly. But El Said Nasser survives and is charged with uh, the shooting and the murder. For the public, and largely for law enforcement, the killing of Kahana was portrayed as one crazy Arab killing one crazy Jew. They consider him the big Jew. He was the Jew that had the guts to stand up to the Arabs in Israel, to the neo-Nazis in America. He was the Jewish defender, if you will. And taking out Kahana meant taking out the big Jew. Mike Kozofsky leads a group whose name means Kahani lives. Uh, here we see uh, Rabbi Kahana, a Jewish leader, gunned down on the streets of New York. And the police managed to uh, uh, bungle up every possible uh, aspect of the investigation. We feel that the American authorities were knew about the Kahana assassination plot before it happened, that they were quite happy with it happening, and that there's a, lot, there's a lot that the government wants to cover up here. What was your feeling about the lone gunman theory? I thought it was preposterous based on what my sources in the NYPD told me that that it, they were ordered to treat this as a simple homicide based on what my sources in the FBI told me that every time that they got a little bit ambitious and started broadening their investigation to search out El Said Nasser's possible alleged terrorist links, they were told from a top to cool it, to stop investigating, that the NYPD would handle it as a simple homicide. 
FBI and police search Nocer's home here in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. They find more than a thousand rounds of ammunition, bomb-making formulas, U.S. military training manuals, and a hit list of other prominent Jews. They haul 47 boxes of this material to this police precinct. But the authorities, the DA, the NYPD, the FBI, overlook most of it. Roger Stavis, he was appointed defense lawyer for El Nosair. Stavis's line of defense is simple. His client is part of an organization that is supported by the U.S. Secret Service. His search begins, digging up confidential documents. His investigation sheds new light on America's political agenda in Afghanistan. As soon as I began work on the case and looked at the documents that were taken from Mr. Nosir's home, I noticed all things about Afghanistan, for Afghanistan. I noticed documents from Fort Bragg, uh, JFK Special Warfare Center. I noted uh, uh, manuals about training, firing, manuals about identifying Soviet aircraft and armors and, and armor, uh, armored vehicles. Um, all of these things, and if I could show that the people were focused on Afghanistan and aiding the Mujahideen rebels, which was part of United States foreign policy in the 1980s, I could demonstrate that they were not waging a war of urban terrorism against the United States, but that they were, as I stated in my summation at the trial, they were on Team America. So that what I was trying to do with my defense was to make a, a triangle between Fort Bragg, up to New York, over to Afghanistan, and back to Fort Bragg. And the key to that was Sergeant Ali Muhammad. At this point in time, Ali Muhammad reappears in the narrative. Stavis discovers he had been leaking documents found at Nusayir's place. Ali Muhammad, at that time a sergeant in the U.S. Army, clearly made use of the documents to train Islamist groups for combat. Among the trainees was Nosir. He is the key witness Stavis needs to back up his defense. But Ali Muhammad is nowhere to be found. What his true agenda was, was unknown to me. I could not find him. Who he was really working for was unknown to me. I couldn't find him despite my best efforts to do so. I wanted to have him as a witness. I sent an investigator to try to find him so I could serve him with a subpoena, which is something that would compel his testimony. And his wife in California hadn't seen him for over a year at that time. Connections are becoming clearer while multiplying. Ali Mohammed is linked to Ayman al-Zawiri, who gave him the responsibility of infiltrating the U.S. Army. A few years back, during the Sadat assassination trial, Zawiri speaks to the International Press Corps a few yards away stands another key figure of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad group, Sheikh Abdel Rahman, a.k.a. the Blind Sheikh. Sheikh Abdel Rahman uh, is a, a rather intriguing individual. He, was, he became blind as a child because of juvenile diabetes and yet had great charismatic power, not despite this, but in part because of this. He was uh, uh, tortured uh, for... Uh, an extensive period of time, about three years, to reveal his role in uh, setting the emotional climate uh, that, uh, that led to the assassination of Sadat. He ultimately uh, was not convicted uh, of this, in part because of his blindness. How can one convict a man just because of words? Despite his extreme views, the Sheikh is acquitted and released from prison. In 1990, he flees to Sudan, where the American consulate misses his name on a watch list and mistakenly issues a visa. The blind sheikh arrives in the United States. He settles into the Muslim community around the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn and begins to plan what's next. Brooklyn, New York, February 1991. The blind sheikh gives speeches denouncing his fellow Egyptian, Mustafa Shalabi, who runs the recruitment center at the Brooklyn Mosque. Both men are allies of bin Laden, but they disagree on how to use the money that Shalabi has raised for the Afghan Jihad. Shalabi wants to use it for charity, but the blind sheikh wants to use the money for terrorism. 
Bin Laden wants to strike back at the US in the wake of the Gulf War. He is incensed that the US has established bases in his native Saudi Arabia, the holy land of Mecca and Medina. The blind sheikh's attacks continue. Shalabi decides that he and his wife should travel home to Egypt. On the day that Shalabi's wife is heading to the airport, Ali Mohammed happens to be in New York. He gives her a lift. March the 1st, 1991. A neighbor in Shalabi's Coney Island apartment building notices his door is open. Inside, Shalabi is lying in a pool of blood. He's been stabbed, shot and strangled, and the apartment has been ransacked. Police suspect the blind sheikh is behind the murder, but they find no physical evidence that connects anyone to the crime, and there are no arrests. According to terrorism expert Steve Emerson, the reason for this may have been Ali Mohammed. He allegedly received an assignment from the blind sheikh's terror cell. After the killing, he was brought in to clean up the apartment and to make sure that nobody who was involved in the killing could ever be found. That murder was never solved to this day. With Chalabi out of the way, the blind sheikh takes over the al Kifa center. He allows an al-Qaeda associate from Texas, a 30-year-old Lebanese-American named Wadi al Haj, to manage it briefly. Wadi al Haj is one of the important and yet underrated figures in this so-called buildup of al-Qaeda. One of the intriguing aspects about al Haj is that he's one of the very few figures in this whole nexus that is also Lebanese, like suspected Flight 93 hijacker Ziyad Jarar. Out of any of the suspects mentioned throughout this film, El Hage is the only one who has resided in the U.S. the longest, going as far back as 1979, where eventually at one point he made his way to Tucson, Arizona, the actual city which had the first al Kifa recruitment center for Maktab al kidimat a.k.a. Afghan Services Bureau, founded in 1984 by Abdullah Azam, Bin Laden, al-Zawari, and others, even though the 1990s has just begun. El Hage does not necessarily become involved in the World Trade Center bombing or even the attacks on September 11, 2001. Right before Mustafa Shalabi's death, al Haj was already linked to a killing of a liberal imam in Tucson, Dr. Rashad Khalifa, who preached at the Mazid Tucson. While in Arizona, al Haj was already functioning as Bin Laden's financial secretary, having reportedly bought a T-39 aircraft like this one from a businessman in 1993 and had it retrofitted and flown to Sudan. al Haj ends up getting involved in the 1998 East Africa embassy bombings and is eventually captured and charged. We will continue discussing him much later in the film as well as another who also becomes involved in the embassy bombings, the mysterious Egyptian U.S. Special Forces triple spy Ali Mohammed, and his presence before the 1993 World Trade Center bombing with El Saeed Nusser to get a better understanding of his persona after and before his capture in 1998. Ali Mohammed is indeed in California, but only a few FBI agents know about it. Remarkably, he has just accepted a dinner invitation from Jack Clunan, who is trying to use him. He was obviously very suspicious, um, and for good reason, because he knew what he had done over the years and who he was close to. So he showed up for dinner one night uh, with a couple of agents and a, a very great uh, assistant United States attorney named Pat Fitzgerald. And we talked to uh, Ollie that night, and I remember the, after con the conclusion of our dinner and our talk, Pat Fitzgerald looked at me and said, with kind of a wry grin on his face, he said, this is the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous men I've ever met. And we decided that we needed to gain his cooperation because he was telling us all kinds of things. He was telling us he could vanish whenever he wanted. He had contacts overseas. He was sort of, in effect, operational. We thought at first it was all bluster, that he was just making these things up. But the more we dug into it, the more we realized that um, this was a very serious guy that understood um, the history of Al-Qaeda, understood what was going on in Afghanistan, had been in Afghanistan, had helped set up training camps, knew where the training camps were, and knew what the syllabus was for training Mujahideen, had been operational, and so we'd set out to, to um, gain his cooperation. Brooklyn, New York, November 1991. Members of the al Farouk Mosque are raising funds for the defense of El Saeed Nosser. Nosser is about to go on trial for the murder of Rabbi Mayor Kahani. Outspoken civil rights attorney William Kunstler is hired to defend Nosser. Eyewitnesses testify they saw Nosser crouched by Kahani holding a gun. But Kunstler convinces the jury that no scientific evidence links Nosser to the shooting. El Saeed Nosser was the young Palestinian 
so outraged by the poison that Kahana spread and was spreading throughout America and throughout Israel. Thirteen years ago, he moved to Israel, where he now crusades to throw all Arabs out of that country. The Arab is a cancer in our midst. And you don't coexist with a cancer. A cancer you either cut out and throw out or you die. That he engaged in an act of political assassination, sort of Palestinian rage. I think that that was, that was the narrative that Bill had. Um, but then, though, Sarah insisted he didn't do it. Uh, that, in fact, he wasn't the gunman. He didn't pull the trigger. They went in with that defense that it carried because nobody could say they saw him. In all the excitement, they saw, as usual, nothing. And they proved nothing. And that happened. It caused riots all over the world. The trial was bitter. There were several times during the proceedings itself where fights started right in the courtroom between these two sides. We want justice! We want justice! Two Arabs for every Jew. You know, the guy had powder burn supposedly on his hand, and Bill got that guy acquitted. Um, so he was obviously an incredible lawyer, but people were pretty mad at that, you know, very angry about what happened with, with Nasser. The Egyptian is found guilty only of a minor weapons charge. The FBI starts to get closely interested in the blind sheik, as a number of tapes containing his sermons are discovered in the home of El Sayyid Nasir, Rabbi Kahani's killer. It was, um... It was extremely, extremely difficult um, to get very close information. We developed a, a lot of information from the people on the outside looking in, uh, but we were having a lot of trouble uh, developing first-hand information from his inner circle. The FBI decides to increase its surveillance of the Sheik, even managing to infiltrate his immediate circle, thanks to Ahmad Salem, the terrorist bomb maker who, in reality, is an undercover FBI agent who manages to infiltrate the group and blend with the Sheik's faithful. Fearing retaliation, the man, whose name at the time was Imad Salem, has since changed identities and now lives in hiding. John Antisev, Agent John, one day came to me with Agent Nancy Floyd and they said, we have a picture, we want to show it to you. Do you know this man? I said, of course, this is Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Who is Sheikh Omar? I said, he is the one who ordered the assassination of my president. Oh, well, guess what? He is in America. I said, it's a surprise for me because I know that since he escaped from Egypt, he is being listed on the terrorist lists and he should not be in, in any country. They said, well, somehow he managed to come to America, and <clears throat> he lives in New Jersey. To this day, I don't know why um, the blind Sheikh was issued a U.S. visa to come to the United States. It's never been adequately explained. I don't think even the 9-11 Commission was able to get to the bottom of it. Acquitted for the murder, Nasser is still convicted for charges of gun possession and assault. I went to visit Sayyid Nasser in prison, and his cousins introduced me as a brother I met, and Sayyid Nasser accepted me as a friend. They're saying, well, so, you know, what next? And he said, what next? What next is up to you? Verbatim words on Sayyid Nasser, I had done my part. Now it is your duty to do that jihad. Imad Salem gradually becomes part of the blind sheikh's inner circle. Imad continues to spend time with Islamist groups tied to the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn and to El Nusayr. Now totally infiltrated into the group, he cannot turn back. I was in Brooklyn with Ibrahim El Gabroni. Ibrahim El Gabroni is Sayyid Nusayr's cousin. He said that um, we should start to do something, brother, so the government have some pressure and <clears throat> they don't put Sayyid, brother Sayyid in more troubles. So I said, sure, of course, we should do something. He said, okay, um, do you know how to build a bomb? I said, of course, that's what we do. He said, okay, I want you to build some bombs and uh, I'll tell you later, what do you need? I need 
So I said to Ibrahim El Gabroni, I need uh, explosives, I need detonators, um, I need people to help me build the bombs, I need a safe place to build the bomb in. He said, okay, let me make some phone calls to Afghanistan. Sayyid Nasir described to me how to buy the ingredients in Chinatown. So I bought fuse, I bought some ingredients, and I went back to John Antisip. What Ahmad reveals to the agent is a death list, including the names of a United States Senator from New York, Alphonse D'Amato, and the judge in El Said Nasser's trial, plus a handful of local justices and politicians. They wanted to kill 12 people. It was starting to really get intense. It eventually morphed into them asking Ahmad to make 12 pipe bombs. And then it became a serious issue. As an intelligence asset, what we say in our business, he was made promises that he did not have to testify in any type of criminal proceedings. And that's the way we, when we took him, we did not dispute that, knowing that at the time this would never go, uh, there wouldn't be an issue anytime soon. So when he started getting involved with uh, talks of assassinations and pipe bombs, of course, we had to change gears, and we had to go from an intelligence gathering uh, operation to a criminal investigation and gathering evidence trying to, to arrest these people. At this moment in time, the number one witness against everybody is Imad Salem himself, and he did not want to testify. And we were trying to convince Imad to wear a wire so when he met with these people and talked about assassinations and killings and pipe bombs, that he would record the conversations of the people. And he refused. Like I said, very stubborn, proud man. He wasn't going to be forced to do anything. And our superiors uh, wanted him to wear wire. And unfortunately, they got into a, a, uh, an issue of uh, who was going to be the stronger will. So they put it to him, uh, if you don't wear a wire, if you don't, you know, testify in court, we're not going to continue to pay you. They start to ask me to wear a wire. And I understood that once I wear a wire, I have to testify in court. If I testify in court and my identity became public, then Sheikh Omar's followers in Cairo, they will kidnap my sister and behead her. It was a silly personal confrontation, and actually he said, and I quote him, you son of a bitch, coming from the Middle East, dragging sand in your shoes all the way up to here to tell me how to run my FBI and how to do my job? I told him, sir, I am doing your job. None of your agents could have went undercover that deep. I'm doing it. You're not. And that even provoked him more, and he said, get out of here. I walked out of his office. I looked at Nancy and John. I said, guys, when this bomb been built by somebody and goes off by somebody else, don't come knock on my door. And that was it, and I walked away. When I heard Ahmad was gone, I said, I, I can't believe it. I was so, you know, disheartened and nervous and mad. I mean, I let them know exactly what I thought. I said, this is insane. I said, you know, you have a guy that's worked his butt off getting us this information, and God only knows what else is out there, and we're stopping this? The suits up there have no idea about surveillance, no idea about intelligence gathering. Back in New York, Imad Salem is finding that quitting a terror cell can be complicated. They continued for a month after I walked out, calling me every day, hey brother, you gotta come to finish what you started. Uh, Sayyid Nusser called me from Attica prison. Brother, don't be afraid. 
I have a lot of money to hire attorneys for you if something goes wrong. Brother, you gotta come finish cooking. And of course, I'm not a cook. What I was cooking is about to build a bomb. And every time I get these calls, I call John Antisev, and I immediately reported that to John. What Ahmad and the FBI would learn too late is that the cell had found itself a new cook. When Ahmad left the group in July of 92, another individual came in uh, September, and that person was Ramsey Yosef. The blind sheik and his contacts in Afghanistan are quick to find a replacement for Ahmad Salem. He arrives a few days later at JFK airport in New York on a flight coming from Pakistan. A Pakistani Airlines flight from Karachi lands here at Kennedy Airport. Seated in the first class cabin, Ramzi Youssef. He's traveling with a Palestinian terrorist named Ahmad Ajaj. The two men exit the plane and approach parallel stalls at an immigration post. The six-foot-tall Youssef, dressed in a three-piece silk Afghan suit, presents a perfectly forged Iraqi passport. He demands political asylum. When immigration officials question Ajaj, they discover that he's carrying several crudely fake passports and a suitcase stuffed with bomb-making manuals. Immigration agents take Ajaj into custody. They assign him a bed at this INS detention facility. But Youssef is allowed into the U.S and told to appear at an immigration hearing. Throughout the fall and winter, Youssef and three other members of the Al Farouk Mosque are hard at work inside this storage facility in Jersey City, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Under Youssef's direction, they assemble the device they hope will topple the Twin Towers and kill thousands of people. February 26, 1993. 11.15 a.m. Iyad Ismoil and Ramzi Youssef are driving a 10-foot yellow rider van. Following them is a car driven by Mohammed Salome. Salome had leased the van from a rider rental agency in Jersey City three days earlier. It now carries a 1,500-pound bomb made of urea nitrate and hydrogen. 11.55 a.m. The yellow rider van pulls into level B2 of the World Trade Center garage. Iyad Ismoil steers it to an illegal parking space. Ramzi Youssef lights a fuse on the bomb. The fuse is encased in rubber, which suppresses smoke and allows for a 10 to 20 minute burn time. Youssef and Ismoil jump into Salome's car and speed out of the garage. 12.10 p.m. The fuse on the bomb has been burning for six minutes. It's 12.17 p.m. I had gotten into the elevator in Press 65. I'm approached by an individual who asks for um, directions to the Newark train. We're waiting now for the elevator to come for us. I was standing within the door frame and had just opened the door to my office. We entered an elevator on the 72nd floor. I was cutting insulation, you know, putting it on the cart. I was in my office and my friend was coming up and we were going to have pizza. I got out of the car, opened the back seat door, um, reached for my things, had my car keys in my hand. The rental van detonates with a force equivalent to 800 pounds of TNT, tearing through 11-inch concrete floors in the bowels of America's famous landmark. I was physically lifted up into the air and thrown back with terrific force. All of a sudden, just boom, something hit me. And it's like, it actually like it took my breath away. It blew me across the room. The exterior walls of the garage came caving into the path concourse level. There was mass confusion. People were running out of the building. Uh, ambulances were pulling up. Uh, fire trucks were pulling up. Police set up a command center on the street outside Tower One. Smoke was emitting from every single uh, floor. A possible bomb explodes under the towering World Trade Center in New York. Five people are killed, 500 injured. Thousands poured out of the building gasping for air. Eyes glazed with shock, they spoke of the devastation within. There was 
was no help whatsoever. Trapped on 94 floors all the way up. Nobody came. There was smoke, and then the lights went out, and I'd say about 70 floors, we had no lights. Stairwells became smokestacks. Clouds of soot billowed up the stairs to the very top of the 110-story office towers. Some evacuees say they couldn't see their hands outstretched in front of them as they groped their way down to the ground, choking on the smoke. The walls just blew in, and every, everything went blank after that. Walls collapsed, the furniture's down. It's, it's a mess downstairs. The explosion blasted a gaping hole through the ceiling of the second sub-basement in tower number one. This is where firefighters say the injuries were most severe. A crowded stop for commuter trains that shuttle workers across the Hudson to New Jersey. The offices just above the area lie in ruin. Although 9-11 seems to overshadow the 1993 World Trade Center bombing in spectacular levels, still, as with most standard 9-11 truth films, the February 26, 1993 bombing and the evacuation of the Twin Towers does have premonition value, dramatic stories, and reporting. That place is a, is a death trap. Let me tell you something. There was smoke where there shouldn't be smoke. I was on the 107th floor, and we heard the bang, and that place filled up in five minutes. The building rattled. The whole thing shook. We thought that every we thought it was a, a massive bomb. Um, there was confusion, chaos. Um, the um, smoke was everywhere. You couldn't see. And uh, when I was in the bank, every just everyone hit the deck. But there are also stories of heroism and survival. In fact, one forgotten case is with a school field trip tour of the Twin Towers, where a group of grade school kids and their teachers were in the elevators when the bombing occurred and were trapped for over six hours. We didn't have much, much air, because the smoke was coming in. We had to take off our shirts, because it was pretty hot in there. And, uh, sweaty. Sweaty. I was scared. I want my dad. I want my mom. Yeah, I was crying most of the time. You were? Yeah. Why? Because I, I thought we were going to spend the night there for the rest of our lives. Ultimately, as what most experts have said, that if the 1993 bombing would have succeeded, it would have been worse in loss of life compared to 9-11. A couple of months after the bombing, in the month of May, NBC broadcast a made-for-TV movie about the incident called, Without Warning, Terror in the Towers, which was in large part still filmed on location after the crime scene while the B-level floors of the North Tower were still in ruin and repair, reenacting the drama with rescue and trying to put out the blaze with FDNY Fireman Rescue 1. In Without Warning, Terror in the Towers, an NBC movie event, Wednesday. Even though we have demonstrated mainstream sources that claim the bomb was ignited by a flame and fuse, authorities were never actually able to prove that it was that method in which the bomb was ignited. Even after sweeping through the entire crime scene in an attempt to try to find any mechanical components, which could have been used instead, they were unsuccessful in finding anything, as some experts thought it was possible that the device was activated electronically. But in an effort to minimize time and focus on criminal investigations rather than any forensic investigation analyzing the crime scene solely, this late evening witness account is a worthy importance not just being a precursor to 9-11, but because it's an inside reaction demonstrating how confirmed explosives from the first attack instinctively made some survivors feel that it was a plane that struck the building. We have with us here Warren Hernania, and Warren, you work in the building. Yes, I do. What was it like? Where were you? On the 80th floor. What happened? I was on the phone with a friend of mine, and all of a sudden I had this tremendous explosion. For a brief moment, the building rocked. I thought that, uh, an aircraft hit the building or a bomb went off. After that, the power was gone, and a few minutes later, the lights went off. Then about five minutes later, we smelled some smoke. And uh, what, how long did it take you to get out of the building? How did you get out? We took the stairway down. took us roughly about two and a half hours to exit the building. Two and a half hours. Right. And could you see during most of that time, were there lights or not? No, most of the time there was lights. Then we hit some, some darkness. But more or less, everything was in a calm manner. I understand you have a car in this building. Yes, I do. Is it in the area where the explosion occurred? I think so, yes. Is that why you're back here? Yes. The bomb was a urea nitrate device enhanced with hydrogen gas, and it ripped through a 30-meter wide hole through four sub-levels of concrete. It destroyed many vehicles and infrastructure under the building, creating a massive inferno that took firemen battling it until the next day to finally put it out, which had prevented investigators until then to reach the blast crater in order to perform their tasks. The damage and fire was so bad, it was reported that an entire car had melted. And we shouldn't have to remind anyone of this scene from the 2003 documentary, Collateral Damages, that's constantly referenced by many 9-11 truth experts in films about the reaction of firefighter Captain Philip Rivallo at Ground Zero. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, yeah, like molten steel running down the channel rails. 
like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like lava. Like, like, it was like lava, lava from a volcano. And without any possible confusion or excuse with the airline crashes, molten metal was also witnessed within the rubble of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Some of the firemen stated that the blast crater looked like a barbecue pit, and as another precursor... Now walk to the lip of the crater, the epicenter of the earthquake that rocked people 110 stories above. One rescue worker said it was like looking into the mouth of a volcano on Friday. But I can guarantee you one thing about the World Trade Center bombing, is that regardless if the ignition for the explosive was undetermined, Ramsey Yusuf and conspirators certainly weren't using nanothermite in 1993. Saturday, February 27th, the morning after. One of the FBI's top explosives experts, Dave Williams, arrives from Washington. Very hectic, Very hectic initially getting here, and with a two-hour walkthrough, I was able to immediately conclude that it was a, an explosive device. At this time, it was decided that it was involved in a terrorist incident and the FBI would be the lead agency. I recognize this as being the largest improvised explosive device or bomb that had detonated in the United States. If you look at various clues in this tangled mess here, we can determine exactly where the blast occurred. And we do that by looking at the vehicles. We, we do that by looking at the uh, extent of the damage and uh, very shortly you're, you're brought to a particular area where the damage is most severe and where the detonation occurred. The investigators were quickly able to determine that the source of the blast was along this exit ramp in the parking garage under the Vista Hotel. The explosion tore through this wall of the basement of Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. It ripped through several rooms in which employees of the Port Authority were working and having lunch. Think of the bomb as a massive energy source blasting out in all directions within a confined space. Most of that energy ripped across this parking lot underneath the Vista Hotel, right up there. Several of these floors were parking areas. The steel beams that workers are installing are intended to support what is left. A huge hole was blown into the floor of B2, the parking level where the bomb was placed. It sent debris falling all the way down to level B5, where the refrigeration machinery that cools the massive towers is kept. But the explosion also generated a huge blast straight up through the lobby floor of the Vista Hotel. And it did go up through into a ballroom of the Vista, uh, where there was to be a gathering of, of kids just uh, 45 minutes later to get, a, to get sports awards. The bomb went off at 12.18. They were supposed to be there at 1 o'clock. Before the smoke clears, an investigative team descends into the carnage beneath the Trade Center. We were able to see the shells of the cars in the parking garages that had been completely uh, blown out. There were over 300 cars that had been destroyed. Though initial reports indicate a transformer explosion, the scale of the damage rules out any accident. There was such a massive amount of debris, it took on a different dimension, a different scale that we really hadn't seen before. The bombers did $550 million worth of destruction to the World Trade Center. The financial damage caused by the disruption of national and international business was also deeply felt. America had been jolted from its belief that international terrorist attacks don't happen on American soil. So now, amidst the rubble, law enforcement agencies are in a new race against time to find the people who did this. As the day wears on, no confirmation is given to reporters about the cause of the blast, but officials do not hide their strong suspicions. We'll uh, give you a certain conclusion when we can prove it. It looks like a bomb, it smells like a bomb, it's probably a bomb. A group of investigators is assigned to work inside the crater created by the bomb. NYPD Detective Donald Sadawi and ATF Agent Joe Hanlon are assigned to the same team. It was a survey mission. We also had the mission to attempt to take swabbings that could be taken back to the laboratory later that day and examined to possibly get a lead on the type of explosive that was used. We didn't know who had perpetrated the bombing. Uh, people were scared. Uh, 
the, the city was scared. It was the start of a new phenomenon. It wasn't something that just happened in, in London or Beirut or the Philippines. It could happen any place. Finding clues amid the rubble would be next to impossible. The first major breakthrough in the investigation came when uh, FBI agents at the scene of Ground Zero discovered part of the vehicle chassis of the van that had been used to transport the bomb into the building. Miraculously, the VIN, or vehicle identification number, is still legible on the manifold. The FBI then traces the van's registration to a rider rental agency in New Jersey. The van was the same vehicle rented and reported stolen by Mohammed Salome. My beeper went off and it was uh, Detective Napoli calling me and he said, you got, you know, I called the number and he said, you're not going to believe it, but they found the, uh, the remnants of the, of the van that was used to carry the explosives and it was rented in Jersey City and it was a rider company, you know, and the person who rented it was uh, Mohammed Salome. And I mean, I tell you, I was like, oh my God, Mohammed Salome. We had photographs of Mohammed. Uh, we have photographs of Mohammed training uh, at the range. You know, he's a friend of Nosir. He's a friend of all the guys that we've been looking at for the last few years. And I said, oh, you know, we, we you know, these are the guys we were looking at. Salome arrives at the rental office in New Jersey to pick up his $400 deposit on the van. When he arrives, an agent greets Salome from behind the desk. But he is not a rider agent. He's an undercover agent with the FBI. After some discussion, Salome walked out. As he stepped out of the office, dozens of FBI agents who had been monitoring their discussion descended upon Salome. Less than one week after the bombing, the FBI had a suspect in custody. Salome said little to the agents who questioned him about the bombing. They knew it was probable that he had not acted alone. The FBI was staking out the lot when Salamu showed up with his stolen vehicle report this morning, this time getting his $200, then walking outside. And they must have signaled other guys the up the street, morning? and there were FBI guys on both sides of Kennedy Boulevard, and they pulled up in a car, FBI guys with their jackets, and put him in a car. Put him in a car. That was the end of it. It was no, not. It was nothing like that. Not that I could see. I we didn't see. see. I didn't hear any. I was right outside. I didn't hear any fighting or anything. I think they surprised him. Uh, he came back a number of times. He came back uh, Friday afternoon and told me that uh, the truck was stolen from his possession. And he wanted his four hundred dollar deposit. He wanted his deposit back. Sources tell Fox News the FBI has been conducting searches all over Jersey City. One of them at this apartment building. Gladys Moore, who lives here with her Egyptian boyfriend, says FBI agents broke down her door and ransacked her apartment. Oh, they took a piece of my hair, and they, they put some things in my hands, and they took a test, they sent it out, they came back and they said I could go. When Salome was arrested, agents recovered various personal items, including his wallet, which contained several business cards and telephone numbers. They began by searching the address listed on his driver's license. A former roommate told agents that Salome no longer lived at that address. However, they were able to find some belongings of Salome's that he had left behind. There were news clippings and photos relating to Nocer, and a photo of him and Nocer together. There were numerous bank records. There were also more names and numbers for investigators to pursue. Analysis of all the confiscated phone records led investigators to an apartment in Jersey City. The landlord who owned the apartment at 40 Pemrapo Avenue confirmed that Salome and another individual rented the apartment from early January of 1993 until the end of February. A landlord could not confirm the identity of Salome's roommate. After executing the warrant, agents discovered that 40 Pemrapo Avenue was the bomb factory, the place where the conspirators mixed an explosive powerful enough to rock the World Trade Center. Inside the apartment and an adjacent garage, FBI forensic examiners recovered traces of a diverse range of chemicals. While agents searched the apartment, the identity of Salome's mysterious roommate emerged. They found papers requesting political asylum in the name of Ramsey Yosef, who, according to the documents, had been detained in September of 1992 at Kennedy Airport for entering the country without a visa. The Pamrapo Avenue apartment was a gold mine for the FBI. At every step of the investigation, Ramsey Yosef's name appeared. He was a known international terrorist and an expert with explosives. Agents now believed he was the mastermind behind the World Trade Center bombing. They soon learned that he fled the country the night of the Trade Center bombing. 
an international manhunt for Ramzi Yosef had begun. A worldwide hunt is on today for a sixth suspect in the Twin Towers bombing, and there are also reports of a possible motive for the bombing. Does this look familiar? It's a scene eerily reminiscent of the crater formed by the bomb at the World Trade Center. Actually, it's the El Rashid Hotel in Baghdad after it was hit by a U.S. missile in January. CBS News is saying that it was in retaliation for that incident that the bomb was set at the World Trade Center. Meanwhile, more information is coming out on the new suspect. He's identified as an Iraqi, 25-year-old Ramzi Ahmed Youssef. He came to the U.S. via Pakistan back in September. He reportedly did not have a visa and asked for political asylum. He failed to show up for a hearing on his request last week. Youssef once lived in the same Jersey City apartment building as the first suspect arrested, Mohammed Salome. And only yesterday, the head of the FBI's New York field office, Jim Fox, told me about a sixth man now being sought. Uh, Ramzi Youssef is the so-called sixth man, sixth man that the press has been talking about for some days. Uh, he, he is charged with participating in the bombing itself, not simply aiding and abetting the bombing. Yep. We've been looking for him for a number of weeks without success. Uh, if I had to guess, I would guess that he is overseas by now and that that's where he will be found. Let me throw out a few seemingly unrelated facts. Fact. Back in the early 80s, one of the pillars of U.S. foreign policy was something called the Reagan Doctrine. It was designed to counter communist gains in the Third World. It was why Washington supported the Contras in Nicaragua and Muslim fundamentalists, the Mujahideen, in Afghanistan. Fact. Two years ago, when U.S. armed forces first bombed and then invaded Iraq, the FBI here at home significantly beefed up its surveillance of suspected or potential Muslim terrorists. Fact. Immediately after the bombing of the World Trade Center, initial speculation focused on Serbian suspects. So that when the New York Daily News, the day after the bombing, got this particular phone call on one of its news tip lines, no one paid any particular attention until weeks later, just a couple of days ago, in fact. Hi, this is the Liberation Army. We conducted the explosion at the World Trade Center. You will get our demand by mail. And then, of course, uh, you're also aware that the letter, a letter subsequently came to the New York Times. That letter claiming that the motivation for the bombing was American ties with Israel. And that letter said at one point, uh, Israel is responsible for terrorism against Arab citizens all over the world. Now Americans must see what it feels like to be the victim of terrorism. At first, there were five to seven different groups and organizations that took blame for the 1993 bombing. But eventually it was discovered after his arrest that the chemical engineer, Nadel Ayad, was the one who made the call, taking claim as the Liberation Army. Authorities were able to trace Ayad through phone calls he had made to Yusuf while he was in the hospital briefly recovering from a car accident he was in with Mohammed Salome due to his clumsy driving. But we will re-examine the reporting of Ted Koppel and ABC Nightline investigation on 1993 Ground Zero about the FBI beefing up its surveillance during the first Gulf War in 1990 as well as the pretext instigation with Iraq and Ramzi Youssef. And like Youssef, Mahmoud Abu Halima, a.k.a. The Red, had also fled right after the bombing, but went to Egypt, where eventually he was captured by authorities there, as well as interrogated and brutally tortured so bad that he begged to be handed over to the U.S. authorities as soon as possible, knowing that he would be given humane treatment. When the feds interrogated Mahmoud, they brought to his attention that they even considered him being suspect to Mustafa Shalabi's murder. Because red hairs were found on Shalabi's fingernails, Mahmoud also has a younger brother named Mohammed Abu Halima. His photos are often confused with being Mahmoud. Other suspects you will see in Sheikh Rahman's inner circle ahead claim that the brother Mohammed Abu Halima attended a training session in Pennsylvania with Yusuf testing out his bomb. With four conspirators now in custody, authorities decided to bring them to trial while the search for other bombers continued. In February of 1994, a year after the bombing, the trial concluded. 
the jury forewoman read off 38 pronouncements of guilty. Conspiracy, explosive destruction of property, interstate transportation of explosives, and murder. It was the worst act of terrorism on U.S. soil, and an angry federal judge called the men convicted of carrying it out sneaks and cowards. Nothing more, nothing less. Judge Kevin Duffy handed down the same sentence to all four men, 240 years in prison with no chance for parole. Although they could appeal, it is my intention, said the judge, that you stay there for the rest of your life. It is what government investigators had wanted. I think it's uh, very fulfilling to see this kind of a sentence uh, handed out uh, uh, by the court. Each of the four convicted men, three Palestinians and one Egyptian, delivered long, rambling statements about how unfair and unjust they thought their trial had been. They were convicted on ten counts of planning and executing the World Trade Center attack. That explosion, 15 months ago, killed six people, including a pregnant woman. Her husband asked the court to give his wife's killers the maximum sentence. I don't, I don't think words can put on... You can use any words to say what you lost when you lost your wife and an unborn child. The judge levied a $250,000 fine on each of the men and ordered that any money generated by book or movie deals would go to the victims' families. But he added, I can't picture anyone giving you anything. Mohammed Salome, the chemist Nidal Ayat, Ahmed Ajaj, the man who brought the bomb manuals into the country, and Mahmoud Abu Halima, known as the Red, will spend the rest of their lives in prison. The mastermind Ramzi Yosef and his accomplice Iyad Ishmael were still fugitives. In the days that followed this first attack on the World Trade Center in New York, the FBI tries to convince Ahmad Salem to resume his undercover mission amongst the followers of Sheikh Abdel Rahman, also known as the Blind Sheikh. Got a call from Attorney General Janet Reno, and she made quite clear I was to take over the supervision of that investigation that day. Veteran prosecutor Mary Jo White takes over the reins of the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York, the fabled tough-on-crime Southern District, where she discovers, to her shock, that the FBI had informed Ahmad Salem deep inside the plot and let him go. Look, it's always easy in hindsight uh, to say it's a big mistake. I think it was a mistake. I made it very clear to my prosecutors and to the FBI uh, that he needed to get put back in, if at all possible. The supervisor said, oh, he's going to want a lot of money. He didn't want to pay him. And I think Mary Jo White answers, I don't care how much he wants. Get him back in. I called the mod, and he was like, you see, I told you. Remember what I told you, John? And he said, yes, yes, but uh, I think we need you to come back. He had hurt feelings. He knew the opportunity missed, too. I agreed to go back, and I started to open my ears to hear what happened. With the promise of $1 million, Imad accepts and rapidly manages to become his personal assistant. I used to go to his house at 7 o'clock in the morning, cook for him, serve him, and uh, whoever come, lunch, and do the dishes, and take him to the bathroom. Uh, he is uh, blind, so he cannot walk on his own, so I put the slipper to his feet and so on. One of Sheikh Omar's followers, his name is Siddi Ali, start to discuss with me blowing up uh, something here. And I said, that's a very good idea, and I think we should do that. And then he started with different targets, the World Trade Center again, to tell the American that we can get you any time. And then he said there is a military armory in 96th Street. And then he started to go into different targets. Imad Salem gets a hold of the list of targets. And he is wired up and recording for the FBI now. You know, we were constantly telling Imad, you just go along with the program. Whatever they tell you to do, you just follow instructions. When Sudi suggested the Statue of Liberty, we walked in like regular John Doe's, but we have our eyes for the security because we know that one day we're going to come with a bomb and we're going to go into the weakest spot and we blow it up. That day, Sudi took my picture with the Statue of Liberty. He said, it's not going to stand here anymore. Desperate and shut down the cell, Agent set up a sting. A friend of mine 
I just finished an operation using a warehouse in Queens that was fully wired and ready to go. The FBI gave me the keys for that safe house and they said, once you walk in, we have you on microphone, we have you on camera. We spent hours and hours in the warehouse mixing chemicals and the fumes and it's just so awful. And with the heat, if God forbid any spark or anything goes wrong, you got the entire two, three blocks of the city will go away. We had five bombs at that time. Each one is 1,500 pounds bomb, which is like similar to the Oklahoma bomb in the magnitude of it. Um, one for Holland Tunnel, one for Lincoln Tunnel, one for Washington Bridge, one for the United Nations, and one for the FBI building. These five bombs will go off simultaneously in one minute. So it would have been like chaos in Manhattan. The FBI must now scramble to prevent this new plot, a plan on a par with 9-11. Five timed explosives targeting New York City landmarks, including the Holland and Lincoln tunnels, several bridges, the United Nations, even the Statue of Liberty. The most terrifying target of all, the tunnels. Traffic arteries for hundreds of thousands of daily commuters. Ahmad went to the Holland Tunnel with Sadiq, with the uh, video camera going. And Sadiq will tell me, at this spot, I have to twist the camera to the ceiling so we know on video where we are gonna stop the car carrying the bomb. And then they're gonna light the fuse, and then they're gonna jump out of the car and leave. And then when a bomb goes off, all the water will rush in and drown all the people. We were monitoring this horrific terrorist plot that in a 24-hour period would have thousands and thousands of people dying. We were getting more evidence to get more players in the net. The only person we didn't have is the blind sheikh. A blessing on tape would help to prove in court that the sheikh authorized terrorist activities. You might go into the sheikh's apartment. He's got the mic in his briefcase. And the only thing that was kind of silly about it was that it had a red light on the outside. You know, we didn't have the best equipment at the time, but thank God the sheikh was blind so he didn't see the thing blinking. With a wire on, Imad will try to compromise Rahman. We go to the kitchen. It's a very small space. And then um, I told him that Sadi and I start to build something big, very big for the United Nation. What do you think? It is permissible or it is illicit? So Sheikh Omar answered, it is not illicit. It is okay, but don't do it. I said, don't do it. Why? He said, it is better. And then he put his mouth into my left ear because I'm holding him in my left arm and he start to whisper. So I have to bring my briefcase all the way up to my nose. Of course, he's blind, he cannot see. And he's whispering in my left ear and he said, I quote, find, find a plan to inflict damage on the American army. I said, okay, Sheikh, and I dropped the briefcase quickly before somebody see me in that awkward position, then I'm history. I'll be dead. And that was the piece of evidence, the moment in time when he put his stamp on it. The Sheikh knew about it and gave a blessing to do a terrorist act in the United States. They were operating under the inspiration, the guidance, ultimately the approval of the blind Sheikh. This recording by Ahmad Salem is, for the American justice system, the proof of the Sheikh's implication in the network's terrorist acts. On the night of June 24, 1993, Mary Jo White gives the FBI orders to arrest the entire network. 
around one o'clock in the morning when we were building the bombs. The SWAT team opened the front door and they came from the back door with the shotgun in my head. Don't move, I'm gonna blow your... And it was big chaos and then out of the sudden, silence. Sadig and the informant uh, discussed placing bombs in a car, driving that car into a building in the United Nations complex, and then detonating that bomb. The terrorists are accused of testing timing devices for the bomb, giving the confidential informant $300 to rent a safe house in Queens where the bombs would be made. Uh, now, Sadig Ibrahim Sadig Ali allegedly told the informant that he had participated in test explosions preparing the bomb that was used to bomb the World Trade Center. Now, the plan, according to the federal complaint filed in court this morning, blow up the United Nations building, codenamed the Big House by the conspirators, then destroy the Lincoln and Holland tunnels with bombs, and then murder security guards outside the federal plaza where the FBI headquarters are located, drive a car bomb into the uh, basement of the uh, federal building, and blow it up, and all of that in the same day. That was allegedly the plan. The blind sheikh and 11 of his disciples face multiple counts of conspiracy, including charges for the first World Trade Center bombing, the Landmarks terror plot, and even the 1990 murder of Rabbi Kahane, which brings a familiar face back into the courtroom. A stunning development in the case will haunt law enforcement for years to come. Documents in the boxes taken from Nasir's home in 1990 after the Meyer Kahane shooting are finally translated from Arabic to English. One prophetic sentence jumps out, never seen until two years after the first attack on the World Trade Center, never fully appreciated until 9-11. We will bring down your high buildings. You can't overstate the importance of the information in those boxes of evidence collected in connection with the Nocera trial. But you want to be looking at that the moment you have it, and that didn't happen. Another missed opportunity to prevent the rise of terror cells committed to attacking the United States. Apprehended soon afterwards, the blind sheik is sentenced to life imprisonment. And today, a federal jury agreed, finding a blind sheikh and nine other Muslim militants guilty. Tonight, federal officials stepped up security at the nation's airports, a move they linked in part to recent events involving the Mideast. And as NBC's Rahema Ellis reports, there was also a ring of blue around the courthouse in Manhattan today as the jury returned with its verdict. Police were all over the Manhattan federal courthouse as the largest terrorism trial in U.S. history ended after one week of deliberations. The jurors, known only by number, found blind Muslim sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and nine of his followers guilty of seditious conspiracy to wage a war of urban terrorism to pressure the U.S. to change its Middle East policy. With the sheikh as the spiritual leader, the terrorist plot included bombing five New York landmarks within a 12 square mile area in the space of 10 minutes. And there was a plot to murder Egypt's president, Hosni Mubarak. One defendant shouted, God is great, after the jurors had left the courtroom. Prosecutors described the conspiracy as a jihad, a holy war against America, but insisted the government's case was not about religion. This trial was about crimes, very serious crimes, not about religious beliefs or ethnicity or people from any particular part of the world. Defense lawyers say they will appeal. Well, I think the message is here, put a Muslim on trial and they'll convict them. The government's case was built around secretly recorded tapes and conversations. The prosecution also depended heavily on the testimony of a government informant, Imad Salem, an admitted liar who got a million dollars for infiltrating the sheikh's inner circle. However, during the investigation and court cases for the conspirators behind the New York landmark plot, it soon became public that the FBI had previously hired their agent, Imad Salem, as an informant infiltrating the blind sheikh's group before the World Trade Center bombing through evidence emerging from Salem himself. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Correspondent Jacqueline Adams has the story. 
FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. I'm holding 903 pages of draft transcripts. William Kunzler represents Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and several others charged with conspiring to blow up a series of New York City landmarks four months after the World Trade Center bombing. That case has not yet gone to trial. Kunzler confirmed newspaper reports of the Salem transcripts. In one, Salem complains to an FBI agent, since the bomb went off, I feel terrible, I feel bad, I feel here is people who don't listen. The agent replies, hey, I mean, it wasn't like you didn't try and I didn't try. You can't force people to do the right thing. There is material in here to show gross governmental misconduct. Today, attorneys for the defendants in the ongoing World Trade Center bombing case formally asked for the transcripts of Salem's tapes. Quite frankly, beyond me, why uh, now the fourth week into the trial, uh, we still don't have these materials. Prosecutors have refused to comment publicly, but legal experts say the defense may have no right to those transcripts. It's not a defense to a crime to say, if only the government had stopped me, I wouldn't have done it. So this isn't material that ordinarily the defense would be entitled to. Notice the media emphasizes that they might have been able to stop it. They then gloss over the fact that the bomb was built by their agent under FBI supervision in conjunction with the district attorney. Jason Burmis, having taken his marching orders from Alex Jones, asserts that the bomb was built by Salem and the media is ignoring it, and that allegedly the bomb making had been supervised by the FBI and DA. But Burmis himself not only glosses over the detail of substituting harmless powder, but also marginalizes when these recordings were released, which was during the landmark plot sting after the World Trade Center bomb. And looking at when Salem stopped infiltrating the cell the first time, depending on when the statements were made, they're still cryptic and could have easily meant a verbal plan or consideration for bombings and not an actual specific target. As you may recall, Salem himself had never said that Nocer or his cousin Ibrahim El Gabroni emphasized the Twin Towers as a desired target, only that they were talking about assassinations and multiple pipe bombings. But what happened was that Salem secretly recorded hours of his conversation on tape with John Antisev and other law enforcement officers during the sting of the landmark plot. A newspaper article revealed the existence of the tapes and the Reuters news agency received written transcripts. A copy of one of the most revealing conversations between Ahmad Salem and an FBI agent named John was acquired by WBAI. In that conversation, Salem demands more money from the FBI, outlining his contributions to the agency, including a cryptic statement by Salem to the FBI. Salem says, we know the bombs start to be built by your confidential informant. Now, even the last three weeks is going to be a nice payment. I'm just telling you for the future and what the, the expenses, they just don't want to buy in on $500 a week expenses. That's all. We're all just right. going to have to give me the, uh, you know, some of the expenses and they'll pay what, what operationally they are allowed to pay. Let me think about it. Don't think it. There's nothing to think about. Of course I have to think about it. I mean, I have... And then later on, there's, 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 there's bonuses and things of that nature. I'm just... The only thing I'm telling you different than from before is... That it's not a salary. Yeah. That's the only thing I'm telling you. That that is different than what we were doing anyway. Yeah. Okay. And okay. Let's him to go recruit Ahmad Abdu, or let's him to go uh, to talk recruit. to Ahmad Abdul Sattar. Yeah. Ahmad Sattar is a good subject. He can really give you a big help. Yeah. Let him really to give you a big help. I am. Look, he doesn't understand everything. Like well, he have to understand. He is the boss. We all running our heads around this boss. So he got to understand this point. But uh, basically nothing has changed. I'm well, just telling you yeah. for my own sake yeah. that nothing, that this isn't a salary, that it's, you know, but you got paid regularly for, for good information. I mean, the expenses were a little bit out of the ordinary and it was really questioned. Don't tell Nancy I told you this. What well, I have to tell her, of course. Well, then if you have to, you have to. Yeah, because, I mean, the lady was being honest, and I was being honest, and everything was submitted with a receipt. Yeah. Right. And now it's questionable. It's not questionable. It's like a little out of ordinary. Okay. You know. All right. 
I don't think it was. Uh, if that's what you think, that is fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb, which is went off in the World Trade Center. Uh, it was built by uh, 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 supervising uh, supervision from the bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it, and we know that the bomb start to be built. By who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Wow. And then he put his head in the sand and said, oh, no, 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 that's not true. He is son of a bitch. Okay. Wow. It's built with a different way in another place, and that's it. No. Don't make any risk. You know, this is, I'm just trying to be as honest with you as I can. Of course, I and, appreciate that. And as far as the, uh, you know, the payments go and everything like that, they're there. I guarantee you that, that they are there. Instead of what most conspiracy theory documentaries have done using a very short segment of the Salem tape, we demonstrated a lengthier portion of the recording not only revealing Salem's attitude in regards for his fees and services and what other additional bonuses he may have been trying to extract from the feds, but what accusations have been made in asserting an FBI role in the bombing is completely about taking Imad Salem out of context and what could easily be defined as an extortionist stance as to what Salem really meant since such recordings were never intended to go public, was that he was threatening to contact FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. about the New York Bureau failure to stop the bombing by not having paid or met with Salem's high demands the first time to keep him in the blind shake circle, wired as an FBI agent that would have to take the stand in a trial. And more recordings surfaced again back in 2011 with the same mainstream media narrative that the FBI could have prevented the bombing, again, cryptically and nothing indicating Salem himself physically constructing a bomb. A man who risked everything to go undercover in a terror organization releasing new recordings showing how the United States may have been able to stop the World Trade Center bombing back in 93. However, Ahmad Salem says that the uh, feds forced him to stop his work when he refused to risk wearing a wire. Just a few months later, the terror cell brought in Ramzi Youssef. He put together the plan to set off a bomb at the World Trade Center a bomb that killed six people and hurt a thousand more. After, Salem made his recording of a conversation with one of the, with one of the handlers. But bear with us here, the audio's not great, so listen up. If we was continuing with what we was doing, this bomb would never go off. Absolutely, but don't repeat that. The Independent reported that several of the bombers were trained by the CIA to fight in the Afghan war and that the CIA admitted partial responsibility for the bombings. Ron Kuby, defense attorney, said concerning the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, quote, The mastermind of the 1993 WTC bombing is the government of the United States. It was a phony government-engineered conspiracy to begin with, and it would never have amounted to anything had the government not planned it. You would think at this point that it was in part a government conspiracy, and a lot of independent press certainly accepted that narrative with some of the World Trade Center bombing conspirators having fought in the Afghan war, since it was a recent historical fact that the CIA had backed the Mujahideen, but that's not necessarily true, nor exactly what Ron Kuby actually meant, even though it can be easily construed that way. Because if you really spend some time and explore the case of Mohammed Salome, You'll find that aside for the apartment he shared with Ramsey Youssef on Panrapo Avenue, he was also linked to two other apartments. Following the World Trade Center bombing, police searched an apartment on 34 Kinnison Avenue in Jersey City, which was the initial address Salome listed on the police report for the stolen Ryder van. According to mainstream news sources, the apartment had been rented out by a woman identified as Josie Hadass, who turned out to be a Mossad operative who fled. Washington Post Malcolm Gladwell wrote, Salome had provided a telephone number in connection with the rental agreement that was traced to a person named Josie Hadass at a Jersey City address. The article added, A search of the Hadass apartment Thursday afternoon had discovered, among other things, a letter addressed to the defendant, Salome, tools and wiring, and manuals concerning antenna, circuitry, and electromagnetic devices. The article stated, A law enforcement officer trained as a bomb technician has examined these materials, the FBI said, and conducted that they constitute evidence of a bomb maker at the location. Lastly, a dog trained for the detection of explosives responded positively to a closet space within the apartment. 
Safar Bangas, editor of Crescent International, a Canadian journal on Islamic politics, confirmed to sources that Gusi Josie Hadas was a long-established Mossad operative and that she had penetrated Islamic circles in New York, as had another intelligence operative, Imad Salem, a colonel in Egyptian intelligence. So what happened to Josie Hadas? On March 8, 1993, the International Herald Tribune quoted a response by a reporter's question about the role of Hadas in the Mossad to FBI spokesman Joe Falquit, who said, even if it were true, we wouldn't tell you anyway. But we will briefly return to Salome's previous Jersey address with roommate Josie Hadass later, as we are not entirely finished with Imad Salem either. And an incomplete account of conspirators this may seem, hold that thought as we continue figuratively with the manhunt on the remaining two fugitives, Imad Ishmoel, who fled to Jordan, and Ramzi Youssef, who took a flight back to Karachi, Pakistan the night of the bombing. This begins the chronicles of Ramzi Youssef, where throughout the next 40 minutes, just so viewers do not get confused with the timeline, there will be several different actors dramatizing Yusef's biggest crimes to come. That night, Yusef makes his way to New York's JFK airport. Yusef boards his flight and flies first class to Karachi, Pakistan. Though his accomplices would quickly fall into the FBI net, Yusef had planned his escape. He left right away. He left actually the night of the bombing. He began traveling, but Ramsey was a man on the run. He vanished, and it began a, a very intense fugitive investigation. So we were doing two things at the same time, prosecuting the initial four people that were charged and looking for Ramsey Yosef. We knew his roots went back to the uh, uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border. The U.S. Diplomatic Security Service immediately enlists their Pakistani contacts in the hunt. It was a multi-agency operation, and uh, members of uh, different law enforcement agencies participated in it. March 3rd, a raid for Yusef is launched in Quetta, Pakistan. It was a very close call for us. We were probably within just a couple of hours of taking him. We passed information to the Pakistani authorities. Ramsey became aware of it and fled. Yusuf was helped by um, some senior members of Pakistani intelligence. The Pakistanis just simply couldn't trust everyone. While one branch of the government was trying to locate him, there were elements within uh, the Pakistani government who were assisting him. They believed in what he was doing. They were angry against America. Aided by a vast terrorist network, Yusef is virtually untouchable in Pakistan. It's extremely hard to go and root out known terrorists in this country. Pakistani police trace Yusef to a place where he knows the U.S. agents will be unable to track him. We were looking for him in Peshawar. Peshawar has always been known as a Wild West town. So a town that a lot of smugglers, a lot of underground types have used as a resting place. Peshawar is qualitatively different from all other cities of Pakistan. It's surrounded by what is called the tribal areas. You can just get anything there. People walk around with guns, and so it's easy for people to hide. Very hard for American agents to operate there, and very easy for somebody like Ramzi Yusuf to hide there and use it as a base from which to flit across the border into Afghanistan. Pakistan. Yusef is teaching his childhood friend, Abdul Murad, how to build bombs. Murad has returned to Pakistan after two years training at flight schools in Texas, North Carolina, and New York. It was Murad who gave Yusef the idea to bomb the World Trade Center. Now the two men are brainstorming again. July 23, 1993, on an alleged contract initiated by members of Sapi e Sahaba. Ramzi Youssef and Hakim Murad returned to Karachi with a bomb they've made, destined to target Prime Minister Benzir Bhutto of Pakistan, the first female leader of any Muslim country. The plan that they had set in motion was to plant the bomb outside the Bilal House, the resident where Bhutto lived. Youssef had already scoured vulnerabilities and varied routes before finding a fixed place to point the explosives. Carrying the bomb, they headed to the residence. However, before they had time to arm it, they were interrupted by passing police patrol and guards. Police didn't see the bomb at first, However, Yusuf decided to abort the mission, finding it to be riskier than he initially thought. While removing the unstable bomb, the detonator ignited, creating an unlethal blast that was the pre-ignition for the explosive, 
However, it seriously injured Yusuf. Ramzi and Murad then fled the scene and rushed to a hospital where Yusuf stayed for two weeks, never being alerted to authorities, likely due to growing political influence with hardliners there. The detonator exploded impairing vision in one of Yusuf's eye, also badly damaging some of his fingers. Investigators allege that Yusuf again failed to assassinate Buddha when a gun to be used by a sniper was not delivered in time for one of her public addresses. But Yusuf's well protected by the country's radical Islamic community. And he is still stung by his failure to topple the Twin Towers. Ramsey has no shortage of plans. I mean, this guy is like, he's going to assassinate Benazir Bhutto. He's going to blow up the American consulate in Karachi. He's going to attack a nuclear plant. You name it, he was, he was ready to go. March 1994, the world's most wanted terrorist, Kuwaiti-born Ramzi Youssef, has avoided capture for over a year. With authorities searching Pakistan, Ramzi Youssef slips into Bangkok, Thailand, and begins plotting a new assault. Yusuf was building a terrorist cell of like-minded individuals he could rely on. Some of them had uh, quite effective covers. They were local businessmen or they were working, they were running shops, things like that. But at the same time, Ramzi Yusuf was living the high life as well. Ramzi Yusuf was uh, uh, very westernized. He liked the nightlife. Uh, he liked to go out. He was not a religious individual. The girlfriends he had were uh, bar girls. Uh, not exactly what I would say within the confines of a strict uh, Muslim man. Youssef's audacious plan would target the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. General Santi Cope of the Bangkok police is confronted with a terrorist plot. They drove their truck out into the city at 9 o'clock in the morning. March 11, 1994. Approaching the U.S. Embassy, the truck turns onto Bangkok's busy Chitlam Road. The driver collided with a motorcyclist. The guy who was driving the van had uh, uh, crashed into um, some sort of motorcycle taxi and got out of the cab and started panicking. There were people coming out of a local department store. There was a, uh, a crowd growing, and he heard sirens in the distance. The driver said he was going to make a phone call, but he ran away. So he ran off. The police arrived to find all this confusion. Bangkok police impound the truck. They drove the van without knowing that it had a bomb in the back. We brought the truck back and parked it in front of the police station. Thai police locate the owner of the truck. The driver of the truck had reported the truck missing, but when he arrived at the station, he immediately noticed a huge water tank on the truck that did not belong to him. He arrived and opened the back and found a huge bomb in the back. They found eight packs of C4 and the tank full of ammonia fertilizer. If someone had started the car and put on electricity, everything would have had a bone up. As the bomb squad defuses the bomb, they make another startling discovery. We opened the trunk and we found a dead body wrapped in a canvas. The decomposing body of the person that uh, Ramzi Yusuf had hired the van from and it was when the, the Thai police were, were examining the bomb and brought in forensics experts that they discovered uh, at least one of Ramsey Yusuf's fingerprints on it and were able to um, tell the FBI that the FBI, one of the FBI's most wanted guys had been trying to launch this bomb attack in Bangkok. By the time the manhunt has moved to Bangkok, Yusuf has already fled back to Pakistan. Ramsey Yusuf's terrorist star was in ascendance in, in the Far East. As I say, he, he was almost something of a terrorist celebrity. Pakistan. From Peshawar, Yusuf slips across the lawless Khyber Pass into Afghanistan. 
And in Afghanistan, he was able to work in some of the terror training camps there and is believed to have uh, given lectures and taught people about explosives in those camps. Shortly after failing to bomb the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok within two months of his return to Pakistan from Thailand, Yusuf and his increasing vitriolic hatred of Shiite Muslims gets another chance to launch a terrorist attack on his enemies. As he's approached by representatives of the Iranian rebel Mujahideen, e Kalk organization MKO, also mainly known as MEK, responsible for several terrorist attacks and assassinations in Iran. Although MEK is under the Mujahideen banner commonly known to have fought the Soviets, they are a pro-Marxist Shiite Muslim group that assisted in the 1979 overthrow of the Shah of Iran, later then creating conflict with the Khomeini regime, eventually being banned and driven out of Iran by 1981. After being expelled from France in 1986 by the request of Iran, MEK took base in Iraq, where they fought against Iran during the Iran-Iraq War alongside with Saddam Hussein's army. The MEK had asked or paid Ramzi Yusuf to lead an attack against one of the holiest Shiite sites in Iran, the Shrine of Reza, grandson of Prophet Muhammad and the 8th Shiite Imam. Few details are known about the planning for the attack, but Yusuf is believed to have spent several days building a small, easily concealed bomb containing around 11 pounds of high explosives, likely C4. Pakistani and American sources allege that Yusuf recruited his own father and one of his younger brothers, Abdul Munseen, into a cell together with a small group of vertently anti-Shiat militants from the remote town of Turbat in Baluchistan, where some of Yusuf's family still lived. They traveled across the border into Iran and then on up to Mashhad, place of martyrdom, the largest city in Khorasan province in the northeast of the country. The plotters placed a bomb in the women's section of the mausoleum and it exploded at 2.26 p.m. on June 20th, 1994. One entire prayer hall wall of the dome caved in, and a huge aging crystal chandelier shattered above the heads of pilgrims. Human limbs and remains were blown across the hall. A young woman interviewed later from her hospital bed described the events to Iranian TV. I was praying in the hall. I saw a yellow light. I was pushed from the way back, then down. When I opened my eyes, I was surrounded by bodies all over the place. The same report went on to show workers, many in tears, clearing shattered glass from the blood-stained marble floor of the shrine. At least 26 pilgrims died in the attack, including infants and children. More than 200 were injured. In fact, as you can tell by now, and as you'll see further ahead, this becomes not only Yusuf's most grotesque attack, it is also the most accomplished or successful bombing operation Yusuf took part in, being his most deadly attack to date, other than what he's already fugitive for from the US as the World Trade Center bomber. It was an appalling crime, all the more so that it took place on the anniversary of Ashura, considered the holiest day in Iran. Iranian security police caught up to the leader of the MKO terrorist group in East Tehran a month later, briefly interviewing him before turning into a shootout where he died the next day. Yusuf's father, who was still in Iran, was apparently arrested by the security police, while Yusuf escaped the dragnet fleeing back into Afghanistan and then on to Pakistan. It is said the Mashhad bombing ran counter to bin Laden's efforts to work with the Iranian-influenced Hezbollah that same year. As for some reason, it's long presumed Yusuf only worked in concert or at the behest of bin Laden, not as an independent contractor of a wider covering network. Yusuf also attracts the attention of terror's upper echelon. He did have associations with, with Afghanistan, with the people that were connected with Osama bin Laden. That he was part of uh, the early part of Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden provided him with financial funding for him to then travel to the Philippines to train a group called Abu Sayyaf, which operates in the southern Philippines. It's a particularly bloodthirsty, violent group. Philippines had porous borders at the time, and they could slip in and out easily. Ramzi Yusuf uh, provided them with terrorist weapons training. He, he taught them how to use explosives, how to operate as terrorists. 1994, the Philippines. Arab fighters flock towards a country in the throes of Islamist guerrilla warfare. Amongst them are Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his nephew, Ramzi Yusuf. The two partners in crime have many projects. Posing as businessmen, they meet in bars in Manila, mostly karaoke bars, to ensure their conversations cannot be recorded. An exotic setting, both men develop relationships with local Manila girls who are happy to go out with rich businessmen. They will use them to carry out their plans, asking them to buy components needed to manufacture their next bombs. At first, they plan on assassinating Bill Clinton, but they finally choose to target the Pope, scheduled to come to Manila in January of 1995. In Manila, one of his collaborators, a guy called Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, um, who also happens to be his uncle, um, was well known in Manila for wandering around some of the flashy hotels there in a white tuxedo. 
Through late 1994, Youssef recruits from Manila's Golden Mosque at Kepo, quickly assembling over 20 new followers to implement his most audacious plan of all. He began with Bojinka plot. Bojinka plot, which translated into the big blast. The Bojinka plot it was a plan to put uh, bombs on 12 different U.S. airliners. The idea was to have the bombs detonate simultaneously, so it would take out 12 747s at the same time. It was here to perfect a bomb that would become uh, an invention of the decade, of, or if not the century, which is a liquid bomb okay, that cannot be detected by a metal detector in the airport. And he tested this bomb in several locations. It was odorless. It could be hidden in a contact lens solution bottle used a, uh, a Casio data bank watch that had been modified. It had an improvised blasting cap on it and a connector for a nine volt battery. He could just take his wristwatch off and drop it in the little tray and, and to have it taken around the metal detector. And once he got on the plane, he could assemble the device and then set the timer. He spent a long time preparing this and uh, developing it for use to, uh, to bring down US airliners. Jojo Capacetti heads the Manila Bomb Squad. Uh, they tested all these kinds of chemical explosives here in Manila, and one of these explosives were uh, tested here at the Greenbelt Theater. Okay. Uh, it was, he, he ordered Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to, to put the liquid bomb below, below the, the seat of the, the movie house. So it exploded at around 10.30 in the evening. Only one person is wounded in the theater, but the test is conclusive. The next step, the installation of an explosive device on a commercial airliner. December 8, 1994, Youssef checks into the Donna Josefa apartments on President Quirino Boulevard. Two days later, Youssef boards a plane at Manila Airport. From his apartment downtown, it takes less than 30 minutes to get to the airport. He arrives in plenty of time for his 5 a.m. flight with Philippine Airlines. He bought the ticket as Armaldo Forlani. Yusuf is a skilled forger and he made himself a fake Italian passport with that identity. Having successfully gotten the bomb through airport security, he boards his Philippine Airlines flight. The final destination of PAL-434 is Tokyo. As Philippine Airlines Flight 434 begins its final approach into Cebu, more passengers are getting ready to board the aircraft that will take them onwards to Tokyo. The flight lands in Cebu at 6.50 a.m. and several of the passengers disembark including Yusef. During the layover on the island of Cebu, he disappears, leaving the device under his seat. 256 new passengers board PAL-434 that had arrived from Manila. Many of the passengers in the cabin are Japanese. Among them is a 24-year-old engineer, Haruki Ikigami. Two hours into the flight, PAL-434 is cruising at autopilot at 10,000 feet above Minami Diato Island in southern Japan. The bomb explodes at 11.43 a.m., four hours after Yusef planted it. Although the autopilot instantly corrects the aircraft's bank to the right, the effect of the blast is far from over. I stood up and saw that a lot of people were bleeding. I thought my life was over. After the struggle to lift him out, the steward realizes that part of the lower half of Ikigami's body is missing. Within a couple of minutes, he dies. A Japanese national by the name of Haruki Ikigami. He was uh, just an innocent businessman, a traveler. Uh, he had sat down in the seat where Yosef had placed the bomb after Yosef had gotten off the air airliner. During the course of that flight, the bomb exploded underneath him with pretty horrifying results. It blew out part of the side of the plane. It devastated um, Ikigami's body. The forensic pathologist recovered 94 fragments embedded in Ikigami's body by the explosion. He suffered severe internal injuries and massive loss of blood. But tragic as it was, the effects of the explosions could have been much worse. The downward force blew a hole into the floor and could have ignited the vapors into the center fuel tank, creating a catastrophic explosion. But the bomb was placed under seat 26K, which was not located above the tank. Just one row of seats away, the plane would have exploded mid-flight. Ed Gatumbato of the Manila Police is the lead Filipino investigator. We were able to recover 
parts of the improvised explosive device, uh, two pieces of nine volts battery, and the other one is the Casio Watts with a strap. So we were able to relate that all these bombings are attributed to the international terrorists. They alerted the FBI, of course. It soon became clear that it was probably Ramzi Youssef who'd been the, the guy who built it and had sat in the seat. They were able to work this out from fingerprints at the travel agency where he'd purchased the tickets and also from some of the air stewardesses who recognized his photo when it was shown to them. I flew to Manila uh, at the time to investigate uh, what was going on, but we had um, no clear notion yet of what was actually planned. And when the intelligence uh, emerged about the plot, and the intelligence emerged actually accidentally, just as a result of a fire in the apartment where explosives were being concocted. And it was a bomb factory. And in addition to finding the equipment that was necessary to fabricate explosives, they saw all this Catholic stuff, vestments, things. They were planning to assassinate Pope John Paul II using improvised explosive device. January 6, 1995, two years after the first World Trade Center attack. The Philippines, a largely Catholic country, is preparing for a visit from Pope John Paul II. Ramsey Youssef returns to Manila's Josefa Apartments to finalize the Bajinka plot. After he proved that his liquid nitroglycerin bombs would work, um, he realized he had to just make them slightly more powerful to be able to bring down um, airliners. The bombs would be detonated and the planes would have fallen out of the sky into the Pacific. Um, Yusuf hired an apartment in Manila and began mixing chemicals. He began preparing these bombs. Yusuf and his associates begin building 12 bombs to simultaneously bring down 12 747s, the most deadly terrorist act in history. The apartment in the Philippines was a bomb factory. It was a very complicated plot. Twelve different operatives to get on twelve different planes at specific times, get off at specific times, and to set the timers on the explosive devices to function at specific times. As Yusef cooks up explosives by the sink, the concoction accidentally ignites. The acrid smoke drives the two men from their apartment. Thick smoke begins to pour from room 603. There was a security guard at the apartments who forced his way in. He could see a load of chemicals and the fire brigade were alerted. When the investigators turned up, they were looking at the contents of this room and finding an array of terrorist uh, equipment. The explosive ingredients, the chemicals, the timer for cooking, the books, dictionaries, formulas. Ramzi Youssef was um, just down the block watching what was going on with his uh, conspirator, uh, Abdel Hakim Murad. He sent Murad back in. He ordered him basically, you've got to go back in there and get the laptop and, and try and get as much out of there as you can. Murad nearly got away with it, but he was captured by the Filipino police. Police arrest Murad as he tries to flee. They also seize the laptop. Youssef is watching from across the street. Within hours, he buys a first-class ticket to Singapore and slips out of the country. Murad is interrogated with extreme brutality by the Filipino president's own security team. But even beatings and waterboarding fail to bring a confession. Very tough guy. Murad was a tough guy. We are facing a blank wall. Almost zero. Zero information about these people. The visit of the Pope was underway, and we need to find out whether there are threats. So they said, let us turn Murad to the Philippine National Police. To a young colonel at the time, known for his great expertise in interrogating uh, communist rebels by the name Bugi Mendoza. Abdul Hakim Murad, a commercial airline pilot, He's interrogated by Colonel Mendoza, a veteran fighter against Islamist rebels who threatens to deliver him to the Israeli intelligence agency, the Mossad. You are telling 50% truth 
50% liar. Maybe if this uh, lie will exceed the 50%, I will uh, not waste my time again here and deliver uh, to you to the Israeli again. I'm becoming impatient. You are creating stories that are unbelievable. But I'm starting to believe on him. Why? Because I have seen his eyes. He's not winking. He can, he can uh, see me eye to eye. And uh, that's what I'm after. I have seen these eyes long, long time ago, several times. So this, city, this guy is telling me the truth. Indeed, the plot is foiled at the last moment when a fire breaks out in the apartment where Ramsey makes his bombs, on which the police discover the details of an operation codenamed Bojinka. Analyzing the computer's contents, investigators then discover new elements. It's the follow-up to the Bojinka plan, whose concept is radically new. Delta and Northwest jumbo jets bound for Portland, Honolulu, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York. The first clear straight line between the Philippines plot and September 11th. The next phase of Bojinka. Terrorists trained to fly commercial planes in the United States. I asked him, what is Bojinka? Uh, well, uh, it's a code name, he told me. What? What code name for? Then he, he, he trembled. Bojinka, he told me, is an explosion. He used the word nose diving. I remembered it. Diving the plane into several uh, targets. He mentioned uh, the Pentagon, he mentioned a nuclear facility, he mentioned uh, Langley. So I was shocked. That's the biggest surprise when the third uh, component of uh, the Ublan Butinka is the chasing commercial aircraft in the continental US, uh, controlling it, and diving crash specifically to Langley, Virginia. Okay, and other targets. How did you know this? Because Ramsey Joseph is telling me. So you are admitting that uh, you are one of the pilots. Mr. Murad, I remember that you told me that you studied pilot here. Who are your companions? There is a pilot training in the US. So I was again uh, mesmerized. He is emphasizing, Mr. Moore is emphasizing that this is a suicide attack using an aircraft. Do you think that some of the pilots of 9-11 were already in 95 ready to operate? Yeah, based on, uh, based on uh, my analysis, some of them might be there already. I have reasons to believe that uh, it was the blueprint of 9-11. Colonel Mendoza insists that he shared all this information with the FBI. The FBI acknowledges receiving intelligence from Mendoza, but claims there were no details about the plot that became 9-11. They had up to 10 Islamic terrorists training in U.S. flight schools. That plot was well in motion, and Ramzi Youssef had it all on his Toshiba laptop. They had up to seven targets including the Trade Center, the Pentagon, a nuclear facility, CIA headquarters, the Sears and Transamerica Towers, and the White House. February 1995, Islamabad, Pakistan. After this huge plot to kill thousands of people had been discovered in the Philippines, um, Yusuf is again on the run. Um, he's been on the run for um, nearly two years now, and he flees back to Pakistan. He renews his acquaintance with uh, Ishtiak Parker. Yusuf takes Parker back to Bangkok. The terrorist will use his young recruit as an instrument for swift revenge. Ramsey Yusuf uh, tells him to go and buy some hard-bodied suitcases, some hard-shell suitcases. Um, he goes and does this. He also buys some clothes that can be used to put in, in the suitcase around the bomb just as cover for the device. And the source was carrying all the explosives. Ramsey was clean. Uh, of course, wanted to make sure that there was nothing on him that would incriminate him in case he was stopped. Parker starts to have doubts about this. Um, he's very scared of Ramzi Youssef. He's not uh, as militant as Ramzi Youssef by any means, and he's not convinced that killing several hundred people is a very good idea. Parker makes an excuse and convinces Youssef to abort the plan. Parker is now very scared of Ramzi Youssef. 
He's very worried about what he's going to be expected to do next. The terrorist sends his young recruit back to Pakistan with new marching orders. Parker's having none of this. He spots a US magazine on sale and on a newsstand, uh, which indicates there's a, a multi-million dollar reward out for Ramsey Yusuf's capture. By now, the FBI's $2 million reward for information on Yusuf finally yields a tip. February 3rd, we received a telephone call from a female embassy employee that somebody was in her front yard acting a little strange, very nervous, very scared, and had a, a U.S. magazine, Newsweek or, or Time magazine, rolled up in his hand. I then responded to the house uh, to, to see what was going on in essence, and at first we chalked it up to someone just who wanted some money. For his own safety, the DSS agents spirit Parker inside the U.S. Embassy for further questioning. He began to speak of a laptop computer. He gave us physical characteristics that only someone in close and recent contact with him uh, would be aware of. The FBI decides to scramble an assault team to Pakistan. Parker informs the agents that Youssef is again on the move. Yusuf announced that he was going to get on a bus and leave the city, so then Parker slipped away and managed to pass this information to the U.S. Embassy. The Embassy realized things were moving too quickly. They had to, they had to capture Yusuf immediately. The DSS agents must work with the terrified informant without the aid of the FBI task force. Yusuf is to board a bus for Peshawar. The DSS realized he must be prevented from reaching the tribal region. He would have been gone because he would have fled. He would have gone into Peshawar from Peshawar over the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan. While American and Pakistani agents stake out the bus terminal, the informant again makes contact. We received a telephone call from the informant saying that his uh, Yusuf had changed his plans. He's not going to the bus station now. We're going up later. He's at the Sukasa Hotel. He's going to take a nap in a few minutes. Again, we moved over towards the Sukasa. The embassy immediately requests the aid of Pakistani law enforcement. The uh, ambassador asked for their immediate assistance in response to the Sukasa guest house and explained to them that we had very good reason to believe that Ramzi Yusuf was in country, that uh, we thought we would be able to take him very soon. There was a very real possibility that we might be able to finally capture this guy, Ramzi Yusuf, uh, in Pakistan, but we had to do it very, very carefully. I had prearranged with the informant to go across the street, go into the guest house. Ishtiak Parker went up to his room. He established that Yusuf was certainly still there and appeared to be building yet more bombs, stuffing explosives into remote control children's cars. If indeed Yusuf was in his room, once they finished, he was supposed to come out. He was to take a ball cap that he had off of his head and rub his right hand through his, uh, through his hair. Parker came out of the building, he ran his hand through his hair to indicate that Yusuf was there, and the uh, American and Pakistani agents began their raid. I went to the front door, and the Pakistani authorities went in first. Where is room 16? They shouted. They began swarming up the stairs, American agents with their hands on their guns, Pakistani agents already with their guns in their hands leading the way. They gathered outside room 16. ISI broke through the door. Ramsey was on his bed, uh, asleep. Probably had been asleep for only a few minutes. They jerked him out of bed, threw him up against the window. They spread his legs and then checked his identity. The ISI agents uh, kept control of him. He was very compliant. One of the Pakistani agents said, is this the guy you're after? He didn't open his eyes, didn't utter a sound. Finally, I gestured to the ISI agent to turn his face to me. I pulled out a picture I had in my, uh, my jacket, and I held it up next to his head. And he looked at me, I looked at him, and uh, I looked at the brigadier, and I said, that's him. And I said, what's up, Ramsey? It was the first time he'd heard English spoken that morning, and he realized that the Americans were there. The feared Pakistani ISI take immediate custody of Youssef. The ISI agent went back around and pinched Ramsey on the neck and said, uh, the Americans will go home tonight, but I will stay with you. And I think Ramsey then had a little moment of truth. His eyes filled with tears. Uh, his knees basically went out from under him. We come in behind them. They had taken a sheet and thrown it over him, so he looked like Casper the Ghost. They said, we've got him. 
When Ramzi Youssef is caught, it's a key piece of the web because he's the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing and so many other plots. But as the agents were moving in on that guest house, a guy across the street who saw what was going on took off. And that was his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And Ramzi Youssef's uncle had all the remnants of all of the plots that Ramzi Youssef had in progress. And he took these and he found his way to Al Qaeda. Youssef is taken to a safe house where FBI agent Garrett confronts him. I go in and they have him in a room. There's a, there's a guard on each side of him. His arms are restrained. So we have a little bit of small talk. He talks a little bit about explosives because he had part of a finger missing. He said those were bad attempts at building bombs. I, I said to myself at this point, I just might as well just drive right through the front door. And I said, well, did you blow up the World Trade Center? And he pauses and he says, no, I masterminded blowing up the World Trade Center. I said, okay, can we talk about that? He was just very proud about what he had done and knew that it needed to be done because of our involvement in Muslim countries and in particular, our relationship with Israel. He wanted to quote unquote, force us to change our policies. But he started complaining early on that he was really upset with the people that were driving this attack, that were pushing him to get it done, said they didn't give me enough money, they give, didn't give me enough time. He was arrogant, self-assured. He says, you have to guarantee me one thing. And I said, what is that? That I look presentable in professional clothes in front of the media. He wanted to make a a, a positive, I guess, impression or appearance that he was a guy who had it together. To convince the Pakistanis to allow Youssef's extradition to the U.S., the DSS agents must revert back to their mission of diplomacy. We were able to put the pressure on the Pakistani government that was appropriate without embarrassing them, but at the same time, making sure that they gave us Ramzi Youssef. Benazir Bhutto, the, the Pakistani leader, agreed that Ramzi Youssef could be flown out of uh, Pakistan and returned to America to stand trial, which was difficult for her to do because there, was, um, there were militants in her own government who weren't happy about cooperating with America. Ramzi Youssef is loaded onto a military plane headed for New York's Stewart Air Force Base. I took the Port Authority chopper from New York up to Stewart along with several individuals from the New York office, and we waited for the flight to arrive. In order to ensure American jurisdiction, Youssef must be flown directly to American soil. With their cooperation, we were able to send a team of agents to Pakistan um, covertly to bring him back to stand trial here in the United States. During the long flight home, the FBI agents get inside Youssef's head. We covered the whole gamut of his, of his terrorist activities. The Manila Air plot, the Bojinka plot, and the World Trade Center plot, questions about other plots in, in the Philippines. He was proud of what he did and was really anxious to tell us how he did it. Finally, the terrorist transport plane touches down in the U.S. The final leg will take Youssef through lower Manhattan. It was a very clear night. I'll never forget it. It was just crystal clear. We wanted to make sure uh, that he was flown back past the World Trade Center uh, at night with the lights bright, flashing boldly in the early morning hours. We came right down the Hudson River and of course you know, at the, the base of Manhattan uh, where the Twin Towers all lit up. He was in the custody of the lead FBI agent in the World Trade Center investigation. Bill Gavin. New York uh, just looked beautiful that night. Crystal clear, crisp, lights twinkling. And as, uh, of course, we had him with the hood on. And as we come down the river, we took the hood off and uh, get to about 34th Street, where the Empire State Building was out on one side. I said to him, look straight ahead, see that run? See the trade centers are still standing there, aren't they? In his little accent, he said, they wouldn't be if I had enough money and enough explosives. Right up to that moment, the bravado was incredible. The final arrest came six months later, in June of 1995. Iyad Ishmael was discovered and apprehended in Jordan. He too was turned to the United States to stand trial for his role in the bombing. 
Yosef and Ishmael were tried together in New York City. In a convoy of federal and local patrol cars, Ramzi Ahmed Youssef was brought into New York City late Wednesday night, ending a worldwide manhunt. He was arrested Tuesday in Pakistan by Pakistani authorities and brought back by the FBI on a U.S. plane, then into custody with heavy security on the street in case of any terrorist attacks prompted by his arrest. At his trial a year later in New York's Southern District Court, Youssef decides to handle his own defense against the advice of the judge. He performs better than expected, but he is found guilty on all charges related to the bombing of PAL-434 and conspiring to bomb 12 American passenger planes. Youssef is also found guilty in a second trial for the World Trade Center bombing. In his final summing up, Youssef justifies his actions. Yes, I am a terrorist and proud of it. And I only support terrorism so long as it's against the United States government and against Israel, because you are more than terrorists. Although Pakistani, Youssef describes himself as Palestinian by choice. And he justifies the PAL-434 and World Trade Center bombings as punishment for a U.S. foreign policy that favors Israel over Palestine. And hypocrites! In January of 1998, after being found guilty of the same 38 charges that the other defendants had faced, a judge sentenced the two to life in prison with no possibility of parole. The judge, calling Yosef an apostle of evil, ruled that Yosef should serve the remainder of his life in solitary confinement. Sentencing is scheduled for early next year for two key figures in the bombing of New York City's World Trade Center. They were convicted on Wednesday, bringing to six the number of people found guilty on charges stemming from the blast. The verdicts all but wrap up the World Trade Center bombing case. One of those convicted, Ramzi Youssef, was accused of masterminding the bombing. Prosecutors said Youssef told the federal agents who captured him that he hoped the bombing would knock down one of the Trade Center towers and kill a quarter of a million people. It was a brazen, bold uh, statement of terrorism. Uh, it was also a vital piece of evidence in this trial. The other man found guilty, Ayad Ishmoil, was accused of helping to mix the bomb chemicals and driving the van that carried the bomb. This is the second guilty verdict for Ramzi Youssef. He was convicted a year ago of plotting to blow up U.S. passenger jets in the Far East. One man charged in the Trade Center bombing, Abdul Yassin, remains a fugitive. The U.S. is offering a $2 million reward. Yusuf gave only one interview to the Arabic newspaper Al Hayat. He told correspondent Ragita Duran about a new Islamic militant group that would rise up to challenge the United States. He was speaking about a network, an international network, a network all over different countries, different nationalities. Eventually I said, my goodness, he was talking about the Qaeda. He was telling us a lot about the Qaeda. Ramzi Youssef might have given some key clues about Al-Qaeda and its intentions, but few in the U.S. government were listening. Ramzi Youssef, while born in Kuwait, is born of Pakistani and Palestinian parents. So the Palestinian cause would have been something inculcated in him from early childhood on, and the enmity towards uh, the West but Israel in particular, was something deeply seared uh, within him. Here was a man with uh, very powerful educational credentials to play a very active role in designing airborne explosives uh, and, in, and in technically planning operations. One of the interesting aspects about Ramzi Youssef is his family connection. He is the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the architect of the 911 attack. So we have a, a, a family tradition of radicalism here. Actually, Gerald M. Post is forgetting that it's two nephews. One of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's nephews and cousin to Ramzi, Imar al Baluki, aka Ali Abdul Aziz, was arrested in Pakistan in 2003, also linked to being a bin Laden bagman who funneled over $100,000 to ringleader Mohammed Atta. According to Wikipedia and mainstream sources, 
It's not known whether KSM was born on March 1, 1964, or April 14, 1965, or whether he was born in Baluchistan, Pakistan, or even Kuwait City, Kuwait, as BBC News has reported. He's fluent in Arabic, English, Urdu, and Baluchi, and is also believed to belong to the Baluch ethnic group. Baluch are mainly northwestern Iranians. Ramzi Youssef has described himself as an Iraqi, as a Kuwaiti national, and as a Baluchi from Pakistan. What could all this mean? According to Israeli journalist Yossi Melman, who wrote in 1998 in Haaretz, and later in a book called Spies Against Armageddon, Inside Israel's Secret Wars, that since the 1950s, Shin Bet, Israel's FBI, is known to have put agents in Arab sectors mixing in with Arabs and creating families. Their bosses called them Misa Adavim, which in Hebrew basically means Arab masquerader or masquerading as Arabs. They are commonly known as Arab platoons. Now some of you may ask, how could Israeli Jews mix into Arab areas without other Arabs or Muslims noticing? As most Americans are unaware, other than white European Jews in Israel, Israel's population also consists of Arab Jews, who are dark-skinned and without fail, are treated as a minority. Unlike European and Ashkenazi Jews who harbor Israel, Arab Jews are either generations from Palestine or other neighboring Middle Eastern and African countries prior to the 1948 formation of Israel. And because it's compulsory for Israeli citizens to serve in the military, Arab Jews do work within Israeli intelligence. This is the advantage of how Israel has perfected toppling infiltrating neighboring Muslim and Arab nations. Don't think so? How do you think Israel has been able to topple over Egypt so many times? Check out the Levant Affair, aka Operation Susanna on Wikipedia. A formerly secret CIA assessment, Israel's Foreign Intelligence and Security Services from March 1979 reported that it had been a long-standing policy for Israeli intelligence to disguise Jews as Arabs. One of the established goals of intelligence and security services is that each officer be fluent in Arabic. A nine-month intensive Arabic language course is given annually to students. The assignment, a 1997 Hollywood-made movie on the CIA Mossad hunt for infamous most wanted terrorist Carlos the Jackal starring Ben Kingsley and Aidan Quinn, demonstrates a prime example of how Mr. Arvim are able to function. Listen to me, you piece of shit! I'm trying very hard to be professional about this, but you are in Israeli hands now, so don't play games with me. Entiende, hombre? Israeli hands? What? You're telling me you're Israelis? Not Arabs? Other than the false identities of 9-11 hijackers, as well as other wanted radical Islamic terrorists or events that have been blamed by such, this revelation in mind may lead one to speculate that this Israeli advantage makes it impossible to detect who is really an authentic Muslim. One could say, almost like a multi-Semitic advantage. I mean, why else would an Egyptian like El Sayed Nusser, who clearly looks like an Arab or Muslim, have been able to attend an exclusive event and mix into the audience to assassinate Meir Kahana? World-renowned novelist and historian best known for espionage and military expertise as well as storylines, Tom Clancy wrote in his book, Op Center, Acts of War, that Mr. Aravim, Arab masqueraders, do not allow their real identities to become known to people outside their unit, and that even when they are undercover, they go to great lengths to avoid being recorded. A made-for-TV miniseries based on Clancy's book depicts such possible examples. Including the sure. name of Stolipin's paymaster, Abdul Fazawid. Oh. You recognize the name? Yeah, renegade arms trader, recruited by Mossad in, in 83. He's your man? We train many Arabs. Ten times more Israeli Arabs are joining Israel's army than three years ago. Some who swear the oath of allegiance are suffering the consequences. So why are their fellow Arabs joining the Israeli Defense Force? Some say it's for personal financial gain. Spies Against Armageddon is the new book that takes a closer look inside the matter. Dan Raviv co-wrote the book. There have been recent news stories that we talked about, those assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists. Can you say with all certainty that that group, this group, is behind those assassinations? I, I do feel certain. Uh, I have uh, co-authored this book with Yossi Melman, who's one of the leading Israeli journalists. We did a book even 22 years ago, Terrell, called Every Spy a Prince. And so we've kept our contacts, and uh, we think we understand uh, what Israeli intelligence does and why it does it. So one move that's right out of the Mossad's playbook is to infiltrate some of its own 
operatives, Israelis, into Iran. They have ways of getting in, and we say that they assassinated at least four Iranian nuclear scientists. And, and that's the question there. You wonder, how can an Israeli assassin get into the borders of Iran? How do these missions happen? Well, uh, no one's telling us exactly how they've been doing it in Iran, because that's very current. But we did get the history of how the Mossad, Israeli intelligence, has done it in other enemy countries, in Egypt, in Syria, in Lebanon. And so there's a special unit of the Mossad, almost like a Mossad within the Mossad. Indeed, a Mossad within the Mossad, or a Mossad within what they've deemed as Al-Qaeda. Because it turns out that these Mossad assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists around this time, and a couple of years later, was all in collusion with the Iranian MEK, an organization still considered a terrorist group and cult, which nearly 20 years earlier colluded with Ramzi Youssef in the Imam Riza shrine bombing in Mashhad, Iran. So what does any of this have to do with KSM and the first family of terrorism? A lot considering what's confirmed eight and a half years later with Israel's role in 9-11, while the narrative mastermind is KSM. Because yet again, there's another Israeli link to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, but through Ramzi Youssef with his original companion and possible commandant, Ahmed Ajaj, who had both landed at JFK airport on September 2nd, 1992. As you'll recall, Youssef was still let into the country using an Iraqi passport, while Ajaj was detained by airport security for trying to enter on a photo-substituted Swedish passport, while claiming to be a member of the Swedish press, carrying bomb-making manuals, videos and other materials on weapons explosives assembly, anti-American and anti-Israeli materials, instructions on document forgery, and two devices made to alter passports issued from Saudi Arabia. One of the manuals was entitled Al-Qaeda, the base, written in 1982, years before the supposed group was founded. However, prior to all this, Ajaj was arrested in 1988 as a petty crook counterfeiting U.S. dollars out of a base in East Jerusalem. He was sentenced to two and a half years in federal prison, but only served one year. Yeah, the, the American government's replaced the, the red uh, menace with the green peril, the green being the color of Islam. Uh, it seems like we always need uh, a boogeyman, and the, the boogeyman of the week is, is now militant Islam. Robert L. Friedman on The Village Voice, who had sources within Israeli intelligence, reported that while Ajaj was in prison, he was recruited by the Mossad. When he had gotten out, he had seemingly undergone a radical transformation. Suddenly he became a devout Muslim and an outspoken hardline nationalist, yet prior, Ajaj was never known to have been involved in Antifada activities or being pro-Hamas or PLO. Friedman also stated, Yusuf associated Ajaj appeared to have been recruited as a Mossad asset and deployed as an infiltrator into Islamic fundamentalist circles. Then, Ajaj was arrested for smuggling weapons into the West Bank, supposedly for El Fatah, a subdivision of the PLO. Friedman's sources in Israeli intelligence say that the arrest and Ajaj's subsequent deportation were staged by the Mossad to establish his credentials as an Antifada activist. Mossad allegedly tasked Ajaj to infiltrate radical Palestinian groups operating outside Israel and to report back to Tel Aviv. Israeli intelligence sources say that it is not unusual for Mossad to recruit from the ranks of common criminals. After Ajaj's deportation from Israel, he showed up in Pakistan where he turned up in the company of anti-Soviet Mujahideen rebels in Afghanistan. This in itself could point further toward Ajaj working for the Mossad, for according to the Covert Action Information Bulletin September 1987, the funding and supply lines for the Mujahideen was not only the second largest covert operation in the CIA's history, but it was also, according to former Mossad operative Viktor Ostrowski writing in The Other Side of Deception, under the direct supervision of the Mossad. Couldn't believe the FBI would basically tell him to build the bomb, give him real detonators, and then tell him, let it go forward. So is Alex Jones right? Was the 1993 World Trade Center bombing an inside job? A government false flag perpetrated by the FBI? We met Imad through another agent that I worked with him before. She said that he was a very good guy, trustworthy, former Egyptian army officer who immigrated to the United States. Now he was the head of security at a hotel. You cannot imagine how happy I was to, as just a new American citizen, that the FBI wanted my help. We were trying to penetrate this cell that we knew was dangerous. And we were trying to develop a mod as an asset to provide us with real-time intelligence that we could use to prevent an act of terrorism. Agents plant a mod outside the courthouse among Nocer's supporters. And Nocer's uncle, Ibrahim El Gabroni, takes the bait. 
think within the first day or two being there, Amaz was approached by Gabroni and asked him, I've, we've never seen you before, who are you, why, why are you here? Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! He responded that he was here to make amends with God for wasting his life serving a illegitimate government of, of Egypt. They recruit an informer who is more than informer. He's more like an operative. And how did you get these, um, these followers in front of uh, the courthouse to believe that you were like them, one of them, and get on the inside? Um, I established my entry point that I am an ex Green Berets and I'm a jeweler and part-time I do electronic surveillance. Why a jeweler? Jewelers means I have money and I know that they are after money. Why Green Beret? Green Berets, I know that either they want me to shoot somebody or they want me to build bomb. Um, third thing is I'm doing uh, co uh, electronic surveillance because I might have recordings and uh, if, I, if they see some recording devices with me, I don't want it to raise a red flag. To not put yourself in a position where you would be considered conspiring, that you had to walk a very fine line with not leading them to do things. How did, I, I know that we talked before about Antisev and Napoli. There were very strict rules that you had to follow. Well, I was very, I was schooled very well by the special agents who were handling me. John Antisev, Louis Napoli, Nance Floyd. They schooled me not to suggest targets, not to suggest bombing, because that's called entrapment. All of that was new to me in the American law. So I start to learn quickly not to open, but to give open and questions to let them roll and give me the information needed. Yet I don't want to jeopardize the case later on by suggesting then I'm leading them. And I learned that through my case agents. According to a source close to the case, Ahmad Salem checked into a Manhattan hospital three hours after the blast, complaining of a severe ringing in his ears. A hospital spokesperson refuses to confirm or deny the report. On August 3, 1993, Paul Daronzio interviewed William Kunstler on the Let Them Talk radio program, where Kunstler revealed some details of what he heard on the Salem tapes, as well as some of his own speculations based on his investigation. Here's a transcript part of that interview. Kunstler said, I've read a lot of the tapes by now, transcriptions of the tapes, which were just furnished to me today. Before I came here, I read some of them, and they are things like having him, Salem, say, well, I think we ought to bomb the George Washington Bridge. That's a very good target. He would make the commuters raise hell with this government of ours. And then Sadiq Ali says, yeah? Salem, and I think so-and-so. Ali, yeah? And so on. That's the way it goes, virtually throughout these hundreds of pages of transcriptions. There are 150 hours of tapes. A lot of them are in Arabic, some are in English. But this is the kind of man they're going to put on the witness stand. Tyranzio responded. Kunstler adds that Salem was a recipient of between $250,000 and $1 million for his services as an informant, plus monies paid to him by other sources linked to foreign governments, including money from an organization founded by the assassinated Rabbi Meir Kahana. Kunstler responded, He, Salem, also received money from Kahana Chai, Rabbi Meir Kahana's group, probably from a lot of other people. The Mossad is not someone to exclude, probably from the Egyptian government. He was a lieutenant colonel in the Egyptian army, which apparently he was. People speculate that Mayor Kahana could wind up dead. You know that. I know that. And you have suggested that it would not be at the hands of an Arab, but at the hands of a Jew. Yes. Why would they want to murder Mayor Kahana now? Because they are frustrated. They know of no other way to stop him. Even prior with Nocera's trial, Kunstler maintained an assertion that Kahana was murdered by enemies within his own organization and suffered repercussions while defending him and the 93 bombers. I asked Dad if he thought Nocera was innocent. He told me that a lawyer never asks his client that question. This was one case he didn't even try to justify. He sort of morphed into representing the unpopular, almost any unpopular and it didn't matter so much as to how you became unpopular. 
why is he doing this? I mean, why is he representing those people? You know, aren't there still other cases of people we agree with out there? He lost a lot of uh, the liberal support that he had, and he was no longer the great civil liberties, civil rights lawyer. After the verdict, the Jewish Defense Organization staged daily protests in front of our house, shot out our front windows with red paint pellets, and called my father a self-hating Jew. Kutzler is a traitor! Kutzler is a traitor! Kutzler is a traitor! Kutzler is a traitor! But, uh, it was scary. There, there were police at either end of the street. Kutzler must go! If there were protesters outside when I got home from school, I would pretend I didn't live there. I didn't want them to know I was his daughter. Dad went on to represent defendants charged with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and others indicted for a plot to blow up the Lincoln and Holland tunnels. No one supported him. I hope you people will think of the questions that I don't have. Rabbi Meir Kahane is perhaps the most well-known Jewish leader in the world and certainly the most controversial. His fame started in 1968 when he organized the Jewish Defense League, which became notorious for its militant activities against the Soviet Union, as well as for its self-defense patrols in the inner city, which were meant to protect poor and elderly Jews. Arrested many times for his beliefs and convictions, at one point he served 11 months in a federal prison. Prior to finding the JDL, in the late 1950s to early 60s, Kahane worked as an FBI informant himself, infiltrating the John Birch Society under the name Michael King. The JDL is a racist and oftentimes violent group of Jewish supremacists that's not part of mainstream Jewry, but they are known for violent demonstrations and also committing mainly domestic acts of terrorism. Kahana called the man a dirty Arab. Kahana often refers to Arabs as dogs. I want to make it clear to those dogs that are standing there, there is no such thing as an Arab village in the state of Israel. It gives us greater strength. And it's not going to be long before we have the power to clean this place out. And that's where I want them out, out, out. In 1975, Kahani was arrested for leading an attack on police outside the Soviet UN mission and injuring two officers. Later that year, Kahani was accused for conspiring to kidnap a Soviet diplomat, bomb the Iraqi embassy in Washington, and ship arms abroad from Israel. His probation for a 1971 firebomb-making incident was revoked, and Kahani was found guilty of violating probation and served a one-year federal prison sentence. A list of Kahani and JDL crimes are on the FBI website. Its members and leaders, including Kahane's multiple acts of terrorism, are so prominent and unavoidable that even the JDL have them listed on their site. Many Israeli soldiers make little secret of their support for Kahana, as do some of the settlers. If I were the settlers, I would, I would rampage through this town and put the fear of God into these Arabs. On February 25, 1994, exactly a year after the 93 World Trade Center bombing, during the overlapping religious holidays of both Jewish Purim and Muslim Ramadan, one former JDL member, devout follower of Kahane, a New York Jewish doctor who later became an Israeli settler named Baruch Goldstein, walked inside the Ibrahim Mosque at the Cave of the Patriarchs compound in Hebron while carrying an IMI Galil and opened fire on a large number of Palestinian Muslims gathered for prayer inside. A man wielding an assault rifle fires 110 rounds before a mob stops him, bludgeoning him to death with a fire extinguisher. Dr. Baruch Goldstein, a fanatical right-wing Jew from a nearby Israeli settlement, had killed 29 Palestinians and seriously wounded 70 others. Baruch reportedly swore to take revenge for the killing of Kahana, infamously now known as the Goldstein Massacre. In an interview with Israeli radio less than three months ago, he seemed to warn of today's attack. With the help of the Almighty, we will found the state of Judah, and then we will know how to deal with them on our own. Today, after the attack, Israeli militants hailed him as a hero, the son of Meir Kahani calling him a Samson of his time. Samson of his time? Irrespective to Islamophobic propaganda, 
the history of terrorism started in Egypt by creating the Muslim Brotherhood as a political religious organization and they used violence to convey their message. As we have visited the beginning stages of what some have deemed as the roots of Islamic terrorism, that now subjectively to the American lexicon is equated to suicide bombers, what Kahana's son said about Goldstein is the prime example to show the unexpected fundamental polar opposite through Judaism. Based on the Old Testament character, or as what American audiences once remember sexualized with the story of Samson and Delilah, sometimes considered the Israelite version of Hercules, Samson, who's eventually captured by the Philistines then tortured, and in the end, brings down Dagon's temple, knocking his pillars, killing himself along with all his enemies inside. Nobel Peace Prize winner Seymour Hirsch documented in his own book titled The Samson Option, Israel and the Bomb. Israel from its own inception has framed its entire national defense policy around developing nuclear bombs. Hirsch claimed that if necessary, Israelis are essentially willing to blow up the world, including themselves, if they have to do so in order to defeat Arabs and foes they perceive are a danger to Israel's survival. This glorification of founding suicidal combat is later revered going back to the famous mass suicide of Masada by Jewish zealots known as the Siege of Masada with Roman troops at the end of the first Jewish-Roman war, just like what so-called alt-media sites like World Net Daily like to promote. Masada, the place we left, as Roman soldiers stood on the top Amidst the destruction 2,000 years ago, beholding the last Israelite soldiers having taken their own lives rather than give up, Israel was raised from the dead of history, that was her grave, and became a nation again. Although it's important to recognize Israel being founded in 1948 through modern day colonialization by European Zionist settlers in a wide range of attacks that in some cases did reach those sacrificial extremes before and after. They are in itself the innovations of modern terrorism by way of such Jewish paramilitary and terrorist groups as the Haganah, Ergun, and Sturden Gang, which now the West continues to suffer with its repercussions till this day. An episode that shocked the world in 1946 in the same way the Munich Olympic tragedy shocked the world last year was the blowing up of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem by Jewish terrorists. One of the leaders of Stern, now a political writer in Israel, was Nathan Yalinmore. Was not the state of Israel founded in part on the use of terror by Stern Gang, by Irgun? Of course I admit. So you, Special. a former member of the Stern Gang, respect the fighters of Black September? Of course I respect them. I know that, uh, yes, excuse me, uh, I wouldn't like to use the same methods as they use. Uh, because they do it differently than we did. As what Mike Wallace stated about the Munich tragedy shocking the world the same way as the bombing of the King David Hotel, the reality is with the American lexicon, especially today in regards to the foundation of Israel and terrorism in the Middle East, when the awful tragedy with the 1972 Munich Olympics is discovered in this day and age, it is simply thought of as Islamic terrorist by today's standards, but if you research the Black September and what actually happened through the almost 24-hour ordeal in Munich, West Germany, where Palestinian terrorists dressed in safari uniforms had taken members of the Israeli Olympic team during the Summer Olympics, known as the Munich Massacre, in which all 11 athletes and officials were kidnapped and killed, as well as a terrorist and a policeman, in a tragic failed rescue operation to thwart the members of the Black September from escaping with the remaining hostages to Egypt. But since we're on a roll with cinematic examples, if one were just to rely on Steven Spielberg's 2005 Hollywood movie Munich, which barely covers what all happened throughout the ordeal, viewers would be inclined to think these were just simply Muslim terrorists. However, if you watch the 1976 ABC made-for-TV movie 21 Hours at Munich, you will find some disturbing truths with the Black September leader over the whole ordeal, Lutif Afif, from within this scene during the hostage negotiation towards the press. My mother is a Jew, as a matter of fact. Why do you look so surprised? And Latif's father was also a Palestinian Christian. A very sad story indeed, considering what the qualifications are for Jewish birthrights and Israeli citizenship. But again, with Mike Wallace and the 60 Minute piece. The fact is that innocent people die from terror, whoever the terrorist. The Jewish independence fighters, trying to hasten the exit of the British from Palestine and to intimidate the Arab population there, 
bombed bus stops and office buildings, railroad trains and shopping crowds. The fighters of Stirn and Irgun took a toll of innocent victims that ran into the hundreds. Leader of the Irgun was Menachem Begin, now a member of the Israeli parliament. We took all the risks possible in our lives during the fight. We never left this country. The British were here carrying our pictures by every policeman, every soldier. We took all uh, the risks involved in such a fight as everybody else. But I don't want any comparison, even by dissimilarity between us and the Black September and the Fatah. Uh, completely different uh, stories of a fight, either in the aim or in the method or in the intention. And let us not repeat that sacrilege, Mr. Wallace. It is sacrilege to you. Please. But apparently it's not sacrilege if an Israeli wants to blow themselves up because the concept of a right-wing Israeli suicide bomber is plausible for being used in carrying out false flags for Israel's contingency because on October 18, 1983, a 22-year-old man named Israel Rabinowitz, who had arrived in the U.S. two weeks prior carrying an Israeli passport, was arrested attempting to bomb the U.S. Capitol with two drink bottles filled with a powdered substance attached to his belt wired to an operating detonation cap while approached in the House Gallery by officers for acting suspicious, where he then threatened to blow up the building. Police were able to detain him and he was charged for threatening to kidnap a person and cause bodily harm. And like the same old story we've heard, he was eventually deported back to Israel a couple of months later. In fact, the concept of devoutly religious Israeli suicide bomber was made into a blockbuster Israeli motion picture in late 2000 called Time of Favor. The Hebrew language movie was not only a major hit, but also captured six awards in Israel. It's a drama about an orthodox rabbinical student who when rebuffed in romance, launches a plan to place explosives under Israel's Temple Mount, a long-standing point of connection between Israel and the Muslim world, which then accidentally becomes thwarted last minute, almost reactivating and turning into a suicide bombing or mission. Time of Favor was scheduled for release in New York theaters in September of 2001, but in the wake of the September 11th attacks that rocked the Big Apple, the premiere was shelved. And looking at 9-11, some have suggested the possibility that three of the hijacked flights involved could have been carried out by Israelis taking on a suicide mission, either posing as passengers or even in combination disguised with a real team cell of Muslim Arab hijackers, a suggestion based on accent of hijackers' voice and early misreporting of hijacker identities, either being reported alive or the inconsistent chain of evidence for 14 of the hijackers boarding their flights from Boston Logan and Newark airports. By all these examples, we are not suggesting such an outsourced suicide mission or plan was carried out by Israel within the 9-11 attacks. But we are advocating that the attacks to take down the World Trade Center did mutate from Ramzi Youssef's original intention already morphed with the Bojinka plot, and that in fact, its method of crashing passenger airliners was in some part inspired by Japanese kamikaze pilots during World War II. But such violent ideas of twisted acts are no different than what's already been demonstrated by nostalgia with the wide range in cinema and television of yesteryear that has influenced all cultures in modern civilization. But Israel's sacred terrorism must be fairly analyzed and compared no matter how uncomfortably similar it is already to the familiar Islamic version of it. This is set to demonstrate the possibility of how both worlds will and can overlap whether each side knows it or not all the time and that essentially the American conspiracy theorist activist is not recognizing the underlying problems of international organized crime. I mean think about it. Westernized, college educations, wearing Amani suits, hanging out in strip bars in the Philippines and Thailand? Does that sound like a fundamentalist Muslim to you? After the capture and arrest of Ramzi Yusuf's cousin in Karachi 2003, Amar al-Baluki, he was kept in custody at an undisclosed location until 2006 when he was transferred to Guantanamo Bay. He was listed as a ghost detainee in the CIA prison system by Human Rights Watch in 2005. During al baluki's secret detention, he was tortured under so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. Officials reported, al baluki was tortured and forcibly dunked into a tub filled with ice water, repeatedly hit with a truncheon-like object and smashing his head to a wall. His torturous interrogation was fictionalized and depicted in the 2012 movie Zero Dark Thirty. It is said that al baluki had a copy of a Bin Laden letter to a Saudi scholar in his pocket, a computer disk containing a draft letter to him, two images of the September 11th attacks, and a perfume bottle containing a low concentrate of cyanide. 
He was also accused of discussing possibilities of exporting explosives to U.S. textile companies, but then claimed of having no knowledge of such conversation. He is also fluent in English and worked at his uncle KSM's honey processing company in Karachi for a brief period before being hired in 1998 as a computer technician for Modern Electronics Corporation in Dubai. According to some evidence given at the Combatant Status Review Tribunal, he was very open-minded and Western-oriented, while his ex-wife Afia Siddiqui told investigators differently. Al-Baluki requested his statements be garnered from MEC that would testify he had no connections to militant forces, and that his employee records would show that he left days before 9-11 due to work permit being expired when MEC closed its branch in Dubai. The judge ruled it irrelevant, and the tribunal did not locate Al-Baluki's former MEC employees, but he submitted two statements written as to what he believed his MEC co-workers and his Israeli roommates would say. Israeli roommates? I don't know about you, but does it sound like Al-Baluki may have been set up? From what we've gathered so far about the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and what is widely known about the alternative 9-11 conspiracy theories, and without clear indication of where KSM was born, what ethnicity, and also in the same likes with Yusuf, added with those kept close around him, as then later with Amar al-Baluki, by this revelation, added with occupations and sources of income, could also mean that this so-called mastermind of 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that's also currently in Gitmo right now, may just be an organized crime figure within the Arab underworld with a genuine hatred towards the US he sought revenge for, or could have been all of that as well as an Israeli Mossad asset working ubiquitously for or within the loose base, aka Al-Qaeda. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, or KSM, confessed to masterminding the 9-11 attacks from A to Z in a highly dubious, heavily redacted confession extracted after four years of torture in a secret CIA prison and after having his sons abducted and used as bargaining chips in the interrogation process. In 2006, KSM confessed to murdering Wall Street journalist Daniel Pearl. He claimed he had cut off Daniel Pearl's head with his, quote, blessed right hand. But because he'd said that while in U.S. custody, where he'd also been waterboarded, and because he'd been known to exaggerate, there'd been lingering doubts that alleged 9-11 mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had really done that. He was never charged with the crime. Now, a report that seeks to erase those doubts. Ashra Nomani was a friend and colleague of Daniel Pearl's at the Wall Street Journal. She led an exhaustive investigation by a group of Georgetown University students of Pearl's murder in Pakistan nine years ago. The authors say they can pin the killing on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed because they analyzed an unusual technology called vein matching. They say at one point, the FBI asked the CIA, who was holding Mohammed, to take a picture of his right hand. Investigators took that picture and matched it against a frame in the video of Pearl's murder. In that video, all you can see of the killer, according to this report, is his hand. The report says the vein patterns on the hand in both images were a match. The FBI won't comment on the report. The report says a man named Omar Sheikh was wrongly convicted of actually killing Pearl, though he did allegedly set up Pearl's kidnapping. It says Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was asked by a top al-Qaeda operative to get involved because the kidnappers didn't know what to do with Pearl. At one point, this entire kidnapping could have gone a different direction, right? What we discovered was that Omar Sheikh actually had as his original ransom note that Danny would be released. And so the case turned and became murder. But it wasn't meant to start off as a murder, and Danny was actually supposed to be released. But the report says Khalid Sheikh Mohammed wanted to kill Daniel Pearl for propaganda. But unlike the torture stories we've been told about KSM, and as we've demonstrated by numerous witness accounts, U.S. secret agent Brian Parr stated that when Ramsey was taken into custody, Yusuf was friendly, he seemed relaxed, and he actually seemed eager to talk to us. So are these individuals known as KSM and Yusuf really who they are? Are they Arabs? Or are they Muslims? And, and let me ask you, I mean, you've been answering a lot of questions lately about uh, the newsletters that were published under your name, and some of the things contained in them were conspiracy theories. Some of the stuff was very incendiary, and, you know, saying that in, in 1993, the Israelis were responsible for the bombing of the World Trade Center. In his 2013 book, False Flags, Template for Terror, Author Michael Collins Piper wrote, in comparison between 9-11 and the 93 bombing with KSM, Youssef, and companion Ajaj, if the uncle and nephew teams really are Arabs and or Muslims, the fact that nephew Youssef was working closely with a reported Israeli intelligence asset in the first World Trade Center attack is still noteworthy indeed, particularly since the Israeli asset in question was himself an Arab. 
So is it wrong and controversial for few daring investigative journalists, researchers, and officials, regardless of present Arab or Muslim involvement, but to speculate or conclude that the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was in some part, if not in total, an Israeli Mossad operation? Especially those who are able to stick around eight and a half years later on the day of 9-11 with the arrest of the dancing Israelis. And if that claim was supposed to be discounted, only then to be vindicated in 2009, when New York Times reported that Flight 93's hijacker pilot Ziad Jarar has a cousin named Ali who was arrested in Lebanon for having been a Mossad spy for 25 years, and also in the days after the attacks, his immediate family refused to believe Ziad was even a fundamentalist or hijacked Flight 93. While at the same time, when none of the flight crew and passengers witnessed four hijackers, only that there were three hijackers on Flight 93? There's three guys who hijacked the plane. You know, he said his plane had been hijacked by three men. He told me that three people had taken over the flight. There are three men that say they have a bomb. She said my flight had just been hijacked by three guys with knives. And while the cockpit voice recorder, which was played to victims' families of Flight 93 during the Zacharias Massawi trial, later transcribed and detailed that Saeed Al-Ghamdi was in the cockpit piloting and not Ziad Jarar. And how can we forget his Egyptian confidant Mohammed Atta, the proposed leader of the attacks, who not only had Mossad agents posing as art students living next door to him in Florida, but is also the first believed to be living hijacker after 9-11 due to the fact that his father had gotten a phone call from him after the attacks, in which he also concluded and said who is ultimately responsible, and his once pink-haired stripper girlfriend, Amanda Keller, who not only partook in his drinking alcohol and doing lines of cocaine, but had also said that he could speak Hebrew? Regardless if these guys ever hung out in mosques, these guys liked to party, just like Ramzi Yusuf and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed did. But neither of these figures are serious enough and actually fit the profile to take on a suicide mission. But in reality, they certainly likely know how and where to find those who would. But has there ever been any evidence out there to tie KSM directly with the Mossad or Israel? Aside from what we've demonstrated with his nephews? Well, it seems there is. According to Associated Press writer Jim Gomez on June 26, 2002, written in an article titled, Top 9-11 Suspect Live Lavishly, after KSM had been revealed to be the organizer of 9-11 and on the FBI's most wanted list, the article details that Philippines police colonel Rodolfo Mendoza being public about his feelings that the 9-11 attacks were planned there in 1994, but that with the capture and interrogation of Abdul Hakim Marad from the subsequent discovery of Ramzi Yusuf's laptop left over in the apartment fire, the Bajinka plot or plan was thwarted, but that it appeared KSM was also supervising the planning along with them there in the Philippines, with other operatives. But it also says in the article that a confidential Philippine police report prepared by Mendoza states that Mohammed KSM, had traveled to Israel in the United States, according to the report. KSM traveled to Israel? What? Why would KSM travel to Israel? Can you say game changer? So yes, Michael Collins Piper could have been very well right. KSM could have also been an Israeli Mossad asset working ubiquitously for or within Al-Qaeda with his anti-Shiite vitriol. But in hindsight, around the 93 bombing, it was not a wild accusation to charge such a claim for involvement by Israeli Mossad or Jewish organized crime. And if we need to include a semi-vindication again with the late world-renowned author of Jewish intrigue, Michael Collins Piper, where in his first book in 1993, Final Judgment, The Missing Link in the JFK Assassination, which it in all its editions was banned in several countries due to its controversial implications underlining Mossad and Jewish organized crime, yet in 1994, a year before William Kunstler passed away, he wrote an autobiography titled, My Life as a Radical Lawyer, which he certainly was when you look at all the high-profile cases that he defended, which coincidentally was also briefly this guy. Jacob Rubenstein, a.k.a. Jack Ruby. Everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. Well, not exactly. According to Kunstler's biography describing Ruby as a violent and mentally unstable person, paranoid of pogroms and anti-Semitism, it states, When Jack told me he killed Oswald for the Jews, I believed him. On each of the three occasions we talked, he said, Bill, I did this so they wouldn't implicate Jews. Lee Harvey Oswald had belonged to the Fair Play for Cuba, an organization with a number of Jewish members. Because of this association of Oswald, Jack's convoluted thinking led him to believe that the Kennedy assassination would be linked to Jews. So did Williams' comfort speculations and findings on Imad Salem serve him some merit for his cases for entrapment for the landmark plot bombers? 
and or possibly being a Mossad or Egyptian asset with closer oversight of the 1993 bombing than he proclaimed? FBI informant Imad Salem met us at Ground Zero and talked to us for the first time about why he risked his life to help the U.S. stop Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and his followers from bombing New York. The original plan that we should blow the bomb on December, which Christmas Day, to spoil the American Christmas. It was 1992 and Salem warned the FBI, but after he told agents he would never testify in open court, and polygraphs on him were inconclusive, Salem and the FBI parted ways. But members of the terror cell again reached out to Salem, and again, he went to authorities about how the terrorists were speaking in code. The Sheikh was furious that his right-hand man was actually an FBI informant, and Salem says the Sheikh later threatened him in the courtroom. He said, you're Satan, and of course everybody knows what they should do for the Satan. Working undercover is not an easy task, especially with people who have no mercy. The guy is bad news anywhere he is, as long as he is alive, people get killed. FBI informant Imad Salem came out of hiding to warn about Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and how leaders like the president of Egypt continue to press for the Sheikh's freedom while leaders from the Persian Gulf nation of Qatar have requested the Sheikh be transferred out of the U.S. When are we going to wake up and smell the coffee? This man is dangerous in prison. What will happen when he's out of prison? If we today release him or like the State Department say, transfer him, is he going to be grateful to us? Absolutely not. He will kill Americans, he will kill anybody who will dispute what he say with a fatwa. I'm going to tell you one thing, I'm following Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman very closely. And sadly, for the first time since 20 years ago, he was taken out of prison, put in a hospital to prepare for his, what they call it, transfer. At the beginning, the State Department said, oh, we're going to release him. And then the media went crazy. You cannot release the guy has American blood on his hand. Oh, well, we will transfer him. And then this is, this is ridiculous. Shouldn't they have just been executed? Aside that it would be regarded cruel and unusual punishment executing a blind man, for a truth seeker or independent journalist, if Alex Jones ever had credibility from the start to be labeled as one, who has nearly spent two decades blaming the 1993 bombing on the FBI, self-proclaiming it to be the concern which initiated his platform, it would be extremely clumsy if not crass to suggest capital punishment on the central suspect of the unresolved conspiracy, only to then obstruct oneself from puzzling the rest of the unsolved crime. And as of Salem's appearance on The Alex Jones Show, the blind sheik ended up passing away two years later in February of 2017 due to health complications while in custody at the Federal Medical Center in Butner, North Carolina. His body was transported to Egypt for his funeral. But it's important to underline here still how the blind sheikh's imprisonment and the attempts to free him or transfer has been used for geopolitical bargaining chips, even within fundamental terrorist attacks that have been carried out. But for Salem, he also uses the blind sheikh's incarceration for his own agenda and cover. I will bet you something here. We have two or a year and three quarter left for Mr. Barak. He will release the sheikh before he leave office to shut the Muslim Brotherhood forever. And you can quote me on that. And the Sheikh was convicted. He went to jail for many years. He just died this year. How does that make you feel? And is the world, uh, what, do you think that we're going to enter a more peaceful time? Or are there other people like the Sheikh uh, who are, have already taken his place? Uh, on the contrary, I think we are in more dangerous before the blind sheikh passed away because a week before he passed away he wrote his last will and testament and he ordered his followers to revenge for him quote unquote violent revenge the blind sheikh had followers on the american streets today they are waiting for the opportunity to have a violent revenge for his death. I guess whatever options that may have been put forth in either freeing or moving the blind sheikh didn't matter, and bringing any clarity to either potential circumstances wasn't in Salem's interest, 
but he certainly sounds like a decisive fearmonger. This is a crucial point. It was not a black flag operation. It's not a false operation. It's a real crazy idiots, fanatics who wanted to commit jihad under the leadership of the Well, sure, sir, I want to be clear and not split hairs here, Colonel. Of course, Alex Jones is not interested in bringing any clarity as to what really happened, classifying sensitive details as just merely splitting hairs, when also he resists challenging Salem, since obviously the subject of 1993 is admittedly his shock jock radio personality foundation, and as a result has shaped much of his worldview as well as for his captivated audience. And even though he isn't entirely a reliable source at this point, instead of challenging Imad, Jones just follows up with his deficient and loose explanation of a false flag, which is actually to the contrary as to who pulled off the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. As yet, Salem is clearly indicating that it's not a false flag, which he's right. So, I wouldn't throw the blame on the FBI, period. The, the, the listeners and you would like to understand because... I was there. I walk the walk and I talk the talk and I am not afraid of nobody. If I am afraid, I wouldn't go undercover with assassins and evil doers. So nearly a year later on the cusp of Jones's historical interview with Donald Trump, Imad has his second interview with Jones on November 19, 2015, where now Jones has slightly changed or phrased his overall narrative of what the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was. Bombing. He was there, he tried to stop it and was ordered to stand down. That's even been in the New York Times. Well, Alex, unfortunately, if we allow this group of Sunni Wahhabist people to enter into our land, um, there is no doubt in my mind that it will happen again. We already got attacked in 1993 by the same group, however different name, it's all the same ideology. But again, I don't know if our government wanted that to happen again, to start to take our liberty out of our hand more and more and put more restriction on the, on the media. And then they will say, oops, it happened again. And they let these people to start to hurt uh, the American people to give them a reason to start to monitor more and to take our liberty out of our hands. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I am afraid that if they allow these people to walk in, that's going to be a false flag operation to let them bomb America. And then they say, oops, they bomb America. We have to monitor America more and take your guns and take your liberty and take every, even the mainstream media today start to be uh, controlled by the government. Yeah, sure. As if allowing these people to come in and bomb America didn't happen in 1993 and 2001 already. But now it's more likely to happen. Right. Of course, Salem doesn't want to spoil it for Jones's lucrative fear-mongering, and he certainly didn't want to give it away by resonating with Jones's anti-Obama position. Well, this is one of the policies Mr. Obama was trying to do. He is trying to control everybody in America, taking your rights, taking your guns, taking, stripping you from your rights so he can control you. You cannot defend yourself. You cannot stand up for your rights. Mr. Barack Obama's upbringing with a father who believed in fanaticism to the point that he named his first son Malik on God's name and the second son Barak, which is the right of Prophet Muhammad, Mr. Barak's heart is a Muslim. I have no problem with that because I am a Muslim myself. But don't go to the fanatics, take them over terrorist list, start supporting them, and then I have to pay the price as an American citizen. We are paying the price for increasing the power of the Muslim Brotherhood. Although we don't want to drift off turning this into a subject about Barack Obama, but rather about Salem himself after 2011, coming out of hiding with his appearances on Alex Jones in 2015 and after, but separate from the unexpected turnaround with Jones that was incrementally taking place shifting away from 9-11 truth years before, there's something to be said as far as ideological position in how Salem perceives our elected officials, government and media, especially in regards to foreign policy, since only for the U.S., it's drastically changed as a consequence to 9-11 that could have only succeeded without the failure of 1993 happening first. Salem referring to Obama as a Muslim on the Alex Jones show 
isn't the only unusual remark he makes about the president or the establishment, in which he's flat wrong on with his blanket assertion. He really takes it up a notch, insisting that his Kenyan half-brother, Obongo Obama, is an extremist, that he's a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood in Africa, when in actuality, Obongo endorsed Trump, not the Democratic nominee as one would expect. Aside for Salem defending himself and supporting the official narrative of 9-11, it seems he still has other agendas just being obsessed with Obama, when he decides to rehash Obama attending services of Minister Reverend Wright, making accusations that the Muslim Brotherhood are blackmailing Obama, and that Egyptians are portraying him as a radical. If you see the intelligence on the Egyptian streets today, you can see how they portray Mr. Obama, how they portrayed him with the big beard and a turban. I want to go back to Mr. Obama's first speech in Egypt, in Cairo, Egypt. The first visit when he went there and he said to the Muslim Brotherhood, I am sorry for what America had done. I don't understand what is Mr. Obama apologizing for. America was a great deal of help to Egypt at that time. We were giving the Egyptian military 1.5 billion by the B dollars as an asset, as an help with their military. Obama has apologizing about what America is doing bringing democracy and trying to bring peace into the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> Mr. President, you castrated the American military and the American influence around the world. And we are not helping even our allies in the countries in the Middle East. Uh, on the contrary, he is trying to... Um, say that he is fighting the war, but we are making only five bombings a day. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Now, that would certainly be a good idea to help him bring peace and prosperity after the lies and cover-ups of 9-11. But separate from Jones's twisted logic, Salem certainly sounds like a neoconservative, too. And if, if Mr. Obama really loves the Syrian people, what did he do when the Syrian people got gassed by Mr. Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> what did he do about his red line to Mr. Assad if he gassed his people? <laughs> this is not America which I put my life and my family's life on the line for. Mr. Obama, please, please help America. Don't weaken America. America can lead the world. America cannot be led by Russia. Russia today have influence in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria. Sure, and let's just arm another Mujahideen all over again, since Russia is all over back in Afghanistan too. It seems to be working for us. Definitely a neocon. Unfortunately, that's the price the American people, you and I, will pay that we get alienated from the Middle East, and when we go ask them to help us to fight ISIS, of course they say, if you come in to support a terrorist organization called the Muslim Brotherhood, you come in now, one of the tales of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is ISIS, you want us to help you fight it, sorry, and they walk away. And they went far from the United States to get their weapons from Russia and from China. And then, Lo and behold, Russia will start to spread their wings on the Middle East and we lose our leadership role around the world. America, I immigrated to is the United States of America and it is the supreme power on the planet and we should maintain that. Increase the military power and increase our leadership around the planet. Supreme power on the planet? Sounds like a flat-out warmonger to me. I was happy to infiltrate people who are followers of the blind sheikh because the blind sheikhs commit the biggest catastrophe to my life, assassinating my president on my watch. I was three to four hundred feet from the stage where he was assassinated. 
because I was among the troops securing the parade. I was so very angry, and I promised him revenge. And that's because President Sadat uh, made the first attempts to make peace with, with the arch enemy Israel. Is that correct? Well, it was not an attempt. I mean, he was fought tooth and nail by the Arab leaders not to make this deal, but he stood his ground and he believed that Israeli people have the rights to live, Egyptian people have rights to live, there is no war anymore, and we're going to make peace, period. Uh, well, I guess that just confirms Salem is a Zionist. It came a day when I saw the blind sheikh having 63,000 U.S. dollars in a piece of newspaper wrapped, give it to uh, uh, Montasir Zayat, his uh, Egyptian attorney, and he said, give this lil Hagga, al Hagga, which is his wife. Next morning, I contacted my Egyptian intelligence friends in Egypt. I said, Montasir Zayat coming back to Cairo, he have a newspaper wrapped under his clothes from the blind sheikh. I think it has some instruction to his followers. At this point, it might be worth considering what Salem has admittedly disclosed here about having intelligence contacts back in Egypt, that he certainly must have also had contacts before he got involved with the cell the first time, which is one of the reasons why heads of the FBI didn't trust him, because they didn't know who he was ultimately serving. One of the greater reasons why to suggest Salem could have at least still had oversight or a bird's eye view of the cell members conspiring and making the bomb for the World Trade Center as it was also reported in New York Times on April 5, 1993, that Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak said that the bombing could have been prevented if U.S. officials had heeded Egypt's warning about an Islamic fundamentalist network in the United States. And in, their in my conversation with them, they always say, let us to make them live in terror. And nothing be terror but terror. So we have to do military on there is no mercy here looking back on everything from 93 to 9 11 being himself in the middle of its origin imad salem is deeply invested in protecting the official versions which is tremendously counter to alex jones's platform who had long promoted the 1993 world trade center bombing as a domestic operation claiming it as one of his founding wake-up calls an inside job as he still does for 9 11. but few have seen this salem interview right before his second appearance on jones's show he did an interview with New York 9-11 truth activist Sander Hicks, where not only did Imad spend a great majority of the interview laying out the official narratives pre and post-1993, even suggesting Mohammed Atta was taking orders from Osama bin Laden, but unlike other interviews, Sander with limited time and wanting to shift the conversation into areas of 9-11 that conflict with the official story, boldly went straight to this question. So I have a couple of other questions I wanted to run by you. It seems like you know a lot about 9-11 and it's great to talk to as somebody who's been inside the FBI. Um, what do you know? Have you looked into Mossad, the Israeli connection? There was uh, an arrest of several celebrating uh, Israeli... The who is full of explosives. Right, the moving van guys. The guys, there were guys from Israel um, who were videotaping the attacks and they were holding up cigarette lighters like it's a rock concert and they were high-fiving each other. And they were arrested by New Jersey state, state troopers and then were released and they got back to Israel and they were on Israeli television. This is what really... There are two different groups. The people who were high-fiving each other, watching the planes, hitting, videotaping them, these people were not, was, was, they were not arrested and they went back to Israel and they submitted interviews to the Israeli TV and they acknowledged that they were taping the interview, the, the, the bombing of the, 19, uh, the 1991 World Trade Center. Uh, sorry. 2001. 2001. Right, right. Um, Israel is so powerful in the United States. Um, nobody will deny that. And um, is Israel is spying on the uh, on United States? Absolutely. I have uh, an um, intimate knowledge of that. Yeah, I think William Kunstler was onto something with his own investigations in regards to being tipped about Imad Salem receiving monies from Kahana Chai. Particularly when on his defense team, he had attorneys like Ron Kuby, who at the age of 13, after his parents divorced, joined the JDL under the influence of his father, who was a follower of Kahane, 
and immigrated to Israel as a teenager, but returned to the U.S. after being disillusioned by Zionism and Jewish extremism with its racism towards Arabs. But with the completely opposite end with Salem being the Zionist, even with his position of deniability in the conspiracy to build the bomb for the World Trade Center on February 26, 1993, with consideration that federal authorities are not entirely being forthcoming either, Salem was never considered trustworthy by the Bureau since the beginning. And just by examining a fuller-length recording of the public Salem and Antisev tape, rather than just a sensationalized soundbite taken out of context, which generically, in the minds of some truth-seekers, has been misconstrued as Imad Salem being a whistleblower, Salem was obviously an extortionist in regards to getting paid for his services. His excuses for quitting the first time likely had to do with the same exorbitant amount he asked for and got the second time around, rather than it just being over family death threats. Being that Salem's polygraph tests were inconclusive, he could have been nefarious still, and had also been accepting other bids by organized interests, or had actual oversight or a bird's eye view on the operation making the first bomb, making certain or even alerting Egyptian intelligence at the bare minimum that the bomb was going to go forward. But in Imad Salem's defense, and unlike Alex Jones, there are some credible researchers who believe Salem was honest, like former ABC News correspondent Peter Lance, who has written a great deal about 9-11 and especially 1993 and Salem's role as an FBI informant, while at the same time, Lance has been critical in regards to heads of FBI mishandling the investigations and other connected criminal activity concerning all the other suspects through cells and mosques. And there will be more to discuss about Peter Lance just ahead. But separate from the looming questions around Salem's bomb-making abilities or what was really being planned before he quit, the real question that should be asked is how were authorities able to quickly identify the proposed fill-in bomber, Ramzi Youssef, after Mohammed Salome's arrest and subsequent discovery of three addresses he was linked to. So far, what we've seemed to uncover is a larger conspiracy in 1993 with other suspects involved not caught or followed up on. But you may have noticed within some images of suspects and on an earlier report that there is at least one conspirator who wasn't captured, and that is the sixth suspect, Abdul Rahman Yassin. All early books, documentaries, and feature films depicting the 1993 World Trade Center bombing before 9-11 shows no involvement with Yassin, when in fact, he was actually arrested the same day as Mohammed Salome, but unlike all the other 93 conspirators, he was the most helpful to the FBI, which in the long run, ended up protecting him and giving him a free pass. Yassin was born in Bloomington, Indiana by Iraqi parents, where his father was getting a PhD, and then shortly moved to Iraq where he was raised there, until he moved back into the U.S. in 1992, likely as a result from the first Gulf War the previous year. To get an idea of his story and what else was missing from the 1993 bombing, here is about 10 minutes worth from a rare CBS 60 Minutes episode with Leslie Stahl who actually went to Iraq 10 months after 9-11 and interviewed Yassin. Over the years, the U.S. government was able to track down all the other co-conspirators in the 93 bombing and bring them to trial. Yassin is the only one who's yet to be brought to justice in the U.S. We met him 10 days ago in this secret Mukhabarat facility for his first interview ever with Iraqi intelligence listening in. He seemed shell-shocked, if not terrified, a shadow of the armed and dangerous fugitives sought by the FBI. Did you know you were on a most wanted poster in the United States? No. Yeah. Have you seen this? I've seen this. You know this. He told us he went to the United States in 1992 to join his mother and brother in their apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey. It was easy to get a passport because he was an American citizen. So how did he become a terrorist? If you believe him, it was by sheer coincidence. He says he bumped into two fellow Arabs living directly above him in the apartment building, Ramzi Youssef and Mohammed Salome. We used to drink tea together. My mother used to cook for the young men lunch and dinner. Arabic food. Pretty soon, though, Youssef was recruiting him, roping him in through political indoctrination. As he describes it, he became the pawn of Ramzi Youssef. He was not charismatic, but he had a strong logic. He can convince people easily. He convinced me. So you're saying that that... Ramzi Youssef and Mohammed Salome, they try to politicize you. Is that what you're telling us? Yes. They tried and I was influenced. They used to tell me that you are an Iraqi and you have seen the destruction in Iraq. 
and they used to tell me how Arabs suffered a great deal, and that we have to send a message that this is not right. This is to revenge for my Palestinian brothers and my brothers in Saudi Arabia. So they talked to me a lot about this. How did the operation get financed? I, I don't know. At first, he says, the plan was not to blow up the World Trade Center. Ramzi Youssef had something else in mind. He told me, I want to blow up Jewish neighborhoods in Brooklyn. U.S. officials say they never knew that Brooklyn neighborhoods, like Crown Heights and Williamsburg, were on Youssef's original hit list. Somewhere along the way, the plan changed. After a while, Ramzi Youssef told us to go to the World Trade Center. So we went there, walked around the parking garage, and he said afterwards, I have an idea. We should do one big explosion rather than do small ones in Jewish neighborhoods. Now you switch to the World Trade Center. What did that have to do with Jews? The majority of the people who work in the World Trade Center are Jews. So in other words, the purpose was still to kill Jews? In general, yes. You know that Muslims work there, that people of all religions work there, all nationalities. I am very sorry for what happened. I don't know what to do to make it up. My father died because of pain and sadness. It caused many troubles. I don't know how to apologize for it. Not only does he express remorse, something none of the others in the plot has ever done, Yassin incriminates himself in more ways than the government ever knew. For instance, you yourself went along to check out the Jewish neighborhoods in Brooklyn. You yourself went along to check out the World Trade Center with Ramzi Youssef. We went, the three of us, me, Ramzi Youssef, and Salama. So you, you were involved to the extent that you were actually helping them check out the sites. Yeah. Yes, I used to like to go out and see places. You knew that he was picking out things to buy. Yes, he told me that. He also admits to helping Youssef buy the chemicals and equipment to make the bomb from this company in Jersey City. You knew who you were dealing with here. You knew, you knew that he had been trained to come to the United States as a terrorist to make bombs and blow things up. You knew that. I knew that after I started working with them. Work, he says, that included helping make the bomb, which was assembled in a separate apartment in Jersey City they had rented. You were mixing the chemicals. I never worked with chemicals before. That was not my field. But you were doing it. He was teaching us. He was the teacher. Me and Salame were the students under his hand. At one time during the work, as it spilled on my leg, I have scars on my leg. Did, did you help them load the bomb onto the van? No. Did you watch them do it? Yeah. You watched them do it? You didn't help because of your leg? Yeah. Was there a plan for what would happen after the explosion? Was there a getaway plan? Was there a, a rehearsal of what you would say if the police came? No, there was no specific plan. Ramzi Youssef did the operation and ran off. He left the others to their fate. He did not care. He just left. So you were on your own? You were all on your own? A couple of days later, the FBI came calling. He says they broke into his apartment, tied him up, and conducted a thorough search. What they found, according to court filings, were traces of the bomb explosives on a scale, a toolbox, and a shirt. From the trash outside, they found the jeans he was wearing when he spilled acid on his leg, and torn pieces of a map showing the route to Youssef's other apartment. Before any of this could be analyzed, the FBI agents took Yassin to headquarters Yassin was so helpful, the FBI released him. The FBI let you go? Yeah. They let you go. Who, who was on? He drove me back home in the FBI car. Did they ever ask you if you were involved in any way? No. They never once asked any question about whether you took part in this in any way? No. No. 
All the talking was on Ramzi Youssef and Mohammed Salama. Yassin reinforced the impression he was cooperating by voluntarily returning the next day and showing the FBI this apartment in Jersey City where the bomb was made. But the FBI agent didn't have a search warrant. He told me he could not go in because he didn't have a warrant. Your work with us is finished. And so he drove me back. He drove you back home? He drove me back. So they released him again. This time he went straight to a travel agent, bought a one-way ticket to the Middle East, and flew off that very night, never to be seen in the U.S. till now. Iraqi officials say they allowed our interview because they have nothing to hide. Did anybody from Iraq send you to the United States? No, no, no. From the government? No, no. no. Were you in touch with anybody from the government? No. No. When I went to the United States, I had no idea about the explosion. I went there to live an ordinary life like any other American citizen. That's it. Why did you let him go? You have a guy in your hands with an acid burn on his leg who lives in the same apartment building as some of the others you know are involved. He knows names. He knows locations. Explain why the FBI let him go. It was a, a collective decision made uh, by, the, uh, by the FBI, by the United States Attorney's Office, whether or not that person, there was enough information uh, to, to hold him. And well, at he that had time, the acid burn. Wasn't that enough? Why wasn't that enough? Well, it was one factor. It was one piece of evidence. It well, wasn't he knew the, all the others. He, not all the others. He, he knew several of the others. He knew of them. There was not enough information to hold him and detain him. And uh, the, the decision was made, uh, and he was uh, allowed to leave. I would imagine that so far with these 2002 revelations from Yasin and FBI's Neil Hermit brings some clarity as to how and why the 1993 World Trade Center bombing investigations unraveled so quickly in discovery of Ramzi Youssef's residence and determining he was the mastermind. However, if you happen to notice on the CBS 60 Minute piece, it clearly identifies that the apartment building Yasin was living at, also referred to as a previous residence for Mohammed Salome living above, along with Ramsey Youssef after arriving in the U.S., is none other than the 34 Kingston Avenue apartment in New Jersey, where Salome also used on the stolen vehicle report for the Ryder van in connection to the rental agreement, meaning that this was ultimately the residence of Mossad operative Josie Hadass. If the FBI's fumbling with handling Yassin wasn't enough to divert the public from looking into the apartment building as a hot address, then having a Mossad operative as a neighbor certainly would. Yasin was living with his family downstairs in apartment number four, while Josie Hadass apparently lived upstairs in apartment number eight. Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz. He says that Iraq has been trying to turn Yasin over to the United States. But he claims the government in Washington doesn't want the $25 million fugitive. Twice we asked them to come and take him. They refused, Is which the means that they are not sincere in what they are saying. They are not honest in what they are saying, you see. The initial offer to turn Yassin over, he says, occurred during the Clinton administration in 1994, a year after that first attack on the World Trade Center. We informed the American government that we have important information about that event. If you are interested, send a team to Baghdad to get that information. They actually sent an emissary to the State Department to make the offer. They did not reply. They did not reply at all, and they did not... Uh, but your information was very vague, wasn't it? Yeah, but we showed our uh, goodwill. But would you really expect them to respond to that? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that we feared that uh, sending Yassin back to Iraq after arresting him and interrogating him, interrogating him was a sting operation. You, you thought that the Americans were trying to sting you by yes. sending him back? Yes. But for what purpose? To tell people later on that, look, this man who participated in that event now is in Iraq, etc., and use it as they are doing now, using many false pretexts, you see, to uh, hurt Iraq in their own way. To, win to suggest that Iraq was involved in the bombing? Yes, yes. So you, th you were very suspicious that he was some kind of plant or 
Uh, we have the right to we have the right to be suspicious of the American intentions. He says their suspicions were borne out after September 11th when Yassin was put on the most wanted list. Yassin's ethnicity, being of Iraqi descent, has been exploited by neocon propagandists like Judith Miller cohort Lori Milroy to claim in her 2000 book, Study of Revenge, that there was an Iraqi Saddam connection in 1993 and also to Osama bin Laden, just before 9-11 incidentally, based off the proximity of Ramzi Youssef's alleged birthplace and the fact that he first entered the U.S. with a fake Iraqi passport. Milroy has been so at this that her first book, also co-written by Judith Miller, Saddam Hussein and the Crisis in the Gulf, was the first prominent publication that instigated Desert Storm, which was released in October of 1990. But continuing just a little bit more with the 60 Minutes piece, Aziz says Iraq made the offer as a way of proving that it wasn't involved in the 93 bombing and by extension 9-11. They're trying to prevent a U.S. attack and preserve the gains the country has made over the last five years. All the while in Washington, the debate over getting rid of Saddam Hussein is heating up. We asked the Bush administration to comment on the Iraqi offer to turn Yassin over. The White House told us to call the State Department, which told us to call the White House. Neither building would comment. So we turned to Kenneth Pollack, who handled Iraq issues at both the CIA and the National Security Council during the Clinton administration. He's now with the Council on Foreign Relations. Do you think that Iraq was involved in the 93 bombing? Uh, I've seen the CIA and FBI reports, and there is nothing in them to suggest that the Iraqis were themselves involved in the 93 World Trade Center attack. One of the things that the, the Saddam Hussein government has been trying to do for a long time is open a back channel to the United States, to open some kind of a dialogue. Um, would there be anything wrong with doing that if, if, it, if it started over Yassin? I think that opening any kind of a secret back channel with the Iraqi government would be a terrible mistake. They would let the whole world know that the United States had been meeting with the Iraqis in secret. And that would feed all of these fears throughout the Middle East that the United States was always looking to cut a deal with Saddam Hussein. That we really wanted to leave him in power and wanted to get out of the Gulf. And that would leave all of our allies in the region high and dry. We know, for example, in connection with the original World Trade Center bombing in 93, that one of the bombers was uh, uh, Iraqi, returned to Iraq after the attack of 93. And we've learned subsequent to that, since we got into Baghdad and got into the intelligence files, that uh, this individual probably also received financing from the Iraqi government as well as safe haven. Now, is there a connection between the Iraqi government and the original World Trade Center bombing in 93? Uh, we know, as I say, that one of the perpetrators of that act did, in fact, receive uh, support from the Iraqi government uh, after the fact. Whether Osama bin Laden was actually killed in 2011 or had already died long before, the fact of the matter is that the FBI was never able to prove he had anything to do with the attacks of September 11th and was only wanted for the East Africa embassies and USS coal bombings. So just from the start, we already have problems putting Osama bin Laden's face behind 9-11 and or KSM as a mastermind due to the coerced confessions which led Mohammed to plead to his participation in well over 50 international crimes. In either case, it would seem that whomever had been arranging these attacks structurally as an Arab or fundamentalist organization seemed to have mutual interest with Israel by carrying out terrorist attacks that are all too convenient to set up a pretext to strike Iraq and remove Saddam Hussein from power. And with a balance of what we actually do know as well as the unanswered questions regarding 9-11, most of the truth movement comprehend its easy-to-see areas of Israeli intelligence which lie behind false pretexts that misled to the disastrous war on terror in Iraq, where it's also easy to implicate the Mossad in some great part behind the attacks, or at least at the bare minimum, oiling the wheels of the Al-Qaeda Trojan horse. But when going back to 1993 and looking at the apartment building with a trail and a convenient portion of conspirators already set, with Yassin and Iraqi, Mossad spy Josie Hadass as a neighbor above, having already temporarily roomed with Mohammed Salome, who's used it as an address, along with Ramzi Youssef also briefly staying there, this is all just predictable revelation and you can see why just with Yassin alone, who was hidden from the official narrative for a great period of time, that federal investigators would have been persistent in diminishing any of the press's questions over the address and not just on the inquiry over Josie Hadass and her role.
And with this revelation also comes with a broader understanding, not just because of the unanswered questions regarding Yusuf and his family background, but that he told others that he was Iraqi and first entered the country on a fake Iraqi passport. All of it rather quite telling. But when you come to also realize that if Mossad asset Ahmed Ajaj had also been successful entering the country at JFK airport, he would have likely been staying at this same apartment. With these revelations hardly known to the general public, you have to ask yourself, are we really to believe the FBI just hired Imad Salem to infiltrate the cell originally in 1991? just over the shooting of a racist nationalist rabbi and some unknown Egyptian imam who only appears in July of 1990? Or were the feds already keeping an eye on the cell? Obviously the feds were already surveying them before all of this, going as far back as 1989 with photos taken of El Sayed Nosser and company at Galveston shooting range. But for what in 1989 exactly, as no Islamic or Arab terrorist attacks had occurred on U.S. soil? Remember the ABC Nightline investigate World Trade Center Ground Zero with Ted Koppel from April 1st, 1993? But by looking into their own existing files, the FBI has already discovered that it has dealt with some of these suspects before, more than two years ago. As you have looked now and gone through <clears throat> the records of some of the men that, that have been arrested over the past few weeks, you have discovered that you'd met some of these guys before, right? Some of the individuals uh, have come to our attention in the past. Yes, they have. Not all, but several of the suspects now being held in the World Trade Center bombing had been identified as potential terrorists more than two years ago. Indeed, they were brought in by the FBI for questioning. During the Gulf War, uh, we took very seriously the threat to the United States from from uh, terrorist elements. In fact, we tripled our commitment, uh, agent commitment, to terrorist matters during the Gulf War and uh, and thereafter. Uh, some of the individuals involved in this case came to our attention, as you can imagine. And it was in that context that you saw some of these men before. That's right. Among the charges that had been leveled but never substantiated against several of the men who are now charged in the World Trade Center bombing is that they had been overheard threatening to blow up a number of New York monuments. But back then, two years ago, the FBI was unable to muster enough hard information to warrant a full-scale investigation. As useful as that would sound for the neocons in 2001, this revelation in the initial process of the 93 bombing investigation and just before the landmark plot sting occurred certainly goes against the official narrative. Mainly being that if Nocer and associates were under FBI surveillance this early and with Nocer already imprisoned in 1991, after the Kahani assassination, during the peak of the first Gulf War in Iraq under George H.W. Bush Sr., this is particularly troublesome for the time period, even if under surveillance a year before, as we already know instantly from John Antisov's reactions. If we are supposed to process this early tip from Ted Koppel, which suggests that if these suspects were already able and planning to commit acts of terror, then that it would be in retaliation for Saddam Hussein and Iraq over the U.S.'s short-lived bombing campaign with Desert Storm. Why would all of this be contrary? Well, if you also stick to the official story or the biographical profile of Osama bin Laden, following the Soviet Union's withdrawal of Afghanistan in February 1989, bin Laden's return to Saudi Arabia hailed him as a hero of Islamic Jihad. But once he returned, he engaged in opposition movements against the Saudi monarchy while simultaneously working for his family business, the Saudi bin Laden group. And then the following year, during the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait under Saddam Hussein in August of 1990, put the Saudi kingdom and its royal family at risk with Iraqi forces on the Saudi border, where bin Laden, in return, met with Saudi defense minister Prince Turkey bin Faisal, offering his Mujahideen to deal with fighting off the looming Iraqi forces instead of depending on assistance from the United States, who saw bin Laden as an affront to Islam by using Saudi Arabia, the holiest site in all of Islam, with Mecca and Medina being occupied by Kufar, non-believers who were allied with Israel. The kingdom flatly refused bin Laden's offer, 
and the Saudi monarchy went ahead with allowing deployment of U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. Shortly after, bin Laden publicly denounced Saudi dependence on the U.S. military, which led to the Saudi Kingdom using the intelligence services, the General Intelligence Directorate, to suspend bin Laden's passport and hold him under house arrest. This led to a secret meeting between bin Laden and the head of the Saudi intelligence, Prince Turkey bin Faisal, to meet, where he would offer bin Laden an alternative leave the Saudi Kingdom, and in return, his finances would be returned and his passport active. Bin Laden agreed, and in 1992, he relocated to the Sudan, where he was met in full accordance with Hassan al-Turabi, a popular Muslim cleric with the National Islamic Front. But according to staff writer for The New Yorker and author of the 2000s book, The Looming Tower, Lawrence Wright, that from notes taken at a meeting on August 20th, 1988, Al-Qaeda was a formal group with Abdullah Azam, which by that time, Bin Laden had already split from the Maktab al khidma or the Afghan Services Bureau, wanting a more military role. This in turn becoming a basic revelation of an organized Islamic faction, and its goal is to lift the word of God, Allah, and his religion victorious. However, three months earlier on May 29, 1988, Osama Bin Laden's oldest brother, Salim Bin Laden, had died in San Antonio, Texas, from a Sprint ultralight aircraft accident, crashing in high-voltage electric power lines. Salim bin Laden's death was a devastating blow to Osama, and essentially a point of newfound hatred for the United States, as he looked to Salim as being a dominant family figure, an influential one at best, who was the founder of the Saudi bin Laden group, managing the family's extensive investment and income distribution. While yet, their father, Mohammed bin Laden, Ironically, was also killed in a plane crash in 1967 at the hands of an American pilot. So according all of what transpired in 1988, and then the following year, with the Soviet Union's withdrawal from Afghanistan in February, and then also by November 24th, 1989, with Abdullah Azam being assassinated by a calm bomb in Peshawar, Pakistan, even though back in the United States, the feds, for some given reason, are already watching El Sayed Nosser and company, Al-Qaeda, as an organization, is not a developed terrorist network then, and contrary to what National Geographic and other official narratives defenders suggest that Azam's death may have been a plot from the CIA, Israeli Mossad, or even from bin Laden and Egyptian cleric Ayman al-Zwahiri themselves, Azam's murder still remains unsolved. By 1990, with Nosser assassinating Meir Kahani on November 5th, Operation Desert Shield, which was the buildup of U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia, was still in effect until January 1991, when the real conflict began under Operation Desert Storm, and not long after, Azam loyalist Mustafa Shalabi is also found murdered in his New Jersey apartment on February 25th. And yes, Evidence suggests Nusayr's cousin, Ibrahim El Gabroni, did travel to Afghanistan and elsewhere raising money for the defense fund for his cousin, where Osama bin Laden was also a contributor, and is also said that he suggested hiring William Kunstler. And afterward, when it came to Ramzi Youssef, bin Laden acknowledged who he was, but he never claimed to personally know him, but was aware of his bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. Even though there are certain overlaps with those that are deemed as Al-Qaeda operatives, it makes no sense why bin Laden would have networked or admired the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed faction family from Baluchistan with Yusuf, with their virtual for Shiite and Persians, where bin Laden himself had no qualms against Shiite Muslims, nor especially the nation of Iran, which he had even visited, as well as one of his sons who lived there for a long period of time. But aside from the historical record which puts bin Laden as not having been responsible for any terrorist attack until 1992 with the bombing of the Gold Mehor Hotel in Aden, killing only two people, for this time frame back in 1990, specifically regarding Nusayr's assassinating Kahani, not only a question of how, but why. Why would bin Laden be interested in or networking with Nusayr, who's already suspected a possible militant activity during the Gulf War? which would garner more U.S. military activity, and contrary to what bin Laden wishes, added that he's no fan or friend with Saddam or Iraq when he's offering his Mujahideen to fight them. It also becomes a question of how. How could bin Laden be involved or networked with Nusayr in 1989, while bin Laden was still in the process of transitioning, with both Abdul Azam being alive and the blind sheikh having not entered inside the U.S. yet? The reason why this really matters, or that it all comes down to Nusayr, is that due to the subsequent search of his apartment after the Kahani assassination, 
in which they found enough evidence asserting that he was targeting the Twin Towers and other New York skyscrapers, but that he had a list of 12 other assassination targets of prominent Jews and New York officials. Peter Lance, who has written three extensive books on 9-11, one particularly addressing the case of Ali Muhammad, the triple agent for the CIA, FBI, and Egyptian Islamic Jihad, who first came into the U.S. as a translator for Ayman al-Swahiri's first U.S. tour of Islamic mosques. Even though Lance has been a great researcher who was uncovered links that the authorities resisted connecting, he suggests that Ali Muhammad was ultimately Snowsayer's handler. But even if he had served in Afghanistan, when you start to question this time frame and follow the trails of these suspects, as well as those do appear in 1993 after Iman Salem disappeared, it's more than likely that Nocera may have been taking orders elsewhere, particularly in regards to whatever position Osama bin Laden was or connected to at the time. Plus, admittedly, with the case of Ali Muhammad and his egotistical attitude, he made it quite clear that he didn't need Osama bin Laden or a fatwa to be active. But as the story goes with Ali prior to being recruited from CIA offices in Cairo, he then later moved to North Carolina and enlisted in the United States Special Forces at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Not only did he train anti-Soviet Afghan Mujahideen in the early 90s, but he also trained Al-Qaeda volunteers and allegedly Osama bin Laden and al-Swahiri themselves. While in the U.S., he trained El Said Nusser and Mahmoud Abalima, which is why after the Mayor Kahani assassination, with also all the army training manuals found at Nusser's place, Ali already became a person of interest to U.S. authorities even before 1993. Ali Muhammad was later charged for the 1998 East African Embassy bombings before attempting to leave the U.S. in 1998, as was Wadi al-Hajj, who was also linked to telephone records to Ali while living in Northern California, in addition to Ali's Muhammad native Arabic incidentally. He's adventurous and well-educated, fluent in English, French, Arabic, and Hebrew. As far as Ali Mohammed's incarceration, it's been kept secret from the public due to reports in October 2001, as a consequence of 9-11, that he may have been cooperating with the U.S. government. And according to former FBI agent Ali Sufan in 2012, he confirmed that Ali is still awaiting sentencing. Most of the 1993 bombing conspirators are being held at Supermax ADX prison in Florence, Colorado, which we'll address soon. Other conspirators are being held elsewhere. But interestingly, Ali Mohammed's fate was far different than another suspect he was connected to while living in North Carolina. Through Wadi al Hajj's number in Nairobi, Kenya, was Mohammed Jamal Khalifa, a brother-in-law of Osama bin Laden. In December of 1994, Khalifa was arrested and detained for several months without bail in Mountain View, California, on charges related to the 1993 bombing, where all of a sudden, with no explanation, he was deported to Jordan to face a conviction for a sting of theater bombings, which in happenstance, his conviction was already overturned due to a witness recanting their testimony. Khalifa then left for the Philippines and returned to Saudi Arabia, where authorities claim he was found to have been funding the Bojinka plot by five phone numbers of him found at the Joseph apartment in Manila, where Yusuf's bomb factory and laptop was found after the apartment fire. Khalifa confirmed that he knew Pakistani Wali Khan Amen Shah and was a high school student of his when he was a teacher in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Shah was arrested by Manila police at another apartment on Singlong Street, which Yusuf had set up in case the Bojinka plan failed. But with Khalifa in the middle, this does show potential overlap or a degree of association between Yusuf KSM family and bin Laden. The day before Khalifa's 50th birthday in 2007, he was killed in southern Madagascar while visiting his gemstone mine. Reports state that around 25 to 30 armed men raided Khalifa's residence in the middle of the night, attacked him with various weapons, and removed his computer and other intelligence materials. His family believed that he was assassinated by Joint Special Operations Command. But still, if they were able to prove, even if circumstantially, that Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law was involved in a Bojinka plan, where Yusuf and his uncle certainly were at, even if dead, then why haven't the FBI been able to prove that he was behind 9-11 and have only charged him still for the USS Cole East Africa embassy bombings and small terrorist attacks throughout Africa and the Middle East, and not 9-11? And not to mention, neither the 1993 World Trade Center bombing either. And with so many unanswered questions and cover-ups regarding the destruction of the World Trade Center, if you think the Bojinka plan doesn't ultimately matter in regards to 9-11, just because there's an official narrative of only four hijacked flights. It would be worth reconsidering that, as with what Ramzi Youssef said in his only interview to Al-Hayat newspaper after his sentencing, 
about a new Islamic militant group that would rise and challenge the U.S., Ramzi Yusuf certainly could not have been declaring ventures be carried out under the limited number or official scope of only 19 hijackers and four airliners, especially if we know there's been planned coordinated bombing strikes on the U.S. several years before 1993 during the Gulf War. Was Yusuf warning of someone else finishing out the total third phase of the Bojika plot as 9-11, finishing something he didn't even start? Regardless of the targets, or if there was someone else behind Osama bin Laden, or even Yusuf and KSM, who was also said to have traveled to Israel right before the discovery of the Bojinka plot, how serious of a roster of hijacking teams or militants were here on U.S. soil in the fall of 2001, as even what Colonel Mendoza forewarned about actually might have been possible in the original 9-11 attacks. If you want an answer to this, watch my film, Bojinka Plot Confirmed, The Thwarted Hijackings of 9-11 and 9-13. But continuing with the unresolved matters in the 1993 bombing that are still a consequence to 9-11, some of the other profiles of the 1993 cell and link conspirators do need to be underlined or considered more in exploring to try to help find answers. And the peculiar circumstances with the way some of these suspects were portrayed in the media as well as their legal defenses and characters need to be examined. Like Mohammed Salome, after the attacks, investigators had also believed in the probability due to his ancestral region he may have been related to Ali Hassan Salome the so-called Red Prince of the Black September, intricately behind the 1972 Munich massacre. Salome is currently an inmate at ADX Supermax. Plus the other Palestinian, Nidal Ayad. Why did he take credit for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing as the Liberation Army 5th Battalion? Nadel Ayad, an alleged Rutgers University graduate, is apparently serving his life sentence in federal penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. And then there's Mahmoud Abolina, the Red, again, one of the few who was able to flee. It's highly suggested that he was the getaway vehicle for Nocer during the Kahana assassination. In 1981, he first moved to West Germany from Egypt, later recounting that he lived a life of corruption, girls, drugs, you name it. After being denied political asylum, he quickly married a nurse in Munich so he could remain in the country, then divorced her three years later while eventually marrying another woman in a Muslim ceremony and then eventually moving together to Brooklyn in 1986. And there's a lot of mystery behind Iyad Ishmoel, being that he seems very westernized and was originally living in Texas right before he appeared in New York to take part in the conspiracy of the 1993 bombing and had successfully fled being the last conspirator captured in August of 1995. And aside for El Said Nosser and his cousin Ibrahim al Gabroni. There is certainly a good amount that needs to be addressed in extension when it comes to the landmark plot bombers or those close to the blind sheik's inner circle that we don't really have enough time to expand on, like the Sudanese Sadiq Ali, or also with the American-born and former member of the Moorish Science Temple, Clement Rodney Hampton L., who already died in 2014, or to cover their circumstances or legal defenses, like the follow-up stories with Ahmed Abdel Sattar and attorney Lynn Stewart defending the blind sheik after William Kunstler passed. There's more to the story here. Just as it was for three of the 93 bombing conspirators, Salome, Abu Halina, Ayad, to have published statements or have been allowed to write up 90 letters from inside Supermax prison after 9-11, encouraging other fellow extremists around the world to terminate the infidels because Muslims don't have any option other than jihad, asking others to bring them happiness so that they could die as martyrs in prison. It was said they were exhorting and helping recruit would-be terrorists from inside an American prison. One of Salome's letters, in which he calls Osama bin Laden the hero of my generation, is published in a newspaper in July of 2002. But this does not result in any security attempts to stop other letters coming out of ADX until 2005. But what did Salome even mean by his generation? But in comparison, looking at all these 1993 subjects now incarcerated in contrast to the 9-11 conspiracy are more interesting, simply being that on the official scale, most of the criminal conspirators are alive, whereas for 9-11, the accounted ones are dead. And when comparing who's incarcerated in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, that's said to be linked to 9-11, already clouded in controversy and saturated with mixed emotions, only helps to overshadow 1993, when for deeper truth seekers, there is less of an uphill battle getting access to answers as the bombing conspirators and other so-called Al-Qaeda members are all mainly housed at the ADX Supermax prison in Colorado, where not only Ramsey Youssef and the East Africa Embassy bombing conspirators are being held, so is the alleged 20th 9-11 hijacker, Zacharias Massawi. We've learned that Reed, seen here in his cell, is in a special wing for terrorists called H-Unit. Others include Zacharias Massawi, who wanted to be one of the 9-11 hijackers, and Wadi el Haj, Osama bin Laden's former private secretary. We're told that there have been frequent hunger strikes among the Islamic terrorist inmates inside Supermax, and to keep the inmates alive, there are often force feedings. That's when an inmate is restrained and liquid nourishment is poured down a tube in his nose. 
We're told that there have been a dozen hunger strikers, and one of them used to be Osama bin Laden's secretary. Not only was El Hage bin Laden's secretary and an East Africa embassy bombing conspirator, he's another Lebanese Al-Qaeda militant like the supposed Flight 93 hijacker Ziad Jarar of the Hamburg cell, who also originally came from a Lebanese Christian family. Other than his activities prior in the Mid-Southwest pertaining to Afghan Services Bureau, what makes El Hage more significant out of any of the 1993 or 9-11 conspirators is that he outnumbers them many years ahead becoming a U.S. resident going as far back as 1978. But interestingly, El Hage met with two other Al-Qaeda operatives from Germany in the island of Cyprus to conduct a transaction in purchasing this ship for Osama bin Laden in 1994. One of the operatives was Sadiq Walid Awad, who also had calls traced to Kenya from where he lived in Hamburg in 1997. Less is known about Awad, but El Hage identified him as an Iraqi Al-Qaeda operative with German and Israeli passports. How does an Al-Qaeda operative get an Israeli passport? But unlike Awad, where no public photo exists of him, mainly the other individual involved in the transaction who met with El Hage is the Syrian Mamoun Darkna Nazali, who is a founding member of the Hamburg cell and was arrested in Germany 2004 on a Spanish warrant but freed in 2005 by a ruling from the German Federal Constitutional Court. Darkan Azali is under sanction as an affiliate or supporter of Al-Qaeda by the UN, the European Union, and the US Treasury as a specially designated global terrorist. His company, Darkan Azali Export-Import Sonderposten, in Hamburg, as until recent, is still listed there. He walks as a free man in Germany and has been under constant surveillance by the authorities there. Although for different ethnicities with the three 9-11 hijackers and Yemeni Ramzi bin al-Sheib, ultimately the rest of 9-11 is mainly looked upon as a crime committed by Saudis because of bin Laden's and the bulk of hijacker nationalities. But for the rest of the Hamburg cell members, they were all mainly of Moroccan descent, and they are subjects that should not be overlooked, but they don't necessarily have any previous activity that is really revealing as far as going back into the early 90s, like the Syrian Darkan Azali. But there's another Syrian who is also considered a Hamburg cell founder and has been labeled as Mohammed Atta's recruiter, Mohammed Haydar Zamar. Zamar was arrested in October of 2001 in Morocco, and instead of being deported to the U.S. or Germany, he was secretly sent to Syria for indefinite detention. It was confirmed in 2005 that federal officers of the German Bundeskriminalamt, the BKA, had at least on one occasion interrogated Zamar in Syria under secrecy and unknown conditions. Zamar was then released as part of a prisoner exchange between the Islamist Syrian rebel group Arar al-Sham and the Syrian government in September of 2013. He was seen a year later in a home video behind an ISIS flag listening to a speech by the number two in the Islamic State in Aleppo, Syria. He was recaptured by members of the Kurdish People's Protection Units in March 2018 near Dail al-Zar, eastern Syria. He is currently being held in a prison in Kamishali, northern Syria, from where he's given interviews to the Washington Post and Der Spiegel in 2018. The status of these Syrian entries from Germany going as far back as the early 90s, deemed by some to be considered Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, should give an idea as to why they have gotten some sort of clearance by Allied Western intelligence, when we know throughout the Obama administration they are able to continue funding and aiding Al-Qaeda, spawning ISIS further, still after 9-11, but in attempts to topple Syria and take down Bashar al-Assad. But this early 90s time frame with Darkan Azali, El Hage, and Awad in Cyprus and Germany is interesting being that it's the same time frame Mohammed Atta has already moved there. Plus, according to a New York Times article March 12, 1993, it says two of the suspects involved in the World Trade Center bombing, Mohammed Salome and Nadel Ayad, had a joint account with a German bank where they were receiving periodic wired money transfers ranging in the thousands. And being that Mahmoud Abu Halima was already being a fundamentalist when he lived in West Germany, contrary to the official narrative of being radicalized by the blind sheik years later, does seem conceivable that there could have been a stronger command structure having come out of Germany and with the goal of striking the Twin Towers than what the defined premise for it is as Al-Qaeda and Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia. But continuing back in the U.S. and with other guilty associates at Supermax Prison... Another terrorist in Supermax is Ramzi Youssef, the leader of the first World Trade Center attack in 1993. What did you make of him? The most interesting inmate in my career. I was surprised that he was extremely respectful, prayed every, you know, almost on the hour...
Yusuf has been living in ADX for 11 years, sacrificing to live by his own code. Something as simple as uh, recreating. He would have to strip search, be strip searched to go recreate. He chose not to do that because of his belief that it would be inappropriate for us to show uh, his body or see his body. And so he stays in the cell? Never been out, to my knowledge. As strict as that seems, we're told that there is an even higher level of confinement, sort of an ultramax inside supermax. It's a group of cells where there is virtually no human contact, not even with the guards. And there are only two prisoners who are considered so dangerous that they're locked in this place that's known as Range 13. One of them is World Trade Center bomber Ramsey Yusuf. Warden Hood says Yusuf is on Range 13 for just one reason. He has a Charlie Manson look. Charlie Manson look? He just has the eyes. He has, the, he has, a, a, he has some charisma about him. He's in uniform, but you know that there's a powerful person that you're looking at. You didn't want him in a place where he could give anybody any orders. True. We're told something strange is happening with Yusuf. He now insists that he has renounced Islam and converted to Christianity. He's even begun leaving his cell for exercise. Warden Hood left before all this happened, but still, he doesn't buy it. He's playing a game with someone. If he's doing that, he's doing it for the reaction. He's doing it for whatever. He is the real deal. There have been some new developments at Supermax. There have been more hunger strikes and force feedings, and both Tommy Silverstein and Ramsey Youssef have been moved to new cells, which leaves Range 13 empty, at least for now. And there have been quite a few other developments since that 60 Minutes piece in 2007. Youssef has also put out a hit on Zacharias Masawi. According to letters, Masawi wrote requesting transfer to Gitmo because he had been assaulted and harassed by other inmates and guards, including Ramsey Youssef, who has threatened to kill him. But obviously everybody who's gotten close enough to Yusuf that we've demonstrated so far seems to certify that he does not fit the fanatical Muslim persona, even if he adapted to it sooner after incarceration. He's consistently deceiving people and he resonates as being a sociopath. And we can't simply ignore what a whistleblower like former National Security Advisor to the Bush Administration, Richard Clark, as what he said in regards to the unlikely coincidence of Terry Nichols being in the Philippines the same time Ramsey Yusuf was. We know that Terry Nichols and Ramsey Youssef, both people were in the same city uh, at the same time. Uh, that's odd. Uh, both people were interested in making bombs. Um, both people opposed the American government. Uh, is it conceivable that uh, in a mid-sized Philippine city, uh, that two people who were interested in making bombs and hated the American government could have found each other somehow? I think it's conceivable. What we've seen so far tells us the major significance ADX Supermax has over Gitmo. But how unsettling does this coincidence sound when Terry Nichols is incarcerated along with Yusef at ADX? Unsettling enough that even former California Congressman Dana Rohrbacher actually went to meet Nichols and held a press conference about his obstructions to interview Ramsey Yusef. I have been denied for a year and a half now the right to speak to a federal prisoner, namely Ramsey Yusef. He's one of the top terrorists of the world, and he's been in prison for 10 years. Uh, he was responsible for the first World Trade Center bombing and uh, is deeply, deeply involved with the creation of Al-Qaeda. Uh, what's more important to me at this moment is that Ramsey Yusuf may have had a connection to the Oklahoma City bombing, and if that's true, the American people need to know about that. And uh, there are other questions that need to be po uh, posed to uh, Ramsey Yusuf. He's a federal prisoner, and the United States Congress, especially those of us in investigative subcommittees, have a right to question federal prisoners. This is not someone who was just arrested yesterday, where there's some ongoing investigation that deals with this person. He's been in jail for 10 years. What we have is a denial of the right of Congress in order to set a president that we do not have the right to interview federal prisoners. Uh, the official reason that I have been denied the right to speak to Ramsey Yusuf is that there is a quote ongoing investigation and of course I have been told by many people who work for the Justice Department in the White House that that is a standard phrase that is used 
to dismiss congressional inquiries without uh, any substance to the dismissal, meaning this is made up. This, the person who said that it is an ongoing investigation to me simply said that as a phrase to dismiss a member of Congress and to dismiss Congress's right uh, to participate uh, in a particular activity like interviewing this particular federal prisoner. But aside the eight and a half year interval between 9-11 and the 93 bombing, with Oklahoma City bombing being right in the middle, it's a shame that with these three unresolved and sensitive events, which have become major social impacts on everyday life, seem overwhelmingly connected and in unusual contrary circumstances, are not seriously being dealt with by a realistic activist movement or archetypal organization pursuing real truth and accountability for who or what is ultimately at fault, even if becoming disillusioned by discovering vulnerabilities and weaknesses within the establishment that have played a role in judicial obstructions or cover-ups. But there is much more documentation regarded as circumstantial evidence about Terry Nichols, already married to a Philippine male order wife, that he, by himself, frequented the Philippines at the same time Ramsey Youssef and company were present, and that it could link to the Oklahoma City bombing as Al-Qaeda onto 9-11 and consequently after the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. And there are still unanswered questions regarding Ramsey Youssef and his extended families past and present that we don't have enough time to cover their whereabouts, even though we've covered quite a bit of controversial links from him and his family of greater infamy. But separate from the many unanswered questions around Timothy McVeigh and the OKC bombing, a scenario of Ramsey Youssef and Terry Nichols crossing paths and networking is highly unlikely to most Americans. But when considering the two years of terrorist activities Youssef carried out as a fugitive after the 93 bombing throughout the Philippines, Thailand, Iran, and Pakistan, as with being contracted to assassinate Ben Zerbuto in 1994, only two assassinations have been attributed to the so-called Al-Qaeda organization. Ahmed Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, two days before 9-11, and then tragically with Ben Zerbuto in 2007. Not even no Sarah killing Kahana is counted. So if you still think Yusuf's terrorist aspirations are exclusive to the Islamic mindset, when considering this cross path with Terry Nichols, viewers can also read up on what Peter Lance also uncovered in 2013 with a sting set up on Yusuf after his arrest while incarcerated in New York by the feds along with inmate and son of infamous mafia hitman for the Colombo crime family, Gregory Scarpa Jr., that was carried out by him as an informant jailed with Yusuf in 1996. From that revelation with the discussion carried out between the two, you might want to envision Yusuf having been a contract terrorist instead. And besides for 1995 being framed as a white militia conspiracy, Oklahoma in the Midwest with Texas is a central hub noted for Middle Eastern terrorists ahead of 9-11, as a couple of hijackers stayed in Oklahoma City before momentarily, Mohammed Atta, Marwan El Shehi, and Nawaf Al Hazmi plus Zacharias Masawi had actually lived there, attending flight school in Norman, Oklahoma. But the presence there in Oklahoma is still prevalent in the past by the same apparatus before in the late 80s, with Wadi El Hage, who was living in Texas at the time, met with Mahmoud Abu Halima at an Islamic conference in Oklahoma, where it is said that Abu Halima told El Hage to buy a 38 caliber revolver for him, and that it was the same one that Nocer used to kill Meyer Kahana. And Oklahoma seems to be more like the crossroads or central point, because also take notice of who resides in Texas. Like Yusef's close friend, Abdul Hakim Murad, not only did he receive pilot training more than any 9-11 hijacker, he had also trained in San Antonio and is completely in the middle of the Bojinka plot, where then, after the Oklahoma City bombing, he admitted verbally April 19, 1995, and in writing, that Ramsey Yusef's Liberation Army was responsible for the Oklahoma City bombing. Liberation Army is the same title Nadal Ayad had left as a phone recorded message taking blame for the 93 bombing. And then there's Husseini Al Hussein, the supposed Iraqi that's the focus in Jaina Davis's book, The Third Terrorist. Regardless of her marginalizing other competing theories about the Oklahoma City bombing, her pursuit on Al Hussein and all those linked was just. And even if her findings and conclusions are embraced by neocon opportunists and their attempts for Iraq war pretext, the consequences of legal actions taken against Davis in writing her book by the power of Al Hussein's legal defense team should be questioned, especially when it was later revealed that Al Hussein was working at Logan Airport, where hijacked flights 11 and 175, both planes they hit the World Trade Center departed from, during the period of the September 11th attacks and was even questioned by authorities after. But even after the Oklahoma City bombing and before moving to the Boston area, Husseini Al Hussein also moved to Irving, Texas, where he had been arrested for a DUI there. Aside from the glaring coincidence of rider moving vehicles, isn't it interesting how Imad Salem detailed how the bomb making for the landmark plot 
and the bomb used in Oklahoma City 1995 were similar, being ammonium nitrate fertilizer bombs as used in the World Trade Center? But isn't it also interesting when between that time frame, in 1994, while no kind of terrorist attack occurred in the U.S., the same type of ammonium nitrate bomb was used at the AMIA, that's the Argentine Israelite Mutual Association building in Buenos Aires. The incident was carried out by a suicide bomber in a van, in which killed 85 people and injured over 300. Yet how come Iran and Hezbollah was first blamed for the AMIA bombing? And a better question, why is Hezbollah constantly and falsely accused for other terrorist attacks elsewhere? Why is it said that Hezbollah was founded with the 1983 Marine Barracks bombing in Lebanon under the planning of Imad Mugnia, which Hezbollah has denied, and a group called Islamic Jihad claim responsibility? And what does it say when it was also revealed from Viktor Ostrovsky's By Way of Deception, The Making and Unmaking of a Mossad Officer, being met with pressure not to be released, in which it details the Mossad's foreknowledge of the Marine Barracks bombing, but did not alert U.S. officials, where 241 military service personnel ended up being killed. In fact, why do most Americans not recognize the Marine Barracks bombing as the largest terrorist attack on Americans before 9-11? Separate from the embassy attacks or incidents carried out on U.S. soil, is there a common social disconnect amongst the American consensus that rejects innocent military servicemen and women who are victims of terrorist attacks not to equate them the same as civilian casualties? Could that also be why such events like the attack on the USS Liberty aren't well received to the public, just as the Pentagon attack with Flight 77 on 9-11 isn't well received by conspiracy theorists and truth activists? Why did Ali Mohammed in 1984, after offering his services to the CIA in Cairo, was he also stationed in Hamburg and assigned to infiltrate mosques associated to Hezbollah? Why after 9-11 did the Bush administration offer a $5 million reward leading to the arrests of Hezbollah members in the 1985 hijacking of TWA-847, especially when one of them was already in U.S. custody since 1987, captured member Fawaz Yunus. But yet, seven years later after 9-11, one of the main hijackers and leaders, Hezbollah founder Imad Mugnia, who was able to hide for decades after, even gone under plastic surgery to change his identity, ends up getting assassinated in Syria by the Mossad in 2008 with the help of their infiltrating spy, Ali Jarar, 9-11 hijacker Ziad Jar's cousin, and looking back at these two Lebanese, Gerard and El Hage, both originally coming from Arab Christian backgrounds and having both stayed in Germany, the US and elsewhere, is part of the Mossad's playbook specifically using Lebanese assets so that it's easier to set them up as a pretext to frame Hezbollah? And with Palestinians, what about Mossad asset Ahmed Ajaj? How do we know for certain that he may have been a Palestinian Christian when he was involved in the 93 bombing? He's only shown to have been strictly practicing Islam in recent time as he has started suing the prison for failing to accommodate to his religious beliefs. All right, the terrorist convicted in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing is now suing the United States. He says his religious rights are being violated in prison because his meals aren't catered to his Islamic beliefs. And there's still more to find out. But as even PBS Frontline themselves highlighted, that without Ajaj and the items that he carried when arriving at JFK with Ramzi Youssef in 1992, there would be no premise to label such a loose network as Al-Qaeda, as demonstrated on their special about the late head of the FBI terrorism task force, John O'Neill. But why in the late 80s, after Ajaj's release from an Israeli prison and turned into a Mossad asset, was he assigned to Al-Fatah, a group known to receive weapons, explosives, and trainings from the Soviet Union, but then somehow unnoticeably, he was able to join Hamas in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen to fight against the Soviets. And like Eyad Ishmoyl living in Dallas, who suddenly appears after in the 93 bombing conspiracy, Ajaj had already previously lived in Texas working as a pizza deliverer in San Antonio before entering the U.S. again in 1992. Essentially, Ajaj could be considered the bombing mastermind of 1993, being that he was also in a prime position while detained to make orders since Yusuf wasn't able to entirely set up the bomb without Ajaj's manuals and experience, and from the bombing attempts that we have charted from Yusuf, most of them were unsuccessful. Ajaj has since been transferred to Supermax to Terre Haute Prison in Indiana in 2018, and he, like many of these conspirators, are serving life sentences and are unapproachable for questions and interviews, which again, tells you many answers could be found on U.S. shores rather than further obstructions through Gitmo, Cuba. But lastly and luckily, that's not the situation when it comes to Pakistani Wali Khan Amin Shah as far as getting some sort of answers, as he's also in Terre Haute and was right in the middle of the Bojinka planning. But since he's been cooperative with U.S. authorities, he's set to be free two years from now in March of 2022. Perhaps we may get answers as to who else was behind these 90s terrorist attacks and 9-11, 
and how they really functioned, but if these so-called top Al-Qaeda masterminds and their leaders aren't born and raised fundamentalist Muslims, just like the case with Osama bin Laden ironically, who in his early college years liked to live it up as a partying bachelor, shouldn't this all in the long run be called Arab terrorism? And isn't it also interesting, as reported by Terry McDermott on June 24, 2002, in the LA Times, while KSM was still wanted, that members of his cell, including a girlfriend, had a drinking party to celebrate the anniversary of the 1988 Pan Am Flight 103 explosion over Lockerbie, Scotland, an incident officially blamed on Gaddafi and Libyan pilots, and not anything remotely to do with Al-Qaeda? Throughout this film, we've covered a lengthy time span in the 1990s, and it's vital to helping understand what the problems really are, and what ones will continue to lay ahead. And separate from the focus of physical cover-ups that the truth movement seems only obsessed with, these crimes are still connected, even systemically, and it shows how the branch-out effect of operatives between 9-11 and 1993 is real. That's why it's important to understand or to have a basic grasp not just about the atrocities of terrorist incidents committed or the pretext being used or attempted, but the historical efforts of prevention by anti-terrorism task force, even if such focus seems to emphasize the bottom end of a great conspiracy. Most 9-11 truthers are oblivious to official narratives of these crimes, just as much as they are being indoctrinated in a cult conspiracy worldview, that they'll even deny or doubt its popularity subjectively. And in that subversive mind frame that the truth movement has been emotionally attached to, combined with being ignorant of the Middle East and real foreign policy, they are afraid of falling under a spell of pro-war propaganda, along with being disillusioned by their fantastical expectations that they have been long misled into believing are the ulterior conspirators behind 9-11, and not bothering to investigate the validity of Al-Qaeda or Islamic terrorism as a shift or trend throughout the Arab and Third World. A prime example ignored, ending the 90s era, is the Millennium Plot, as in what almost occurred during the 2000 New Year's Y2K celebrations, not just up into the Canadian border with Ahmed Rassam and those linked to him in New York City and elsewhere in the U.S., but also other Millennium incidents that did actually take place in South Asia and the Middle East then, and since then post 9-11, into now what's further escalated with three administrations later continuing the unending mess with the War on Terror. And what about the 1980s? Was there ever an earlier warning sign of attacking the World Trade Center back then? What was the U.S.'s approach on dealing with international terrorism? Was there ever a call for the war on terrorism then, such as the failed war on drugs? How about Europe back then? Where did Islamic terrorism exist? Was there another underground network like Al-Qaeda that predates it? Why did the 1986 West Berlin discotheque bombing happen? Was Libya really responsible? How was ISIS able to manifest in Libya a decade after 9-11 while there had been an ongoing coalition with the war on terrorism? Who was Abu al-Zakawi? And how did he just all of a sudden appear in Iraq, ultimately becoming another pretext for the 2003 US invasion? And why also did he behead Nick Berg? Why did Osama bin Laden really move to Sudan in 1992? Who is Gobadin Hekmatyar? And why did he become one of the first suspects for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing? And why isn't there any effort to capturing Ayman al-Zawari, who still roams free? Run for it, Marty! Who? Who? Who do you think? The Libyans! Isn't there something to be said? about how just within less than 15 years, the U.S. went from Omar Gaddafi as Arab villain, then on to Saddam Hussein as Arab villain, and then on to Osama bin Laden, but then back to Saddam, and then back to Gaddafi? Especially when Libya issued the first arrest warrant through Interpol against bin Laden on March 16, 1998, naming him as the main suspect in the murder of two German citizens in Libya in 1994. This all before the U.S. issued their bin Laden arrest warrant months later for conspiracy to attack defense utilities of the United States. And what about the 70s? Who the hell was Carlos the Jackal? What was the Black September? What ultimately was the consequence of Munich in 1972? Why does this kind of activity go back to Germany so much? These historical questions not only pertaining to the pre and post bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993 do have somewhat useful information, but they have not been thoroughly challenged within the mainstream alternative conspiracy theories or within established 9-11 truth movements when scrutinized over its popular inside job claims in sequential contrast to 9-11 itself, when the attacks were certainly carried out on the surface definitively by a loose association of Arabs and or individuals who identify as Muslims within a conventional Al-Qaeda nexus. 
and even given positions of deniability by feds doesn't make it a default reason to grant collusion accusation or suggest government conspiracies and or domestic complicity, but instead can also be more to do with neglect and compartment conflicts as well as covering up their own mistakes. But none of these obstructions given along with real anomalies still showing cover-ups detracts that these crimes were not carried out by an ulterior international conspiracy. In other words, what Alex Jones has proclaimed for decades, misguided by those discredited sources that even predate him, in that the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was an inside job, or in his definition of a false flag, is utter nonsense. Regardless of patriotic rhetoric and local sentiment, retroactively when looking back at younger Alex Jones, given his Christian compromise and disposition of being a college dropout, to him, in what seemed a sincere proclamation at the time to implicate a shadow government in what also occurred two years later after the 1993 bombing with the Oklahoma City bombing. In contrast to the overview on what we've uncovered with 1993, Alex Jones is not interested in correcting any of these false narratives he has promoted for nearly two decades, even when it comes to the most controversial implication involvements of all, the celebratory incident with the high-fiving dancing Israelis of 9-11 which is a widely accepted claim now by the truth movement, while Jones continues to marginalize and outright omit it. I've got so many questions, but you are vindicated. This has got to be the 50th time the last six months on the radical Muslims celebrating not just in New Jersey, but New York. Discrediting 9-11 truth further than what damage he already done as a founder ascribing to and promoting the hoax claim that a missile hit the Pentagon by way of non-credentialed skeptics. The kind of sloppy research that's gotten him in the mess he's in now with the Sandy Hook lawsuits against him. That's why in regarding his vicinity in 1995, Jones's conclusion and his first-hand research and publications on OKC should be equally re-examined and scrutinized just as they should for 9-11, since clearly he's gotten it wrong from the beginning with 1993. And it's prevalent now with the legal troubles he's gotten himself into, becoming more than just a loss of credibility and finance with these lawsuits against him over the Sandy Hook hoax he instigated, but what's also in jeopardy is his own mechanism to continue to perpetuate modern urban myths as a means to keep his operation afloat, with Sandy Hook being the catalyst of getting himself deplatformed on all the major social and multimedia sites. And now, with the public release of the deposition, regarding those Sandy Hook lawsuits has become very revealing of Jones' past and present. The More. truth is, Mr. Jones, you were the first person in the world to make the false flag theory about Sandy Hook, and you did it before the bodies were even cold. That's the truth. Or whether it's babies having their brains bashed out in incubators or WMDs, that I upfront questioned it because things from Operation Northwoods. Well, I mean, we always uh, you know, cover things from a perspective of, of caution. We were covering other people's reports and also questioning the historical fact that. Uh, you know, things like Operation Northwoods, government plan to stage mass shootings in the U.S. Uh, Kennedy said no to the plan, but the chairman of the Joint Chiefs had green-lighted it. And, and, and so because of things like that, we are forced to then question these events. And I, and I think that's, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's just part of the process in this country. Notice how Jones uses Operation Northwoods as his get-out-of-jail card, or more like confirmation bias card, wielding this conventional declassified 1962 plan, which was never close to manifesting, as his excuse as to why he instigated Sandy Hook hoax theories, when anyone who's classically followed 9-11 truth knows that Operation Northwoods is definitively Jones's original talking point to defend his past outlandish claims on who and how 9-11 was carried out. Such an accusation is both illogical and unusual given his age and position of being an independent media source, given the resources and opportunity to analyze basic history in recent news, when such a notion that 9-11 was an Operation Northwoods type event is laughable, when there's the crimes of Ramsey Yusuf past the 1993 bombing, regardless of what insidious planners in the government of yesteryear were in position, or how sensational of a plan it sounded. All the history that surrounds 9-11 in addition to having previously aided the Mujahideen gives no rhyme, no reason to disrupt the blatant pattern to specific urban international terrorism equated as a government conspiracy by default when there's simply the Bojinka plot. And with drafting up Operation Northwoods, which is primarily in maritime terms, a foreign attack to invoke a similar response to an earlier false flag attack in Cuba. Remember the USS Maine? When considering not only innovation, but that a small part of the plan was using one drone aircraft meant to look like a passenger plane, as well as other fighter planes. And even though there is a reference to hijacking, the ultimate goal was mainly to make it appear that the passenger plane was shot down, by even blowing it up as an option. But none of it has to do with the actual terms of hijacking the plane from within inside the craft. 
by Cuban terrorists or even kamikaze, but in an attempt to provoking or seizing the aircraft, basically intercepting it with mock Cuban warplanes. As detailed within the documents about making the appearance that the passenger plane with American college students would be harassed by other duplicate aircraft painted to look like Cuban MiGs, added with transmitting a May Day message stating that they were under attack, confusing as it might sound. When looking at things conventionally and the time of innovation, it's not hard to figure out if you do some basic research on the history of hijackings, when in actuality before they were called hijackings, they were called skyjackings, and were all either cases of robbery or criminals seeking to escape or political asylum, which in 1962, when Northwoods was drafted up, hijackings was a relatively recent phenomenon and rarely happened particularly in the manners of terrorism by attempting or threatening to destroy the aircraft, which in fact, in technical terms, the first terrorist hijacking with the intent to destroy an airliner and all its passengers was carried out in the same provocation intent like Northwoods, but by Israeli warplanes eight years before, in 1954, under the orders of General Moshe Dayan, where the IDF intercepted and seized a Syrian airliner forcing it to land, holding everyone inside as hostages in exchange to get Israeli prisoners freed from Damascus. And if that seems outdated or not strikingly similar enough to 9-11, then consider the consequence of those actions carried out by IDF and its foundation, when ironically, just eight years later in September of 1970, there's the Dawson's Field hijackings, where four out of five planes are successfully hijacked by the Black September and landed in Jordan, where luckily no passengers were killed, but the planes were blown up by explosives. And yet, somehow, Alex Jones became the historian on terrorism and false flags, the authority of 9-11 Truth? Sandy Hook, before I was ever sued, lost money. 9-11 Truth lost me almost all my radio stations and lost money. Those type of really controversial stands, people don't like them and they have crippled us before these lawsuits. That rationale is simply laughable. Jones couldn't have lost money over 9-11 Truth when he had gone beyond Bush's two terms promoting it, producing several films, pressing books, t-shirts, and other merchandise marketed with 9-11 in the title. It is practically the crisis along with the advent of social media that eventually springboarded his network into major recognition. If Alex Jones lost so much money, and why did he go even further co-opting the most popular of 9-11 Truth films and produces a third and contemporary version of Loose Change, which again, has all been the base of his own fear cult doctrine, that he and his loyal believers still to this day equate 9-11 to Operation Northwoods. Alex Jones is nothing but an incompetent liar, and he disturbingly has the largest audience in alternative media. And because of that, combined with his ego, he is the victim of his own narratives that has projected a tremendous mistrust in American society today and throughout other dissidents globally. So you have to look at the agenda behind things, you have to balance things about why has the mainstream media lied so much, why have governments lied so much, the fact that the public doesn't believe what they're told anymore. And it really is the fact that we've allowed the government and institutions to become so corrupt that people lost any compass of what's real. And I've, you know, I myself have, you know, almost had like a form of psychosis. I, I, I genuinely questioned, and I think the government and media that's been caught lying so much has created an atmosphere where people don't know what's true. So you do not believe that you've done an outrageous wrong to these parents? You I have not, not, no, I've not done an outrageous wrong to the parents. If you can be that callous and clumsy with real victims' family members, imagine how he truly sees those survivors, victims' families, and those who still want accountability for 9-11. And it shows now just by his choice of social priorities, when even in the most recent 9-11 anniversary, a 9-11 every other day, total daily abortions near death toll of September 11th. Where have we heard that one before? Can you say Christian cult? But that was the theme of the Alex Jones show, where he declared abortion as America's greatest sin, where Jones has conveniently forgotten that Americans' real sin has been its military-industrial complex and dastardly foreign policy particularly towards third world countries that resulted in the 9-11 attacks, regardless of foreign or domestic intelligent ties and provocations, as its greater sin was covering up and using the deaths of nearly 3,000 people killed in broad daylight to only sustain the same problem that got us here in the first place, and will only happen again, which already makes the future look bleak and no safer or closer to any resolve than we were before. And if one may be led to believe or conclude that this is just merely an act, that Jones has been a government disinformation agent or asset all along, well if you use Jones's own diagnosis and just listen to what comes out of his mouth, you would have every right to make such an accusation, unfounded or not, just as what Adam Green of No More News has recently pointed out. And I just got a text 
from uh, top intelligence in Israel. Uh, Israel has nominated Donald Trump for the 2017 Peace Prize. And Israel has uh, decided to make this nomination basically on the decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, uh, taking, I think, an historic, maybe even biblical step to legitimate the state of Israel. Well, certainly providence that he invoked during the inaugural speech uh, is, is, is with our republic. And, of course, England began to uh, help the Jews when they were being persecuted going back a 1,000 years ago in Europe. And, of course, it's been known since then. That's why England had so much uh, great providence. Uh, and, and, and also, of course, the Christian faith and, and Christ being number one. Yes, well, even while we're talking, I mean, uh, Israel, I just got another text message. I said we were going to break the news on Alex Jones' InfoWars broadcast. This said one word. They said, great. They're thrilled we're going to break the news on Alex Jones' InfoWars. And that comes directly from a source who's really above Mossad and the intelligence structure in Israel. Yeah, so about. folks are really getting things raw here on air now. Yeah, so about. folks are really getting things raw here on air now. How did you get Donald Trump on your show prior to the election? How did you pull that off? All right, I never tell this on my own show, and this will probably end up being news tomorrow, but you deserve it. I, uh, I know folks that are part of Delta Force, and I know people that are part of covert action uh, in the Defense Department and the CIA. And quite frankly, they've given me authorization to talk about this. I have never been in the CIA. I have never been part of covert operations. But uh, I was basically contacted uh, by groups uh, inside special forces operations in Florida, inside breakaway groups inside the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and uh, groups um, basically behind American industry that wanted to defeat the globalists and their plan to bankrupt America. But I'm but sorry. this is what got Donald Trump to say, I got to be on this guy's show? Donald Trump was advised by the the Special Forces Command out of Florida. They said... To, to go on your program. Uh, he, he, I mean, that's who actually... I mean, let's just say it, the enemy already knows all this. Let me just say, so everybody listening knows I'm telling the truth. Special Operations Command in Florida, the Delta Force, Army, Black Ops, it's Army's the oldest thing in America. It's before the Constitution, anything. They, they said, they said, sir, you need to go with Alex Jones, uh, and you need to rally the troops. And, uh, and, and, and they briefed him. They showed him the documents, and they said, we need you to run. And uh, you know, the Delta Force uh, basically asked Trump. Uh, Delta Force, you know, founded by General Boykin and Schumacher and uh, people like C. Pachenik, Dr. C. Pachenik of psychological operations of the CIA. That's exactly what all our sources from the FBI and the Pentagon which means the CIA, CIA-connected Pentagon, that's special operations. That's what they told us. And these are the good guys that continue to give us good info. It doesn't mean the whole thing's good. InfoWars is the tip of the spear, the tip of the spear, the tip of the spear. Oh, Alex Jones is wrong about Anthony Bourdain. Hey, hey, Joe, I talked to the people that were there in the production at the highest levels. They're involved in the Pentagon, everything else. I know all about it. Elon Musk. I mean, I mean Joe, I'm not going to tell you you know, who I talked to yesterday or who I talked to this afternoon. So just let's quit pretending that we aren't the tip of the spear. Let's quit pretending that we aren't the tip of the spear. 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 The of the spear. But even after I've tried to be nice to 4chan and 8chan and, 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 and the whole Q thing, it comes out and says, Jones is a Zionist shill. He's going to get arrested. All this crap. Trump. His daughter is married to a Orthodox Jew. Trump is pro-Israel, but you guys don't attack him because he's too big a target. But see that paradox of Q becoming anti-Semitic? That's not the real Q. If Q was ever real, we don't need a bunch of anti-Semitic crap, a bunch of anti-Israel stuff. That's a diversion. The chai comms are the issue. The EU's the issue. The UN collapsing our borders the issue. But the idea that QAnon is attacking me constantly going, he's an Israeli shill, don't listen to him. Or maybe it's not even government agents at QAnon, they're Democrats. Maybe they're just people that think there's a set market of conspiracy. Set market of conspiracy. Set market of conspiracy. And I think some of the lower IQ people out there just want something simple they can believe in to go along with it. But in all seriousness, regardless of administrations, government, and media structures past and present, what we have demonstrated about 1993 should be thoroughly grasped by whatever claims itself to be the 9-11 truth movement. In order to make a case stronger in 9-11, 
and to also help bring reasonable expectations on uncovering who and what is thoroughly responsible for all these inseparable attacks, in contrast to what authorities have narrowed down to the public as masterminds. The bottom line is that whoever has been organizing these attacks are willingly doing so to set up a false pretext to implicate Iraq, and that it spans many years before even the slightest suggestion of think tank planning with the neoconservative project for a new American century. And for the sake of entertaining a Zionist conspiracy or conspirators, the Odin and Yanan plan of Greater Israel was already out there in 1982. But as we're coming to a closure, one question that hasn't been answered is how did Ramzi Youssef and other conspirators know where to park the explosive rider van in the closest spot near the center of the North Tower? Wouldn't logic tell you that you would either have to have blueprints or a map? Ronald Buka was a New York City fire marshal, a 22-year veteran of the department who also served in the U.S. Army as a Green Beret during Vietnam. In 1986, he became a reservist joining the fire department of New York in Rescue One, one of the oldest rescue companies in all of New York. And he survived a spectacular fall in that same year, falling through five floors while attempting to rescue a lieutenant who was trapped on the fourth floor of the tenement. Buka was not expected to live and could have retired on a quarter million dollar tax-free pension at the age of 32. But he vowed to return to the FDNY and rescue one in which he did a year later. Ronnie Booker became a legend throughout the FDNY and was adequately nicknamed the Flying Fireman. But because he was doing paratrooper training as a reservist, he switched positions due to his injured back by working as a defense intelligence agency analyst. After responding to the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993, Ronnie had a personal interest in investigating the matter due to the incident involving longtime friend and fellow firefighter Kevin Shea who had fallen four stories into the impact hole left by the urea nitrate bomb, which was placed in the rider truck, in which Shea inspected himself. The incident with Kevin Shea was dramatized and also played by George Clooney in the 1993 made-for-TV movie, Without Warning, Terror in the Towers, which was aired on NBC. The FBI had shut out the local fire department investigators who could have contributed to the federal investigation. So Ronnie then educated himself about Middle East and Islamic terrorism and began his own personal probe. He would document thousands of files himself. He told dozens of people over the years that he was convinced that there was going to be another attack on the World Trade Center once again. In September of 1999, for nine months, Ronnie was working at Metrotech, one of the more modern and secure buildings which contained plans for virtually all of the major building structures in New York City and was also one of the new fire department headquarters in Brooklyn. One day in his cubicle doing some paperwork, Buku overheard two fire marshals talking about an incident that occurred just a few days earlier, where an accountant claimed to have lost his ID on a path train to New Jersey, but that there was something suspiciously wrong. According to the general rule working in the building, if you lost your ID, you had to tell fire marshals immediately, in which they did affirm that when they spoke to this accountant and asked if he filed a lost access card report, the accountant said he did. But when the same two fire marshals came in the next morning and found the report card filled out, not only was there something wrong with the timing of the report, but it was also signed by the name of a fire marshal who was also on vacation at the time of the signature. As one would obviously conclude, it must have been forged. But by whom? While the fire marshals were explaining the situation to Ronnie, they said the accountant was Egyptian. Ronnie became so compelled to act on his suspicions and wanted to know more about this accountant and why they would go through so much trouble to get a new ID. That accountant's name was Ahmed Amin Rafai, who was a naturalized Egyptian citizen and an FDY accountant for 25 years. On a hunch, Ronnie started taking a closer look at Rafai and went down to observe videotape taken of Rafai, which clearly showed that his reportedly lost ID card was actually in his back pocket when he was requesting a new one, and that later, the security video showed him swiping his ID card through the reader and entering Metrotech. Rafai was interviewed later, but gave conflicting information to the supervisor. His ultimate answer for getting a new ID card was for, quote, nostalgic reasons. Ronnie wondered why an experienced, long-standing accountant would risk his entire career and reputation for simply lying over a lost card. Nostalgic reasons? Or something more? Buka continued to press forward as to why the risks Rafai took. Ronnie ended up commiserating with his boss, who was also Rafai's supervisor, Kay Woods, who is now Deputy Assistant Commissioner. 
He asked her what kind of an employee Rafai had been. Woods in return rolled her eyes and said, This guy was like a ghost employee. He would come in late, check every vacation, would fall asleep at his desk, and make calls to his native home of Egypt. He was like a non-entity in his apartment. Ronnie then asked Woods if Rafai had ever done anything else unusual that she observed. Woods said that in the early 1990s, prior to the first World Trade Center bombing, while the Capitol Budget Unit was being renovated, where she and Rafai were located previously, that there was a time that Rafai had gotten hold of blueprints to the World Trade Center. A large number of blueprints to New York City, more notable buildings, were kept in the inspection department located inside the filing cabinets that were thrown out into two large dumpsters. When one day, Kay was at lunch, he came back to finding Rafai digging through the dumpsters and found the World Trade Center blueprints on his desk. Woods specifically remembered Rafai asking about the blueprints. Can I have these? At the time, she thought nothing of it. The day of the first World Trade Center bombing, Rafai called in sick. He then became extremely paranoid. Woods described a pattern where he told her that he thought the FBI was bugging his garage. After listening to Woods' experiences with Rafai, Buka was aghast. It confirmed his initial suspicions about why Rafai was acting so irresponsible regarding the ID pass. Ronnie went to a local news channel where he knew a film editor to, to he then asked to view some news archives. And after looking at the fourth or fifth videotape, he found one showing Rafai on the arm of the notorious Egyptian radical Islamic militant Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh. He was acting as his bodyguard, moving him through the crowd while whispering in his ear. Rafai seen here with one of the most notorious radical fundamentalists in the world, Buka was left astonished. Ronnie then discovered that the FBI had interviewed him twice in 1994. But more specifically, Ronnie found out from people in the fire department that Rafai had been seen in the new footage walking near the blind sheikh holding his arm. Given his knowledge of the Egyptians and the role that they played early with the blind sheikh and the New York landmark spot and the first World Trade Center bombing, Buka was convinced he was an Al-Qaeda operative. Ronnie rushes the information of Rafai obtaining plans at the World Trade Center and brings it to the FBI field headquarters in New York in September of 1999. Agents at the New York field office refused to listen to his observations. One of the agents even told Buka, well, we don't see any crime here. There is nothing we could do. Buka was absolutely stunned at the refusal to even take his account seriously. But that didn't stop Ronnie, as he had access to information the public did not, and he intensely investigated more and kept a bird's eye on the Twin Tower. One month before the 9-11 attacks, he visited one of the security guards at the World Trade Center and inquired whether there were any new means of egress that could allow anyone to the World Trade Center from below. On Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001, after American Airlines Flight 11 struck the North Tower at 8.46 a.m., Ronnie roared down lights and sirens to Liberty Street alongside his partner, Fire Marshal Jimmy Devery. They parked, donned their turnout coats, and made their way in the back stairs of the South Tower where United Airlines 175 had just struck. Ronnie actually reached the impact zone of the 78th floor of the South Tower, along with Battalion Chief Oriel Palmer, who devised a plan to put out the fire. The two men were the only firefighters who made it that far, as both were experienced marathon runners. Okay, 7, 8, 9, 4, 1, 5. We got police. I saw in the pockets of fire. We should be able to knock it down with two lines. Where you going? Where you going? 1045 code 1s. 1045 code 1s means dead bodies. Keep what stand you in. South Stanley Adam, South Tower. 478. Pass the wall here. No more civilians, we're going to get two engines up here. All right, pass the wall, we're on our way. At the impact zone, up on the 78th floor, Chief Oreo Palmer and Fire Marshal Ronald Buka stay to fight the blaze among the dead and the dying. Palmer again tries to reach members of Ladder Company 15. It is the last time anyone hears from either Chief Palmer or Fire Marshal Buka. But as the flames roared around them, the steel buckled, which led to an eventual collapse. Both men perished as the tower crumbled down straight to the bottom. Ronnie Booker was the only firefighter marshal in the history of the New York City Fire Department to be killed in the line of duty. Fire Marshal Devery, who was with Booker earlier, had rescued a badly burned woman named Ling Young on the 51st floor and got her to safety. Both survived. <laughs>
Author Peter Lance extensively documents the story of Ronnie Buka and his discovery of Ahmed Rafai in his first self-authored investigative trilogy of 9-11, 1,000 Years for Revenge, International Terrorism, the FBI, the Untold Story. Lance was able to get detailed and personal information from Buka's wife and those close to him and decided to continue investigating his angle by confronting Rafai, veteran FBI agent Joe O'Brien, with his partner, organized crime expert Andy Curance, went with Peter Lance to interview Rafai for his first book and wanted to give him an opportunity to respond to what he was told. Rafai admitted that he did act as Sheikh's translator at his INS hearing. He admitted that he was a member of the Masjid al Salam Mosque in Jersey City and that he frequented the other two mosques in Brooklyn where the Sheikh used to preach. During the 45 minute interview, Lance asked Rafai four times if he would renounce the blind sheikh, in which each time he refused to renounce him. Lance showed him a video still of him next to the blind sheikh, and Rafai admitted that that was him, but he denied that he obtained the plans to the World Trade Center, or that he had called in sick on the day of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Rafai stated that he was just a member of the mosque, that he was walking the sheikh to an immigration hearing as his translator. Lance then pressed and asked him, well, did you know Mahmoud Abulima? To which Rafai replied, Yes, I know him. Did you know Mohammed Salome? Yes, I know him. Did you know Nidal Ayad? Yes, I knew him. Did you know El Said Nasser? Yes, I knew him. But I do not really know these men. In other words, I was only acquainted with them. At the very end of the interview, Lance asked him at one point, How did you feel about 9-11? Rafai paused tried to fake a weepy-eyed kind of expression and said, I went to the park in the town and I hold a candle for these people. Lance also opined, he started to get like he was remorseful, but not for long. I really pressed this guy hard. Rafai had a subtle change into his sudden emotion, but not for long. According to Lance, as he kept pressing on Rafai about his relationship with the blind sheikh, in which after a few minutes, Rafai had finally lost it and said, do you know why the FBI did not discover 9-11? Lance couldn't comprehend, but he responded to Rafai saying, well, that's what my book seeks to answer, to which Rafai replied, no, do you understand what my people believe? This has not Bin Laden. This is not the Sheikh. This is the United States government doing this for Israel. Lance looked over at the other surprised FBI agents, and they were all aghast at Rafai's statement. Lance had replied, let me get this straight. You are saying that your people believe that the 3,000 people were murdered by the United States government on behalf of the state of Israel? Rafai made final proclamation. Yes, this is what my people believe. Lance just thought it was absurd, which resulted at the end of the interview with Lance and the FBI agents leaving the house. Of course, Rafai must have been seizing upon all the wild conspiracy theories that were also afloat in the Middle East at the time. However, even with what Rafai may have known or not, doesn't absolve any of the Mossad apparatus that's been uncovered on the Jersey side at the bare minimal, particularly when there's also the case of the five Middle Eastern suspects linked to Danko Mechanical and Magic Heating and Air having prior and unauthorized access to the Twin Towers just days before September 11th and were arrested months later in Tennessee on a sting for fraudulent IDs which was subsequent to the FBI's 9-11 dragnet. That case in Tennessee should make one reconsider the Port Authority more as suspect or needed inquiry rather than just leaseholders of the World Trade Center complex, which is not necessary for implication in 9-11, as most are compelled to imply Larry Silverstein in their conspiracy conclusion, which in retrospect, Silverstein didn't own the World Trade Center in 1993 and neither in 1999, just before the Millennium Plot. But the bottom line here is that it would be gross negligence to ignore Peter Lance's story on Ronnie Buka, regardless if his total conclusion blames the Al-Qaeda network, because his pursuit to connect both 1993 World Trade Center bombing to 9-11 through Ramsey Yusuf and the Bojinka Plot is certainly one angle that this presentation has relied on. And similarly, like with the International Herald Tribune questioning the role of Josie Hadass, FBI spokesman Joe Valquit had put down Lance's story of Rafai infiltrating the New York Fire Department after his first book, A Thousand Years of Revenge, was released, saying that it's rehash of old stories, gossip, and speculation. And if you think the anthrax letters right after the 9-11 attacks is simply your instant inside job proof of no foreign involvement, you might want to reconsider when it's a fact that it was also reported that anthrax was missing from the same U.S. Army Medical Research Institute laboratory in Fort Detrick, Maryland, right around the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. 
And not only was there controversy going on there two years before in 1991, where Dr. Ayad Assad, an Egyptian, had filed a formal complaint against co-workers Drs. Philip Zak and Marion Rippey for racial harassment in which subsequently led them leaving U.S. Amarid in 1992. Assad stayed on until March of 1997, where then budget cuts led Assad to being laid off, for which he then sued the U.S. Army for age and ethnic discrimination. After 9-11 in October of 2001, the FBI called Assad in for questioning. It was also revealed that the FBI had received an anonymous letter, postmarked September 21, 2001, in which an alleged co-worker warned that Assad might be planning a biological attack. The letter was unsigned and computer-typed. It stated, in part, that... Dr. Assad is a potential biological terrorist. I have worked with Dr. Assad and I heard him say that he has a vendetta against the U.S. government. Although in his defense it was concluded that the letter was written by a female in which Marion Rippey was suspected to have written it, the FBI cleared Assad of these allegations and determined they were unfounded. But when it came to implicating Bruce Ivins for the anthrax attacks years later, Assad also said in an interview to the Washington Post in 2008 that not only did he know Ivins, but made the accusation that Bruce Ivins was a victim of a vicious plot. But that's it. We've come to an end. We hope that this expanded film inspires not just other researchers, but those who want to take action and initiatives that need to be applied still for accountability and to remedy these problems and enforce prevention. I may not have all the answers or solutions, but at least I do have other perspectives balanced with official and unofficial evidence and missing links that are essential to understanding what else may have been in part responsible for these terrorist attacks committed in the 90s and on to 9-11, along with possibly getting a better understanding of how we've gotten into this mess, which could have been prevented, and are worthy inquiries to these historical narratives that have had profound social and geopolitical impact. But as a storyteller for now, I also need your support. Please consider donating through PayPal. Your help will help me in acquiring costly unreleased archives from news networks to produce more film series, especially due to the fact that YouTube has practically removed all monetizing features for conspiracy theory and historical skeptics content. And your contributions could also help me in compiling all this information and much more into writing a potential book. Also, if you want to get an early preview on my next films and help financially, then please consider becoming a Patreon to also get special updates and other original content pertaining to 9-11. Perhaps we can spark more than just filmmaking, but a renaissance in the 9-11 truth movement and finally get some progress and sensible closure. Thank you for watching this film, and please subscribe to my channels. And remember, 9-11 is an open investigation, if you want it to be. We got a, this is some kind of a major source material of documentaries and literature that we've referenced in this film. Check out all three of Peter Lance's widely available books on 9-11. For extensive research on Ramsey Youssef, check out The New Jackals by Simon Reeve. For research on Zacharias Massawi and the Oklahoma City bombing, read Mitchell Gray's I Heard You Were Going on Jihad. And for more controversial research with the 1993 World Trade Center and Oklahoma City bombings, as well as 9-11, do read Michael Collins Piper's books, The Judas Goats, and False Flags, Template for Terror.